suspense. Let's see. Suspect, suspected, suspend. Ah, here we are. Suspense. The condition of mental uncertainty, usually accompanied by apprehension or anxiety. Fear of something which is about to occur as... Do not keep me any longer in... Suspense. For our story of suspense tonight, we invite you to enjoy The Devil in the Summer House by John Dixon Carr. Somewhere along the Hudson, perhaps not far from Terrytown, there is a modest house in its own grounds. Behind it, in a spacious garden, stands a summer house of evil memory. More than 25 years ago, a man shot himself, or at least died, in that summer house. They found Major Kenyon with a scorched bullet hole in his head and the weapon beside him. But we are in the present now. The latticed summer house has grown heavy with vines, and only the other evening, two men came into that garden at twilight over the shaggy grass as a storm was brewing along the Hudson. Two men, the lawyer from New York... Who's there? And Captain Burke of the Homicide Squad. Easy, my friend, easy. I was just going to ask you the same thing. My name is Parker. I'm an attorney. You're not Captain Burke. Yeah, the very same and no other. I thought I recognized you, Mr. Parker. Must be something important to bring you so far from New York at this time of night. I was in Tarrytown anyway. I thought there'd be a housekeeper here. But I don't see any lights. You've got business here? Yes, in a way. Have you? I don't know. I'll tell you better after you tell me what brought you to a place that no one has lived in for ten years. Tell me, Captain. Did you ever get an anonymous letter from a dead man? Did you? No, I can't say I did. The letter's anonymous. How do you know the man's dead? Because they're all dead. Every last one of them. Dead and under the ground where they can't be hurt any longer. Look. There's the summer house where Jerry Kenyon used to work. There are the windows of the library and the dining room. Looking toward it. Confound this lightning. Makes the windows blaze, don't it? Jerry Kenyon hadn't a care in the world. Yet he shot himself. I'll show you the letter. Now, look, Mr. Parker, I couldn't read anything in this light. But if we can get inside the house Certainly we can get into the house. I was the family attorney. I've got the keys. Why should a dead person send me a letter? working, eh? But you got a flashlight, I see. Came here prepared for anything, eh? This is the library. There were always candles on the mantel. Uh, yes, there they are. Have you a match, Captain? Oh, uh, yes, I'll light them. Uh, that's better. Same old heavy furniture. Same old thick carpet, same old globe map. Oh, uh, Mr. Parker, this letter that you were talking about. Yeah. Read it. Hey, wait a minute. This thing is dated November 2nd, 1918. That's right, and be careful of that paper. You see how old it is? But it was mailed yesterday. From where? I don't remember. I didn't keep the envelope. Read it. 
Dear Joe. In case you didn't know it, I'm Joe. Dear Joe, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died... But we know how he died. It was suicide. Are you sure it was? Whoever wrote this letter doesn't seem to think so. If you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. Press hard at the back of the drawer. Yours very truly. That's not signed. That's right. Now, are you sure you don't know who wrote that letter? This is the first time I've been back in this room, Captain. It was almost a home to me once. There's the chair where Isabel sat on the afternoon it happened. Isabel was Jerry Kenyon's wife. Beautiful woman. There's the door that the maid let me in by that afternoon. You know, Captain, it seems to me they're all here tonight. Who? We stand beneath the sounding rafter. And the walls around us are bare. As they echo our peals of laughter, it seems... That the dead are there. Yet we stand to our glasses steady. You know it? I was in my school reader. How does the rest of it go? Yet we stand to our glasses steady and drink to our comrades' eyes. Here's a glass to the dead already. Hurrah for the next that dies. Excuse me, Captain. I don't know what's come over me talking that way. I was very fond of these people. Are you going to look in the desk drawer? This is a lot of nonsense. Then why are you here, Mr. Parker? Jerry Kenyon was always a happy man. At least that's what I always thought. Big, boisterous fellow. Yeah? He had a good position with Vitatone. You know, the phonograph company. Yeah, sure I know him. But he'd just been made a major in the army. 1917. There was a war on then, too, if you remember. I remember. To make the world safe for democracy. Old days. Old heartaches. Old memories. I remember that blazing hot day in August. When all the windows were up. I remember this room. And Isabel, that was Jerry's wife, sitting in that chair, knitting. I remember... Yes, Kitty. What is it? There's a man to see you, Miss Kenyon. He says his name's Parker. Yes, I'm expecting him. Uh, show him in, please. All right, ma'am. Shall I take your knitting in your knitting bag? Why should you take my knitting? I don't know, Miss Kenyon. I just wondered. You can come in now. Thank you. Hello, Joe. Hello, Isabel. You sent for me? Joe, I must apologize for Kitty. Servants are getting to be a problem nowadays. She looks pretty enough to get along. Oh, Kitty's got large ideas. She wants to go on the stage, if you please, and do imitations, like Miss Draper. She only knew how hard it was acting all your life. Isabel, you've been crying. I have not. At least... Is that why you sent for me? I've missed you. You haven't been here in over a week, Joe. I had an idea Jerry was getting a little tired of having me around this house. Oh, no, Joe. Why, Jerry... Yes, what about Jerry? I wish I knew, Joe. That's why I wanted you here. Where is he, by the way? I want to say goodbye to him before he leaves. He's probably out in the summer house where he works with all those papers. He's got a lot of work to catch up with. He's going overseas tomorrow. Yes, I know. He's out there. He's been out there all day. His last day here, and I've been alone. That sounded like a shot. <laughs> yes, it was a shot, Joe. In the house. Dear doesn't seem to worry you. <laughs> it's only Paul. Jerry's brother, Paul. Oh. Thought you'd gotten him off your hands for good. Jerry asked him out. He got here two nights ago. That doesn't make it any easier for you, does it? No, oh, I don't mind. Jerry's fixed him up with a pistol range in the cellar. Paul's a terribly bad shot. Not like the rest of us. <laughs> you don't seem to like it, Joe. Uh, shall I have Kitty go down and tell him? No, no, no. It's terrible. As long as he keeps away. Poor Joe. But, uh, about Jerry, who is it this time? 
Joe. Jerry's been home five days on leave from camp. Well, uh, never mind what camp. But he spent four evenings of those five with... with that Fisk woman. Diane Fisk? The redhead with all the money? Oh, she got money? Well... She must have some attraction, then. Please understand me, Joe. It's not that I'm jealous any longer. It's just that... No, no, of course not. Jerry goes his way, and I go mine. I may not be without admirers myself, if it comes to that. You've no idea how true that is, Isabel. No, uh, I was thinking about Jerry. He may not always be lucky. He may meet some girl who's not as broad-minded as I am. And then when he gives her the go by Paul must be getting really furious down in that cell. He's not hitting anything. He must be using a lot of ammunition. Now, your trouble, Joe, is that you're too much of a gentleman. And if you really want to see Jerry, uh, there he is now. Where? Uh, Just standing in the door of the summer house. Uh, Look out the window. And finally bright out there. Doesn't he look noble in his new uniform? Sam Brown belt and revolver and everything. Well, look how he turns around and waves his cap at us. Like a real soldier. Real soldiers don't exactly wave their caps, do they? He does. Uh, Jerry! Jerry! Hello there! Jerry, Joe Parker's here. Who? Joe Parker. He wants to see you. Into the summer house again. Not a care in the world, Harry. Now, listen, Isabel, you've got to slow down. You'll be crying again in a minute. Come on over here and sit down. Uh, light hurts my eyes, that's all. Well, then we'll just pull these blinds. We'll still be able to see it. There, how's that? It's better, thanks. Now, can Jim. I get you anything? Oh, no, you heard the great white chief's orders. I'm to get you something. Uh, what do you have, your highball? Don't bother with that. Oh, it's no bother. Everything's out in the dining room here. The Iceman didn't deliver today of all days, so I'm afraid I can't give you any ice. I uh, read in the paper yesterday that we're likely to have automatic ice boxes any day now. Uh, you know, uh, things that freeze ice by electricity or something. Uh, do you believe that, Joe? I doubt it. Listen, Isabel. Uh, here you are. It's not cold at all. It's the best I could do. Thanks, Emma. What I wanted to say was, couldn't you get that brother of yours to give up practicing now? Hasn't he done his good deed for the day? <laughs> yes, maybe he has. Uh, I'll ring for Kitty. You don't have to call me, Miss Canyon. I'm here. Oh, yes, Kitty. What is it? It's only to tell you there's another visitor. This time it's a woman. Lady Kitty. Call her a lady, please. Well, maybe. She says her name's Diane Fisk. Diane Fisk? That's Jerry. Uh, Kitty, tell the lady I'm not in. Lady. (laughs) She's a fine lady. I don't want to intrude, my dear. I don't want to intrude. Anyway, it's too late, Miss Kenyon. She's coming down the hall now. My dear Mrs. Kenyon. (laughs) How do you do, Diane? (laughs) This is a friend of ours, Miss Fisk, uh, Mr. Parker. How do you do? Oh, now, I don't want to intrude, really, I don't. I wouldn't have intruded for worlds, especially on a day like this. Isn't it awful? But your husband simply insisted, my dear Mrs. Kenyon, he simply wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't. And do you know what he's brought from his office as a surprise? No. A phonograph recording machine. He's going to let us use it. So that we can all hear ourselves talk twice. How nice. <laughs> name. Can't somebody stop that firing? Don't fly off the handle. Take it easy now. Kitty. Yes, ma'am. Would you please go down the cellar and tell Mr. Kenyon's brother he's driving us all crazy. Tell him to stop. Yes, ma'am. My dear Mrs. Kenyon, I do hope I haven't offended you in any way. I I know I'm a silly little chatterbox. They say people who have red hair often are. (laughs) Of course, at your age, you you must find the heat very dry. Uh, Don't you think we'd all better sit down? I I was very much interested in what Miss Fisk said about our phonograph recording machine. Mrs. Kenyon was just talking about a machine to make ice. (sighs) Yes, yes. Isn't science wonderful? But I do think it was me to Major Kenyon to invite me out here and then go and fall asleep in the summer house. Did you say fall asleep? Yes, of course. How did you know? Well, I came up the back way and I saw him in the summer house with his head forward on the table. Taking a nice little snooze. That's very queer. Of course, you couldn't see much except in the bright light of the door, but I think I saw him there. I didn't disturb him, naturally. But I think I'd better disturb him. Oh, now, please don't trouble on my account. The fact is, my dear, I don't altogether trust myself in this room. A woman of my age has to conserve his strength, you know. 
So if you'll just excuse me. Well, of course, if you... Oh, dear, I just can't think what I'm always saying because I, I have the best intentions in the world, Mr. Barker. But, uh, Parker. Parker. Oh, yes, Parker, but I do somehow manage to offend people being so dependent and everything. <laughs> Except the men, of course. I couldn't offend you, Mr. Barker, a Parker. <laughs> now, could I? <laughs> Madam, I'm not sure. Well, of course, the person I really came to see was Paul, Mr. Kenyon's brother. He's a little young, of course, but he's joining up next month, and I think we should all do our bit, don't you? <laughs> he has such a pleasant personality. I think he likes me. Why, if he walked in at that door this minute... Now, how am I ever going to get any place? Someone's always interrupting my revolver practice just when I'm getting to the point where I can... Oh. Why, Paul. Good Lord, are you here again? You're a very untidy object, Paul. Well, it's pretty untidy in this cellar. And dirty. I've got cockroaches on me, so keep away. Did you have a good day shooting? Swell. One of the best. Hit the target? On the only shot that mattered, I hit the target dead center. That sounded like Isabel. I think it was Isabel. Why have you got those blinds down? Get them up. What is it? What's wrong with you? What are you looking at through that window? Twenty-five years ago, Captain Burke, we found Jerry Kenyon lying across the table in the summer house. He'd shot himself through the head with his own revolver in the holster. It was lying on the floor beside him. Shut up, sir, Burke. I see. When Isabel found him, he'd been dead about half an hour. The doctors proved that, did they? Yes, that shot had been fired against his head. The front of his uniform cap was powder burned where the bullet entered. There's no doubt about that. None at all. We never noticed the real shot because... Because that young lad was shooting off guns like a maniac in the cellar. Precisely. Now they're all dead. By accident, illness, they're all gone. Isabel Kenyon died less than a year afterwards. I think she died just because she was so fond of Jerry. I suppose you've guessed my little secret. Oh, I think I can sort of read between the lines. You were in love with Isabel Kenyon, weren't you? Yes. Well, these things happen. I never let her see it, you understand? Women know pretty generally. So? They're gone. The youngest of them. And I'm left alone... With old tunes, old ghosts, wondering why the fellow ever killed himself. Why? Why? And this morning, out of a clear sky, I get a letter saying, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. But I tell you, we know how he died. Well, aren't you going to do it? Naturally. I've got a key somewhere here that fits the drawer. Now, listen, Mr. Parker. In my father's country, in Ireland, they got a saying that when a man's going to commit suicide... I thought of doing that, too. Once. Then the devil comes in and takes him by the hand and talks to him. They say you can see the devil as plain as I see you just before you pull the trigger. Well, the devil must have been in the summer house that afternoon. Then. Oh, no, he wasn't. What do you mean? Major Kenyon didn't kill himself. He was murdered. <laughs> My dear Captain Burke, the police covered all that at the time. Everybody had an alibi. They did, did they? Well, think of what I've told you. Isabel and I were together all the time. Paul, her brother, was shooting off guns in the cellar. Yeah. Diane Fisk. Yeah, what about her? Her chauffeur who drove her there swore he saw her walk straight up to the place. She passed the summer house, but didn't stop there. Well, that checks. Even Kitty the maid could prove she'd never stirred out of the house until just a minute or so before Isabel went herself. Oh, and why did the maid have to leave the house at all? She was taking Jerry the black coffee he drank every afternoon. He'd already been dead half an hour then. And that, my dear Captain, disposes of everybody. Well, now listen, Mr. Parker. You're a good guy, and I'm not going to hold out on you any longer. You see, 
I say Major Kenyon was murdered because I know he was murdered. By an outsider? By one of the people in the house. That's impossible. Is it? Well, why don't you open that desk drawer and see? What time is it? Uh, it's a quarter to eight. Quarter to eight? And I haven't got much time. For what? Holy St. Patrick, will you open that drawer? If it's waited 25 years, my friend, it can wait a minute more. I've got the key somewhere in this bunch of keys. Everything the same. Paul never altered what he inherited. Same old desk, same old phonograph. Same old... I think this is the key. Yeah. It opens. There's nothing here except one or two old newspapers. Everything very dirty. The letter says to press hard at the back. Now, have you tried that? Doesn't seem to. Yes, my George, it does work. Well? There seems to be a movable back on a hinge. Well, what's inside? Uh... Uh, some sort of flat brown paper parcel sealed with wax and about as dirty as it can get. Open it, man. Open it. I'm going to. It's a phonograph, I thought. There's a plain white label, something on it written in pencil. I don't see too well nowadays without my glasses. Uh, here, give it to me. I'll read it to Just you. Go on. A record of how I killed Jerry Kenyon. Say, don't you get it, Mr. Parker? This is the real goods. The murderer's going to tell us his own story 25 years later. Be careful. Whatever you do, don't drop it. You seem to be interested enough now. I don't say I'm not interested. I say I can't believe it. You know, when you were talking about the dead coming back and that kind of thing, you sure started giving me goose pimples. But that's just what it is, a dead person. Now, there's the phonograph. Put that record on. Let's hear what the ghost says. Any of them could have made the record, of course. The apparatus was all here. Don't just stand there by the phonograph. Won't it work? Yes, it works. Is it wound up? Yes, it's wound up. Here goes. Now, look, Mr. Parker. Whose voice do you think it's going to be? I don't know. Now, I want to warn you. The voice you're going to hear from there... Please, be quiet. Listen. I've started it up. Well? Speak up. Who killed Jerry Kenyon? I killed him, Joe, dear. Isabel. I'm sorry about it, Joe. But I had to have you for an alibi. And you were so terribly easy to fool. It's only a phonograph record, man. Don't look at it as if it was alive. You said you and I were always together, Joe. But that wasn't quite true. I left you to go into the dining room and mix a highball, remember? Yes. And I was carrying my big knitting bag. Remember that, too? And there was something else in it besides knitting. I'm an awfully good revolver shot, Joe. I told you we were all good except Paul. And the back windows of the dining room faced the same way as the back windows of the library. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Jerry very much. was in the summer house. I made a sign to him from the window, and he came to the door there. In bright sunlight, 50 feet away. Sure, again, Isabel. Sure Joe, again. don't you know what August heat is in a wooden summer house? Didn't you, didn't anybody see that no man would be wearing a cap inside on a day like that? Jerry had taken his cap off before he went into the summer house. We saw him do it. He was bareheaded when he came to the door. So I lifted the revolver and shot him through the head. Then I dropped the gun back in my knitting bag and went back into the library with your drink. Isabel, don't talk back to the thing, man. You'll drive me screwy. There was in my knitting bag, too. I had to use it. It was a duplicate of Jerry's army camp with a powder-burned hole already fired through it in the place I wanted. Very clever of you, Isabel. So I've been the goat for 25 years. I waited for some time and then slipped out to find the body. I fitted the new cap over Jerry's head in place where it ought to go. I put the old cap in my knitting bag. I took his revolver out of the holster and kept it. The gun that I'd used, I dropped on the floor beside him. So I proved it was suicide. You see? You proved it to me. Joe. Joe, listen, I, 
I'm very sick. They tell me I'm going to die. You are dead. Joe, I'm afraid. I'm going out in the dark, and I... I don't know what's there. Don't go away, Isabel. Come Joe. Out. Just for a minute. Okay, I've had just about enough of this. Joe, I want you to tell everybody about it. I want you to tell them how a poor, crazy woman couldn't stand that man any longer, and how... There. It's cut off, and it's going to stay cut off. Thank you. I've heard about enough, too. But you can't arrest her now, my friend. You can't arrest her now. After hearing that, I'm not going to arrest anybody. Tell me, Captain. Did you know what was on the record? No. That's why I had to hear it. I knew about it, but I wasn't sure what it had to say. But so help me, I never guessed how hard it would hit you. Man. Don't you get it even yet? Yes, I get it. Oh, no, you don't. You don't see anything. That was how the fake suicide was managed, yes. That's just how it was all done, bar one or two little things. Only... Only what? Only it wasn't Isabel Kenyon who committed the murder. Did I hear you correctly? You did? This is another one of your little jokes, I imagine. Can't you let me alone? Have you some kind of personal spite against me? What did I Hold ever it. do? You're going to hear the real truth now if I have to hold you down in that chair. I know Mrs. Kenyon didn't kill her husband because I've just come from talking to the real murderer up the river. But they're all dead. Oh, no, they're not. And I haven't got much time either. That clock's just going to strike eight. What's the time got to do Good with deal it? Good deal if you'll follow me. Mrs. Kenyon died less than a year after her husband, didn't she? Yes. But it wasn't Mrs. Kenyon's voice you just heard in that record. What? I'm telling you, the real murderer hated her. Hated her like poison and wanted her blamed for the crime. When Mrs. Kenyon died, the real murderer wrote a letter. Well? But she never mailed that letter. She made a lying record of Isabel Kenyon's voice as evidence. Now you figure it out for yourself. Who was pretty enough to take Major Kenyon's eye and strike back like fury when she got thrown over? Who wanted to go on the stage and do impersonations? Kitty, the maid. Ah, you're talking sense. She shot Jerry from the dining room window. And she couldn't borrow Mrs. Kenyon's knitting bag. She went out to the summer house with a gun and the fake cap wrapped a napkin on a coffee tray. She did go out, I remember. Actually, she got there before Mrs. Kenyon did. But the summer house was dark inside and Mrs. Kenyon never noticed her. The next day, Kitty wrote that letter, but she couldn't bring herself to send it. So she kept that letter till the day before yesterday... Then one of the boys at Sing Sing... Wait a minute. ...thinking he was doing her a kind action, put a stamp on it and mailed it. Did you say Sing Sing? Yes. They're electrocuting her tonight for the murder of an Italian down at Collier's Hook. I found out about the record, all right. But the one thing I wasn't sure of was if, that she had done the job alone. Now, frankly, the way you acted, I thought that you might have been in on it, too. Oh, well, that's why I had to hear it through. And it was anything but a joke. And now, here it goes to blazes forever. Eight o'clock. Now she's dead. So ends The Devil in the Summer House. Tonight's story of... Suspense. The part of Mr. Parker was played by Martin Gable. Again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. A story dedicated to the thrill of the nighttime. The hushed voice and the prowling step. Another adventure in suspense. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
series of hour-length dramas based on some of the most significant writings of our time, with an introduction and commentary by one of the great personalities of the American theater, the distinguished actress, director, and producer, Eva Legallion. Miss Legallion. Good evening once again. And good afternoon to our friends in the West. Last Sunday, I announced that our play today would be based on Whistle Stop, the novel by Marietta Wolfe. Unfortunately, due to last-minute difficulties, we've had to change our program. And instead, we're bringing you a transcribed dramatization of a book by one of the most brilliant of modern English writers, Aldous Huxley. After many a summer dies the swan, is the curious title. Huxley wrote it in 1939. It's a devastating and bitter satire in spots excruciatingly funny. There's also something decidedly macabre about it. Many of you may not agree with it at all, but I'm pretty sure that you'll all be interested in it. Huxley never fails to be stimulating and provocative even when one disagrees with him most violently. The setting of this strange intellectual excursion is California, and our performance today actually takes place there, for while I am speaking to you from New York, the players of our company are in Hollywood. I invite them now to begin their performance of Aldous Huxley's After Many a Summer Dies the Swan. <laughs> I was reading Wordsworth when the train pulled into Los Angeles Station. Not that I'm overly fond of Wordsworth, but my instructions were to search for a tall chauffeur in a grey uniform, and I presume his were to track down a middle-aged Englishman carrying the poetical works of William Wordsworth. Mr. Pottage, sir. Welcome to Los Angeles. Oh, Mr. Stoke chauffeur? That's right, sir. I'd have known you by your voice even without that book. Yes, my voice. <laughs> wait, wait, why is it that in America I have only to ask for a cup of coffee to draw gales of laughter? <laughs> it's quite provoking. Uh, I beg your pardon, sir? Oh, never mind, never mind. If you will collect my box at the window, we'll be off. <laughs> Mr. Stoit's motor car rode exceedingly smoothly, and I abandoned myself to the pleasure of looking. The Southern California rolled past the windows. We were traveling westward. The sunshine lit up each building and sky sign as though with a spotlight. The billboards were most emphatic. Do things go places with console gas. That's one of ours, Mr. Portage. Oh, uh, uh, what's that? Uh, console gas. That's Mr. Stoich's company. He's president. Uh, Broken romance. Science proves that 73% of all adults have halitosis. Beverly Pantheon, a cemetery that is different. Funerals are not expensive. That's ours, too. Oh, you, you mean the Beverly Pantheon? Finest cemetery in the world, I guess. We could stop by if you'd like to see it. Oh, look, over there to the right. Beverly Pantheon? No, that's where Ginger Rogers lives. Oh. Yes, sir, Ginger Rogers. Pantheon's down the road, sir. You too can have abiding youth with drill form figure control. That's uh, Groucho Mark's place over there. Ah, here we are, the Beverly Pantheon. Beverly Pantheon, the Personality Cemetery. Oh, that's the Tower of Pisa, isn't it? Except that he doesn't lean. It's the showplace of the Beverly Pantheon. Mr. Stoyd had it straight and special. Two hundred thousand dollars, that's what it costs. Yes, sir. Good. We went through a whirlwind tour of the Beverly Pantheon. Everything. The pet cemetery, the poet's corner, the black marble vestibule of ashes, leading to the supermodern burning mortuary furnace. And finally the pantheon itself, and over all the inescapable crooning of a perpetual Wurlitzer automatic organ. This new heaven of the Beverly Pantheon seemed to promise all the more conventional delights, with the added joys of everlasting tennis, eternal golf, and millennial swimming. Some 
glass, the Pantheon, eh, Mr. Porter? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, 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 definitely. Uh, um, out of this world, what? Now, look up there. Between those hills, there it is. That's Mr. Stoit's place. On the summit of the bluff, as though growing out of the rock, stood a castle. The thing was gothic, medieval. Medieval not out of vulgar historical necessity like the castles of France and Germany, but out of pure fun and wantonness. Platonically, one might say. It was medieval as only a witty and irresponsible modern architect and engineer is equipped to be. Want a ride, Mr. Proctor? Oh, hello, George. Nice of you to stop for me. Always glad to, Mr. Proctor. Uh, this here's Mr. Portage from England. I'm sure he won't mind. Oh, not at all, not at all. Pleased to meet you, sir. How do you do? Uh, visiting Mr. Stoit, Mr. Portage? I am uh, here on business. Uh, I'm to catalog the Hoburg papers. Mr. Stoit's just bought them. A historical treasure, you know. Hmm. You're a scholar? <laughs> well, well, a bit, yes. A scholar and a gentleman. Well, the worst types of human beings... I might almost uh, claim to have been one myself long ago. You're, you're not William Proctor, are you? Not the one who wrote short studies in the Counter-Reformation? Well, well I'm figured. <laughs> <laughs> Remarkable building, the castle, isn't it? Ah, poor Joe Stoit. Think of having that millstone round one's neck. Well, I shouldn't exactly think it is a millstone. Well, neither does Joe, but it is. Uh, perhaps it might help you if you knew about Joe. You know, we were at school together, he and I... Only nobody called him Joe in those days. <laughs> we, we called him Slob or Jelly Belly. <laughs> uh, you see, Joe was a fat boy, and how we punished him for his glandular deficiencies. You might remember that fat boy when you meet the man. Help you to understand. Well, here I am at home. Uh, George, I'll get off here. Okay, Mr. Proctor. Have a good time, Mr. Boyd. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Portage, pleased to meet you. My name's Stoit, Joe Stoit. Oh, I, uh... Did... You're older than I thought. Oh, the, the, the sear and withered leaf, you know, one sinking... Uh, across... What's your age? Fifty-four. Only fifty-four? <laughs> Ought to be full of pep at fifty-four. How do you do with a lady? <laughs> well, mon beau prince, oh, mon été. Uh, what's that? that? No use talking foreign languages to me. <laughs> I'm head of an oil company, got 2,000 stations in California alone. And not one man in any of the old filling stations that isn't a college graduate. <laughs> Go and talk foreign languages to them. There, you are to do those old papers, aren't you? What the devil is the name of them? Roebuck, Hoback. Just bought them this summer. Uh, the Hoback papers. Hoback, that's right. Uh, yeah. What were you saying about women when you started that foreign stuff one day? <laughs> well, uh, well uh, what, what was implying it was uh, normal for one's age? What do you know about what's normal at your age? Go talk to Dr. Obispo about that. Dr. Uh, Obispo? It won't cost you anything. He's on salary. He's a house physician. Knows everything about long life. Want to see the castle? I'll, uh, I'll take you around. Oh, that's very kind of you. Uh, I've already seen your, your burial ground. What? What's that? My burial grounds? What the devil do you mean? Well, I, 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 I understood what... Uh, that is, uh, the, that you own the Beverly Pantheon. Oh, oh, that. Well, don't say that again. Not for martyrs, you know. Can't get excited, Obispo one. Come on. It, uh, it is a large castle, isn't it? Uh, Twenty stories. We'll go down to the hospital now. Stoit Hospital for children. They call me Uncle Joe. Well, they do. <laughs> Poor kids. Makes me feel I'd kind of like to cry. By the way, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Portage. Uh, have you got a religion? Well, more or less, yes. Uh, the late Mrs. Stoit was very religious. Taught me a slogan. God is love. There is no death. Good one, eh? There is no death. <laughs> 
Well, I think it is. There used to be a text over my bed when I was a kid. Orange letters on a black cardboard. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Different, isn't it? Now, what the devil made me bring that? Oh, never mind. To Blazes with a hospital. We'll go up to the roof. Got a pool up there. We'll have a swim before dinner, huh? view from the swimming pool was remarkable. One had only to turn one's head to see successive vistas of plain and mountain, green, tawny, and faint blue. If one turned the other way, one saw Miss Virginia Monsible poised on the diving board. Miss Monsible was, uh, <laughs> well, uh, the chauffeur informed me that she was a particular friend of Mr. Stoit's. And in his friends, Mr. Stoit was particular, for she was, well, uh, she was excessively beautiful with not much bathing dress to conceal it. There, Uncle Joe. You're feeling kind of good. Oh, feeling fine, baby. Oh, doesn't the sun feel good? Jenny, baby, I'd like to eat you. I'm tough. Yeah, a little tough kid. What'd you bring old Baldy here for, Uncle Joe? Oh, to catalog some old papers I bought in England. <laughs> Looks funny, doesn't it? <laughs> Floating around that pool like an yeah, old Buddha. Yeah. I'm going to dive in and duck him. Oh, don't go away, baby. I did some business this morning. Might make a lot of money, real money. How much? Maybe half a million, maybe a million, maybe even more. Uncle Joe, I think you're wonderful. Ah, it's easy, baby, easy. Easy nothing. I say you're wonderful. So just keep your own mouth shut. Oh, stop, 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 stop it. You're tickling me. Stop it. Oh, my <laughs> wonderful Uncle Joe. I'll give you a present if the deal goes through. What'd you like, baby? I don't know. I never really want things bad. Uncle Joe, I don't think I want anything. Ah, oh, that's what I like about you, baby. No, I don't want anything. Don't you, Virginia? Well, I do. No, Bispo. Don't pussyfoot up like that. I don't like to be startled. I don't like it at all. Not at all. Mrs. Toyd, I don't advise you working up a temper. Anger is a poison, my friend, and not a slow one. But if you want to shorten your life instead of lengthening... All right, all right. Uh, what do you want, Doctor? To be precise, I want to inject 1.5 cubic centimeters of this stuff into the great man's gluteus medius. Uh, so, off with you, Virginia. Sig, you're an old... Up along, Angel. You think you're Tyrone Power or something, don't you? You're ready for the injection, Mr. Stewart. No, Bispo. I don't like the way you talk. No, I don't suppose you do. It makes your blood boil, but when your blood boils, your blood pressure goes up. And, well, you just can afford to be angry with oh, me. Oh, Miss Boy, I... I put you on your feet after the last stroke, Mr. Story. Without me, perhaps next week, the week after, within the year... I don't talk like that. I don't like it. But if I continue my research, perhaps ten years more for you. Or 20, or 30, or even... Well, there's no guessing about that. You think there's a chance, so Bispo? You really think that... That, my friend and benefactor, time will tell. Read an alpha injection. Roll over. <laughs> Be careful with that, Tompkins. Those papers are valuable. He sure got them crated up solid. I got them now. Uh, beautiful, aren't they? Hundreds of years. Hobart after Hobart. Knights, barons, earls. Records, letters, papers never catalogued. Oh, look here. Look here. Uh, 1576. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, Mr. Portage, I I'll be going. I will show you something, a copy of the Marquis de Sade. Oh, I've never even seen one on my mind. My, what an imagination. Oh, delicious. Just uh, call me when you want them other cases open. 
Uh, don't let me disturb you. I'm... I said, don't let me disturb you. I, I, what? My name is Obispo. <coughs> Dr. Sigmund Obispo, physician in ordinary to His Majesty King Stoyd I. And let's hope also the last. Oh, yes. Uh, I saw you at the pool. That's quite a stack of words you've got here. And dribble. Mm hmm? A string of words called religion, another string of words called philosophy, half a dozen other strings called ideals. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how you liberal artists stand it. Don't you pine for some sense once in a while? Oh, it's a great deal of fun, you know. Uh, hmm, just scrabbling about in the dust heaps. <laughs> Must worry about the meaning. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, anyway. Most of the PhD boys are blasted snobs trying to pull that high moral culture on you. You know, uh, uh, wisdom rather than knowledge. Mm. You know. At least you admit you're in your racket just for fun. That's what I'm in mind for. Oh? Mind you, I'm not entirely blind to the charms of your racket. Say, is, is that book the market is sad? Well, I it rather repairs to Well, me. well, it is. It's, just, uh, it's quite a man, you know. Mind if I borrow this? I've got a particular use for a book like this. Oh, but I see, I, I really yes, don't... Yes, thank you, you very much. Uh, come on down to the hall, see my laboratory. Well, you know, really, I should. I mean, these papers... They've waited the... 500 years. Come on, come on. Well, I, uh, I suppose... Uh, 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 longevity is my racket, you know. I wouldn't be able to follow it if I were in practice. Devil of a nuisance looking after patients. That's why I fasten on your story. Oh, he's concerned with longevity? Concerned? <laughs> the old gold scared, silly. <laughs> it's a panic with him, fear of death, you know. And uh, I've been living on that panic for five years. Oh, really? It's a researcher's paradise. I have everything I need with old Joe thrown in as a guinea pig. Oh, cooperative? Hmm? <laughs> well, he's ready to submit to anything, provided it gives him some hope of staying above the ground a few years longer. Oh? You know, it's an interesting thing, old age. Why should dogs be senile at 14 and parrots alive and kicking at 100? Or a fish live to 200 without signs of senility? While poor Joe Stoyd... Oh, here we are. Hey, oh, hey, fragrance, oh, huh? That's our mice. We've got nearly a thousand of those. Hello, Doc. Oh, my assistant, Pete Boone. Pete, this is Mr. Portage. Glad to meet you, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, pleased to meet you. Pete is a bright boy. Knows his physiology. Good with his hands, too. Uh, here, look at these mice, Portage. Mm, lively, aren't they? They're lively enough while their fakes last. They're shut full of what I poured into old Joe this morning. Not that the old devil needs it. Young Virginia, right? <laughs> I'll go get the diet sheets now. Well... Put my foot in it again. I beg your pardon? <laughs> Poor old Pete. He's fantastically in love. Thinks our Miss Mournciple's like something in the works of Tennyson. You know, chemically pure. <laughs> 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 well, if it makes him happy, I won't spoil. Oh, uh, speaking of Uncle Joey, take a look at this. Fish, by Joe. Yes, and what fish? Joe had them stolen from an estate in Europe. They've got rings in their tails dated 1761. 1761? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the beginning of my favorite period. Those carp are nearly 200 years old. Perfect health. And there's no reason why they shouldn't live another three centuries. It's incredible. There's something about the flora and the intestinal tract of those fish. Something that kills the poisons that produce senility. It's, it's something that... <laughs> oh, rather a fountain of you. <laughs> That's all right, my friend. Go ahead, laugh, laugh. But we're working on the operation that will transfer that something from the carp to... Well, now we're working on mice. Mice? Yeah. After that, large animals. And if it works all right on dogs and baboons, <laughs> it ought to work on Uncle Joe. We had dinner in the small dining room. It was the sort of place you think of when you hear the word cafe, with original Fra Angelico murals on the walls for a spiritual touch. Mr. Stoit was with us and Miss Monsipal. Dr. Obispo spent the hour telling stories to the lady while young Pete gazed at her with a 
a rapt pre rationalite expression. After lunch in Virginia, Pete and the doctor went off to feed the baboons. Here now, Virginia, throw the potatoes to them. Oh, aren't they cute? Absolutely divine. Well, divine is an adjective I hadn't thought of applying to baboons. But, uh, here, throw the rest of the food. That old fellow's looking seedy, Doc. He won't even come eat. He's hungry, all right. He's just afraid to leave his lady friend. Here, Angel, throw this potato in front of you. Okay. There. He's taking notice now. <laughs> but so is the young chap on the rocks. Look at him. He's just waiting till the old boy gets away so I can dash for the lady. Come on, funny face. Go get the carrot. Here. <laughs> and there goes young Launcelot sweeping down on the lady. That's young love for you. Oh, aren't they cute? The old one's too busy eating to notice us. Aren't they cute? Aren't they human? Mr. Proper would say it the other way around. Aren't we baboon-like? Oh, that's silly. Well, I don't know. He's pretty smart. Say, uh, as long as we're half down the hill, why not go see him? Get Portage to go with you. Oh, oh Proppy scares me stiff. Besides, I think I've got a headache. Sig, couldn't you give me something for it? Men sano and copra sano. Well, does it taste bad? I don't like nasty medicine. <laughs> no. no, 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 it's Latin. Sound mind and sound body. But the mind has just been demonstrated and the body is evident. You talk too much, Sig. Yes, yes, I know, dear. But only a trifle of it filters down into that pretty head. And if you're not going with Pete, come back to the castle. I'll read you an old book I borrowed from our English friend. Who's interested in old books? <laughs> Don't worry, Tommy. You will be in this one. Well, Mr. Portage, did you meet the ogre of the castle? I remembered about, uh, <laughs> uh, Jelly Belly. That made it easier, Mr. Proctor. Ah, poor Joe. I remember even at school, he was the kind of fat boy who bluffs it out. Fights back. Buys popularity by treating the girls to ice cream when he has to steal a dime from his grandmother's purse to do it. Believes it when they say he'll go to hell. Poor Joe. Ah, but that's life. And, uh, <clears throat> speaking of life, Pete, how's the work going? Oh, it's going just fine. Mm -hmm. If you succeed, what happens? Why, life is prolonged. Yes, I know that, but I, I meant something else. A uh, dog, for example, isn't that supposed to be a wolf that uh, hasn't fully developed? A uh, sort of uh, unborn wolf? Isn't that so? Mm -hmm. There's a theory like that. In other words, it's a tame animal because it doesn't have time to grow up to savagery. Isn't that supposed to be one of the mechanisms of evolutionary development? Yes, yeah, that's right. But what will happen with man? What would he grow into if you lengthened his life? You know, Pete, time and craving... That's our life. Now, what are you offering us? Another 200 years of time and craving? Time, Mr. Proper, for more good. Mm, time doesn't guarantee good, my boy. But you can fight for good, Mr. Proper. We fought for good when I was in Spain. And you'll find, Pete, that evil comes even out of those fights for good. <clears throat> but uh, well, what do you expect people to do when we're attacked by fascists? Sit down and let their throats be cut? No, no, I expect them to fight. People generally do, and the results are generally disastrous. I should like them to try something more effective someday. Yeah, but that's cynicism. Defeatism. Hey there, Proctor! Oh, here comes the Lord of Stoit Castle. What is it, Joe? Why the devil can't you leave my man alone? Hmm? Which man, Joe? My estate manager. Interfering with him in his work. You've been bothering him about those blasted farm hands again. What do you think you're doing? What's the idea? The idea? It's an old one, Joe. Your manager's treating those harvest hands like vermin, not like men and women. They haven't enough to eat. You're trying to make reds out of them. You're a lousy agitator. I uh, thought we were talking about eating. You're stalling. Eating and... Working, wasn't that it? I've put up with you for years, Bill, for old time's sake. But you're making the place dangerous for decent people to live in. 
I'll have you run out of the valley. I see that you're... You're... I see that you're... I'll... Uh, uh, somebody get me a chair. Here, here you are, Mr. Stoyle. Uh, thanks. Thanks. I uh, mustn't get angry. Obispo said so. Uh, terrible thing. Terrible to fall into the hands of a living God. Uh, terrible. What's the matter, Joe? Uh, nothing. I'm better. It's all right. I've got something to show you, Joe. Been meaning to. It's, uh, it's a sun motor. A thing for making use of solar energy. Runs my electric generator. What? Why the devil do you want to do that? Haven't you got your current wired in from the city? Oh, of course, but I'm trying to see how independent I can be from the city. A uh, little Jeffersonian democracy. Oh, uh, you're turning back the clock, Bill. You're going against progress. Am I? Well, don't worry about it, Joe. No, uh, you're a crackpot, Bill. I guess you always will be. But remember what I said. You stay away from my manager. I, I won't stand it. I'm the boss on my estate. Mr. Stoyt forgot all about his blood pressure and the living God, and he felt suddenly happy. It occurred to him that in spite of everything, Bill Proctor liked him. In a glow of good feeling, he went home to his castle and straight to Virginia's boudoir. Oh, Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe. Hello, baby. Glad to see me. My baby. Oh, Uncle Joe. Oh, oh Miss Paul. What are you doing here? I was a bit worried by the call for yours at lunch. That's why I came up here to make sure of catching you the moment you came in. The prevention, you know, is better than cure. I'm not going to let you get influenza if I can help it. No, is that it? Well, I feel fine. Nothing wrong with me at all. That cough wasn't anything. Only my old, uh, you know, uh, chronic bronchitis. Yes, yes, but I'd like to listen and open your shirt. Huh? He's right, Uncle Joe. You wouldn't want anything to happen. Well, all right. That's fine. Now, breathe in deeply. Breathe. <sighs> Night fell on Stoit Castle, and the long halls were shrouded with shadows. In his room, Pete Boone was dreaming of Virginia, trying to equate his vague yearning for political and religious justice with the warm glow he felt when he considered Miss Monsible, uh, even objectively. While in the young lady's room, the object of his adoration was busy redecorating her toenails. Oh, darn. Polish is coming off my toe. Darn it. Darn it. Oh, Polish stinks. Uncle Joe? Uncle Joe? Good evening, Angel. Sig, what are you doing here? I thought we might have a little talk. After all, we were interrupted this afternoon. Sig, you're crazy. Uncle Joe will kill you if he finds you. Why, he'll pull that gun right out no, of his no, pocket no, 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 and... No, 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 darling, he won't. He won't. You can take the word of a medical man, is it? Uncle Joe will sleep through the last trump. I've just seen to that. <laughs> I think you're awful. Well, don't let me interrupt your labors. Proceed with your paint job. Yeah. Woman's work is never done. You see... I don't like the way you talk. The polish, darling, is running. Oh, darn. I don't like your getting fresh with me. You know, Uncle Joe almost caught you this afternoon. My trusty hypodermic, my dear, I disarm all suspicion. But you're not even romantic or anything. You just laugh at me and you make dirty cracks. Well, it isn't even nice. <laughs> You know, I admired the way you flirted with young Pete this evening. Uncle Joe was hopping jealous of her. Oh, darling, poor Pete. <laughs> Just wait till I get time for you. No, <laughs> my job, Tony. Oh, you. 
Well, it takes a professor of pharmacology to put an old buzzard into a coma with a few drops of this and that. I won't have you calling Uncle Joe a buzzard. No. Shall we say then a senile, foul-smelling goat? Why, you dirty. Uncle Joe's a better man than you'll ever be. I think he's wonderful. Yes, yes. You think he's wonderful. But all the same, in about five minutes, you'll be kissing me. What? Why, you filthy, dirty, Look nasty. out, darling. You're spoiling the polish on your toes. Just wait till I'm finished. I don't believe I will. You know, the perfume of yours is strong enough to cut right through the stink of that polish. Darn you. Get away from me. No good. Virginia, I believe you're going to kiss me now. Oh, you rotten Abe. Master bedroom, under a 25-foot mural of the crucifixion of St. Peter by El Greco, the Lord of Stoit Castle slept with a revolver under his pillow and with fear sitting at his bedside. Crawling, damp fear. In his dream, the shroud flapped and he heard the squeak of the screws he clamped down the heavy lid of his coffin. Listening to After Many a Summer Dies the Swan by Aldous Huxley. And here again, Miss Eva Legallion. As a playwright, he has been less successful, though I've always liked his play, The World of Light. Some critics have resented his increasing concern with the field of mysticism, which has naturally caused a change in the manner as well as the contents of his work. Sidney Case says of him, for instance, from being anxiously intellectual, he became too confusedly anti-intellectual. Well, people who think along these lines bemoan the fact that he has become less and less an entertaining novelist and more and more a man absorbed in the search for truth. I see no reason to condemn a man for that. Might be a good thing for the state of the world in general if more of us engaged in this arduous occupation. One of the results of this concern of his is his book, The Perennial Philosophy, which has opened doors to many thousands of people, including myself, and which seems to me a tremendously valuable contribution to living. But we'd better get on with our story, which presents Mr. Huxley in what one might perhaps call his middle period. So we'll resume with Act Two of After Many a Summer Dies the Swan in just a moment. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. KFI, Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony, Incorporated. 102. 102. 102. 102. 102. Brew 102. Brew 102. Perfected after brewing 101 brew. 102. Brew 102 is the brew for you. A whale of a pale dry brew. Meyer Brewing Company, Los Angeles. Now, Act Two of the new theater's transcribed production of After Many a Summer Dies the Swan. Muddling about with the Hoburg papers was completely fascinating. The fifth Earl of Garnister, about 1789, writes as follows. If men and women did woo as noisily as do cats, what Londoner could ever hope to sleep o' nights? 
Mozart speaks the 18th century. But the 20th century, life in Stoyt Castle came rapidly to a rolling boil. The baby, um, uh, Miss Mauncible, had that inward dreamy look of young ladies who discovered that love does not necessarily go with the largest checkbook. While Uncle Joe became chronically ill-tempered due to jealousy of, uh, <laughs> oddly enough, young Pete. On the longevity front, Dr. Obispo swore constantly that soon we should all be living as long as crocodiles. But for those of us doomed to shuffle off the mortal coil, there is always the Beverly Pantheon, Joe Stoit President. Now, the total profit, Mr. Stoit, comes to over 500000 for the three-month period. Not bad for a boneyard, eh, Mr. Stoit? Don't talk that way and close that door. That caterwauling organ ruins my digestion. Sure, Mr. Stoit, sure. Now, what'd you get me over here for? I don't like this place. I don't like cemeteries. Mr. Stoit, look, this here idea I had. You know that ridge up there by the tiny Taj Mahal? Yeah. Well, I figure we can dig right under it and make it a catacombs. A what? A class A catacombs, like in Rome. Now, how about a chapel of the martyrs with a nice plastic group of girls being eaten up by lions? People would get a big kick out of that. Sex appeal in death. What a promotion. Listen, Charlie. I don't like the idea. And there's another thing. Some young fool out there had the nerve to show me a place he said they had saved for me. Fire him. Sure, Mr. Stoyd, sure. Uh, you can get the estimates and plans for your cave, but no martyr. Not even one day, Mr. Stoyd. Just one. No martyr. That's final. <laughs> Call my car. I want to get out of here. <laughs> You tell me about Pete Boone. He's a confused young man, if that's what you mean, Joe. I want to know what should I do about him. Why? Ginny keeps patting him like a big dog. If the kid would only make a pass at her, I could throw him out. But you can't just fire a, a, a big dog. <laughs> you still like your Virginia, eh? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. She makes you feel good. Like when you get tanked up on scotch or when you give a toy to a kid. She's kind of, uh, well, kind of like a daughter. Mm. But more than a daughter, eh, Joe? Better than a daughter. A combination, is that it? <laughs> sort of. Uh, but she's changed. She isn't, well, she isn't the same. Besides, I haven't been feeling good. That blasted cemetery always gets me down. Eh, nobody left, eh, Joe? No friends, no religion, no philosophy... And only Virginia. Well, uh, there's no sense to anything. That's what's wrong. Mm, it's an idiot world, Joe. We all live in an idiot universe. Of course, we we can't all afford to build it out of concrete and steel the way you did. You mean the castle? What's wrong with the castle? Well, nothing, if you can stand idiocy. I... Uh, never mind. I tell... Oh, never mind the whole thing. Never get a straight answer out of you lousy professors anyway. Forget it. Never should have talked to you in the first place. No. No, Joe, you shouldn't. And you lay off those harvest workers. You've been stirring them up. This is my place, Phil. My place. Working on the Hoburg papers kept me busy during the day. Most of it was dull, merely accounts, legal documents, and business letters. Not at all my cup of tea. But at 12 o'clock, I found the parchment-bound notebook belonging to the 5th Earl of Gunster. The first entry was July 1780. And as I read, I could hear in my mind's ear the strong voice of the 5th Earl, author of this remarkable journal. July 1780. One of the church livings and my gifts being vacant, my sister sent to me today a young divine whom she commends for his virtue. But I will not have him. Give me the parson that drinks deep, rides to hounds and games the night away. Such a parson tests the faith of his flock. And it is thus we come to salvation. <laughs> a wicked old fellow, now let's see. Oh. March, 1784. Open the old tombs beneath the house today. A kind of ropey slime depends from the roof. 
and coats the walls. It is the condensation of decay. Hello! Tombs beneath Gollister House. That'll cause quite a ripple in England. Let's see now. 1789, 94, 95. I have tried King David's remedy against old age and found it wanting. Warmth cannot be imparted, but only evoked. I'm an old man now, weak and shrunken, without desires. So, the fifth earl suffers from Uncle Joe's complaint. Well, 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 well. <laughs> July 1796. There are carp in the fish ponds at Gunnister with leaden discs which were attached to their tails in the days of Charles I, 300 years ago. Hi, George, so he's onto the carp, too. I marvel at the strength and unimpaired agility of these great fishes. The secret of eternal life is not to be found in old books or even in heaven. It is to be found in the mud and only awaits a skillful angler. The secret of life in the mud. <laughs> well, won't that hand of his poet Joe his best ideas on longevity anticipated in the 18th century and by the fifth Earl of Goddess Star? You mean to say some old fossilized Earl was onto the carp theory? Oh, well, can you tell that? Well, you're not annoyed. Oh, why the devil should I be? Well, you're very I. I mean, it's been anticipated. Uh, let's hear more about your fifth earl. Huh? You say he lived till 90? More than 90. 96 or 7. He died in the middle of a scandal once more. Oh, not really. Well, what, what sort of a scandal? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, um, it seems he had a tendency towards uh, homicidal pleasures. <laughs> killed somebody? Not actually killed. Uh, just damaged. Hmm. You know, the old buzzard's line, the secret of life is to be found in the mud. That's almost a definition of science. Well, I was up to 1796. The old chap was feeling pretty seedy. A pharmaceutical tragedy. Well, I'll bet he could have been fixed up with a week of injections. Hey, get to the diary. And let's hear the old ghost speak for himself. Yeah, well, certainly. January 1797. Why should a man die at three score years and ten when a fish can retain its youth for two and three centuries? Man cooks his food before eating it and generally throws away precisely those organs of the fish in which it is most reasonable to assume that the substance preventive of decay is contained. Good Lord. Don't tell me the old buzzard is going to eat raw fish guts. That's exactly what he is doing. Now, listen. My first three attempts provoked an uncontrollable retching. At the fourth, I was finally able to retain a few spoonfuls of the nauseating mincemeat. Oh, talk about courage. I'd rather go through an air raid than that. February, 1797. It is now a month since I began to test the truth of my hypothesis. And I am now ingesting each day not less than six ounces of raw minced viscera of freshly opened carp. Oh, good Lord. A fish has more parasites than any other animal. It makes my blood run cold. You needn't worry. The diary goes on, you know. March. Improved in strength. April, horseback riding again. I said, oh, this is more than a joke. Raw fish guts, prevention of senile poisoning, and rejuvenation. Rejuvenation. In September, he's been out fox hunting. After which, there's no entry until 1799. No entry until 1799. That's when his case is getting really interesting. He goes and leaves us in the dark. Oh, not entirely in the dark. There's an entry a little further on. The age of 81, the fifth Earl is the proud father of a bouncing baby boy. <laughs> At... Eighty-one? <laughs> what do you think of that? And here in 1820, he seems to be in the prime of life. 1826, he's taken on a new uh, housekeeper named Kate. At 1831, he has repairs made on the dungeons of Garnister House. And how about his health? Oh, he seems to take it for granted. 
Wait, wait. Now listen to this. March 1834. I, the criminal negligence of Kate, Priscilla, my young serving girl, has been allowed to escape from a subterranean place of confinement. Unfortunately, she bears upon her person the evidence that for some weeks she has been the subject of my investigations. She holds in her hands my reputation and perhaps even my liberty and life. Well, there it is. That's the scandal. From the old devil. <laughs> the girl must have told a story. <laughs> well, well, what's next? I, I really can't make it out. It, it is devilish odd. My funeral will be conducted with all the pomp befitting my rank and virtues. My only regret is that I shall be unable to leave my subterranean retreat to see the pageantry of woe. I go now to my own private hell, deep beneath the walls of Gonister House. And that's all. There's nothing else. Just two more blank pages and the end of the book. And nobody knows how long the old buzzard lived out. Not outside the family. There's an old woman living in Gonister House now, Lady Jane Holbrook, the last of the line, which Paulich, is completely... Paulich, do you realize what this means? Well, the, the fifth Earl could still be... Yes, it could be. Bless me. I suppose he really could. But that you've got to find out. I'm taking the next boat to England. <laughs> Sing, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. Why are we going to England? Uh, it's a secret, Angel. I haven't even told Uncle Joe yet, but you take it from me. We'll go. Well, I wish you'd go somewhere. And I don't mean England. Uh, harsh words, Angel. I mean it. I don't like the way you act. I feel like I'm double-crossing Uncle Joe all the time. Darling, you are. Besides, I haven't been able to say my prayers. I don't like you, Sid. I don't like you at all. <laughs> Still, there isn't much you can do about it, is there? You make up your mind that you hate me, don't you? That you won't speak to me again, won't even look at me. Sid, go away. But you can't keep that promise, can you? You don't mean that at all. Hi there. Portage. Uh, yes, Mr. Stoyt. Uh, come on up to the roof with me. I want to talk to you. Uh, yes, of course. Get in the elevator. Oh, thank you. Rotten time today. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was that blasted cemetery. Always gets me down. Going up to see Virginia now. She always makes me feel better. Wouldn't know what to do without. She's mine. She loves her old Uncle Joe. You can bet your bottom dollar on that. Here we are. Oh, after you, Mr. Stoyd. Oh, cut it out, Sid. <laughs> if you kiss me again, I'll hate you. Sure, darling. You'll go ahead. Hate me. Uh, baby, what is this Uncle Joe! You snake. Uh, you dirty, slimy, filthy snake. I'll kill you. No. I'll, I'll kill you. No, Uncle Joe, no. Look out for that gun. I'll no. kill you. I'll kill you. Get away. I, I'll... You're a lousy shot, Uncle Joe. Uh, let go of my arm, Jenny. No. I'll get him this time. No, no don't shoot, oh, Uncle Joe. Let go of him, Jenny. Let go. Let him shoot if he dares. Every... What do you mean, if I dare? I'll kill you, a beast. Oh. No, no, you won't, Uncle Joe. You won't. Because then you'll die, too. What? What's that? If you kill me, it won't be long before they've got you stretched out under the black marble mausoleum at your Beverly Pantheon. Well, 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 what the devil do you mean? That I've just found a new way to keep you alive. But without me, you'll be a dead man in a month. No. No, you don't mean that. That isn't so. That isn't true, is it, Obispo? You had a stroke, Joe. You had a stroke. But I've got good news for you. There's a chance that we have found the secret of life in the mud. You found it? What is it, Obispo? What is it? I've got to have it now. Drop the gun, Uncle Joe. What? 
Uh, oh, the girl, uh, sure, sure. What is it to be so? I'm going to live. I'm not going to die. We shall see, Joe. You've got to keep me alive, Obispo. You've got to. Oh, after you tried to kill me? Oh, well, it was an accident. I, I didn't mean to. You can't let me die when you know how to stop it. You can't. If you don't mind all, I'm going to sit down. You've got to keep me living. You've got to. You can have anything you want. I can pay for anything. Anything? <laughs> well, Uncle Joe, now you are talking turkey. <laughs> yes, sir. Now you are talking turkey. The Stoic private airplane whisked the party to New York, then Gander, Newfoundland, Shannon Island, and finally, the modern chariot of the sun set down rather roughly at Croydon Airport, London. Consul gas supplied a tremendous black limousine, and off it drove through the diluted London sunshine down into the country towards Garnister House. Mr. Stoit sprawled under a fur rug in the back seat of the car. He was on sedation by the doctor's order, so he slept fitfully as the car roared on. Dr. Obispo was at the wheel, while Virginia sat aloof on the front seat. I dreamt I dwelt in marble oh, for heaven's halls. Sake, shut up, will you? Uh, no fear, wake, Uncle Joe, honey. It's out like a light. And will you love me in December as you do I could in kill May? You. <laughs> Why not? It's open season on doctors, darling. But don't worry, don't worry, Angel. We understand each other, Uncle Joe and I. We even understand about you. <laughs> I dreamed I killed the golden goose that laid the golden egg. Stop it! Uh, what? Uh, what, I... what matter? <laughs> she What's ob... wrong? She objects to my singing. Goodness knows why. I have such a charming voice, particularly well adapted to a small auditorium like this car. <laughs> uh, what is it? Are we here? Yes, indeed we are here, Uncle Joe. Gunnister House. I like it, Uncle Joe. It's scary. Oh, it's all right, baby. It's all right. Yeah, look out for the creepers on the path. Not much of a garden, eh? It's all grown over. <gasps> hmm? What's the matter? Someone behind that bush. Oh. <laughs> Come on out, youngster. Come out. Look what I've got. <laughs> I've got a gas mask. That's what I've got. Oh, that's nice. Gas mask all filled with flowers, huh? What's your name? Millie. I'm Nine? Nine. Granny says I'm undernourished. Oh. Uh, does your granny live here, Minnie? In the kitchen. She's dead. Oh. Do you like candies? Huh? Uh, what the devil they call candies in England? Uh, uh, would you like some sweets? Uh, let us in and you can have them more. Well, I... I don't know. Oh, nice chocolatey sweets. Whole box of them. Well, all right. Come on. Way, sir. Right along this hall. I don't get this, Obispo. I don't understand why we're here. Why can't you tell me? Now, don't get worried, I thought you. Obispo, can you prove absolutely there's no such place as hell? Can you prove the wrong side of the moon is not inhabited by green elephants? No, seriously. But don't no. bother me with the nonsense. But do you think hell is possible? Everything is possible. Uh, Millie. Yes, sir? Where's the cellar door, dear? No. What do you mean, no? Just show us the door to the cellar. I won't, I'm afraid. There's ghosts down there. You don't have to go, dear. Just show us. If you don't, you shan't have any more candies. Uh, sweets. Come on, give them back. No. Yes, I'm going to eat them all up myself. Please don't. Mm, they're good. I good. want some. Oh, poor little <laughs> Millie isn't going to have any more sweet chocolates. Mm, they're so good. I want my sweets. Not till you show us the door to the cellar, dear. Hold that flashlight up, Angel. 
I'm scared. Yes, it's crazy. I don't like this abyssal. It's damp down here. I'm not well. All right, you stick with us, Uncle Joe. Maybe we can fix it so you won't have to find out about hell. Wait a minute. There's a door. Is it? Is it locked? No. No, wait a minute. Come on. Oh, that's awful. That smell. <laughs> Pretty bad. Come on, come on. Uh, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. What do you think you're going to find out here? Hey, stop being a sniveling baby, Uncle Joe. I'm not sure of anything. For all I know, you may die in five minutes. No, no. Don't say that. Well, then, come on. Oh, that smell. It's getting worse. It's awful. Just around this corner here. The flashlight up. Here, give it to me. I'll, I'll go ahead. There's an iron barred door here. Wait till I get the light focused. Doesn't quite seem to... <laughs> What's the devil? What's the matter? What's going on with these holes? What are you laughing about? What? Oh, Lord. Yes, that, Uncle Joe. That, that's a feet late. <laughs> what? For Lord's sake. What? By Harry, old man Proctor was right. It's an unborn ape that's had time to grow up. Look at him. Look at him, Uncle Joe. Look. Look here. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Isn't it too good? Look at the face. His matted hair, deep eyes, sockets. No eyebrows. Look at the forehead. Dirty wrinkles. And that shelf of bone jutting out over his eyes. Just look at him. Look at him scratch. Look at him, Joe. The feet lay. But, 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 what is it? What is it? It's a man. That's what it is. Look at the ribbon across his chest. That's the order of St. George. You're looking at the noble lord, the fifth earl of Gunnison. <laughs> no. No. Yes, yes, the fifth Earl of Gunners, 201 years old, last January. But, what, what happened to him? Just time, time. Time? Yeah, she never died, so it's time. Time for a man, the unborn ape, to grow up to be. Oh, take me away, it's awful. <laughs> but it's the best joke I ever heard. It's absolutely the best. <laughs> we don't have to experiment anymore. You know what? What do you mean? You can start taking the stuff at once. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yes, if you're willing to become like that, you can live forever, Joe. What do you say? What do you say? I... Uh... Whisper. How long do you figure it would take before a person got like that? I mean, it wouldn't happen all at once. There'd be a time when a person... Well, you know why they wouldn't change it. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't want to, Uncle Joe. You don't want to. Once you get over the first shock, I mean, it's better than dying, isn't it? Looks like he has a pretty good time. Uh, I mean, in his own way, of course. Don't you think so, Obispo? Don't you think so, Obispo? <laughs> You have heard After Many a Summer Dies the Swan by Aldous Huxley. The dramatization was by Ernest Canoy. And here again, Miss Eva Legallion. Oh, there's something decidedly ghastly about that ending. Might almost have been written by Edgar Allan Poe. Makes me glad it's still daylight here. (laughs) Now about next week. We're going to present a very different kind of story in a decidedly popular vein. One for which we have had many requests. It's a new dramatization of Daphne du Maurier's great yarn, Rebecca. Good evening, this is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts, presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon. The Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night... Pabst Blue Ribbon presents you with a front row seat in America's favorite summer theater. So, while America's famous producer, writer-director, Orson Welles, entertains you, pour yourself a tall, frosted glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon and enjoy at the same time great entertainment and this truly great beer. And now, Mr. Welles. 
Tonight, the Mercury brings you one of the loveliest of all love stories. It's by John Galsworthy, and it's called The Apple Tree. It was Stella's and my silver wedding anniversary. We'd motored to Torquay where we'd first met to celebrate. Well, Stella had suggested that we take a lunch and drive out on the moor. It would be so lovely there, Frank. It's quite warm in the sun. I can do some sketching while you read. We drove several miles and stopped on a high hill with a view into the deep valley beyond. Stella wandered off somewhere to sketch and I stretched out in the sun and watched the sky and longed for... I knew not what... There's no reason I should be unhappy or even mildly disturbed. My life had been pleasant, my marriage quite successful, but as I lay there, it seemed to me that there was something missing, something that had nothing to do with pleasant lives or successful marriages. The familiar words of Hippolytus echoed in my mind. The apple tree. The apple tree of the singing... And the gold. The apple tree. And then quite suddenly, I remembered. I'd been here before. Years before. I'd stood on this self-same hill. I knew the valley into which I looked. That ribbon of road and the old well behind. Life has moments of sheer beauty of unbidden flying rapture, but they last no longer than the span of a cloud's flight over the sun. I'd stumbled on just such a moment in my own life. I'd stumbled on a buried memory, a wild, sweet time. It was after my first year in college. A friend of mine, Robert Cart, and I were making a walking tour of the country around Torquay. But my knee, which had been injured in a football game the year before, was giving me trouble. I knew I'd have to give up the tour. We were looking for a farmhouse somewhere where we could put up until I got better. I don't think you ought to walk much farther, Frank. Why don't I go ahead and reconnoiter? Oh, I won't need to. There's someone coming. There's a girl. The wind blew her crude little skirt against her legs and lifted her battered tam o' It was clear she was a country girl. Shoes were split, her hands were rough and brown, and her hair waved untidily across her forehead. But her lashes were long and dark, and her gray eyes were a wonder, dewy as if opened for the first time that day. Hello? Could you tell us if there's a farm near here where we could spend the night? My friend's getting pretty lame. There's our farm, sir. Oh, could you put us up? I'm sure my aunt would be glad to. If you like, I'll show you the way. I would appreciate it very much. It's not very far, just down the valley. Right through the apple orchard, and we're there. Just through a narrow wood, we came on the farm. A long, low, stone-built house with casement windows and a farmyard where pigs and fowls and an old mare were straying about, and in front, an orchard of apple trees just breaking into flower. A woman stood by the door watching as we approached. This is Mrs. Narico, my aunt. And we met your niece on the road. She said she... she thought you might put us up. Well, I can if you don't mind one room. Megan, get the spare room ready and a bowl of cream. The gentleman will be wanting tea, I expect. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Narico. By the way, I... we haven't been introduced. No, sir. Well, this is Robert Carton. I'm Frank Ashes. How do you do, sir? Hello, What's your name? Megan David. Are you a Devonshire girl? Oh, no, sir. I'm from Wales. You're very young, aren't you? I'm 17, sir. Well, how many of you live here? Well, there's my aunt and her two nephews. The boys who saw you came. Nick and Rick, they're caught. Then there's old Jim, a hired man. Quite a family. Yes, sir. If there's anything else you want, you call. All right. Thank you. Pretty thing, isn't she? Huh. Pretty, she's like a flower. Like a wildflower. You come on unexpectedly in the woods. Mm, a bit poetic for me. But I see your point. 
I say, Frank, your knee is pretty bad. Yeah. Why don't you say I leave you here for a couple of days? Well, it does hurt like the devil. What about you? Well, I have to get back to London, but I can get the train from Torquay. That is, if you don't mind being left alone. As a matter of fact, I should like it. Nothing to do but dream and watch spring on a farm. I've always wanted to do that. Well, good luck to you, then. Look me up when you get to London. And uh, be careful of the wildflowers. <laughs> good to be left alone. I think they were glad to have me. Negan and around worried about my lameness as if I'd been one of the family. From the very first, I'd felt that Megan liked me. She performed little kindnesses for me that weren't part of her duties. As the days went by, I began to expect them. When I woke in the morning, the thought of her made me anxious to be up and downstairs... Even if I didn't talk with her, I liked to be near where I could hear her singing at her work. One day I was down by the big apple tree. And the two little boys, Nick and Rick, were playing there by the pool. <laughs> Watch out, Rick. A gypsy bogle will get you. Gypsy bogle? <laughs> what do you mean by the gypsy bogle, Rick? The gypsy bogle sits on the stone there by the apple tree. Oh, sometimes. what does he look like? Don't know. Never seen him. Megan says he's that there. Megan's afraid of him. Oh. But she's not afraid of you. She says a prayer for you. Well, how do you know that, you little rascal? When I was asleep, she said, God bless us all and Mr. Rashes. I heard her whispering. <laughs> you're a little rough in to tell what you hear when you're not meant to hear it. You see, Rick, I told you not to tell him. Nick, Rick, come here, both Here of they you. are, Megan. And I've been looking all over for the rascal. <laughs> go into the house at once. <laughs> Auntie wants you. Now go on with you. Nick told her about the gypsy bogle. <laughs> go on now. No more nonsense, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Children are silly sometimes. Oh, I don't think so. They're often more sensible than grown-ups. Tell me, Megan. What's this gypsy bogle they're talking about? He brings bad things. They're bogles in the rocks. And men who lived long ago. There's one that comes here and sits on that rock. Oh, I should come down one night and sit on the rock there and have a talk with him. Oh, please don't. Something will happen to him. What does it matter if anything happened to me, Megan? Would it disturb you a lot? Well, I dare say I shan't see him because I suppose I shall have to be off pretty soon. Oh, no. Would you like me to stay? Yes. Very much. Well, then I will stay. And tonight, Megan, I will... I'm going to say a prayer for you. You're laughing at me. You're laughing at us, all of us. That's not true, Megan. Believe me, that's not true. Why? I... Wait, Megan. Your hair. Your hair, it's caught in the apple blossoms. Don't move, Megan. Don't move. Oh, you're... You're beautiful with those clusters of pink blossoms in your dark hair. Megan. Oh... So very, very sweet, me. You too. Megan, come here tonight to the big apple tree after they've gone to bed. Megan, promise. I promise. time after Megan had fled away through the orchard, I stood there under the apple tree. This was the beginning of what? She was so lovely, so unutterably lovely and untouched. I felt somehow as if I'd beheld a miracle and it had transformed me. I walked on toward the wild meadow. Jim, the hired man, was out there. Good evening to you, Mr. Good evening, Jim. The, it is brave weather for the grass. Jim, they, they tell me you've seen the gypsy boggle. Uh, have you seen it, too? Is that right? Well, it were in my mind as twas there this evening, a little of four. Ask Megan. If she was there, she's seen him. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she's sensitive. She, 
She feels everything. She's very loving hearted. Loving hearted. Hey. Yes. That was it. What was I to do about this girl who loved me so? And whom I loved. I walked for a long time. In the orchard, I broke off a spray from a crab apple tree. The buds were like Megan. Shell pink. Rose pink. Wild and fresh. And the opening flowers white and wild and touching. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to our Mercury production of John Galsworthy's great love story, The Apple Tree. Now, before we bring you the final act of The Apple Tree, here's Jimmy Warlington, who has the glint of an old grad in his eyes. He thinks of the coming football season. Ah, oh, yes, Orson. Tomorrow and next Saturday, the old pigskin season swings into action. Those first really post-war 11s gallop out on the field. And that reminds me, of course, of Blended Splendid, Paps Blue Ribbon. For what is that truly great beer but a team? A blend of never less than 33 fine brews, each in itself an all-American for flavor and quality. Yes, and what is finer than to have the team right with you in a tall, foam-capped glass as you sit by your radio and listen to the referee's whistle start the Saturday gridiron battles? Yes, friends, you'll find me tomorrow right by my radio, listening to a football game, and right beside me where I can enjoy that perfect flavor, not too heavy, not too light, but clean, fresh, sparkling will be a good supply of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And say, incidentally, friends, if you occasionally can't get all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you wish, please keep on asking your dealer for it. We're doing our best to get you your share of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now part two of Orson Welles' Mercury production of the famous love story by John Galsworthy, The Apple Tree. <laughs> She kept her promise. Megan met me under the apple tree that night. She came straight toward me and into my arms. And our lips sought each other. And we stood there together for a long time in the moonlight. Megan, why did you come? Sir, you asked me to. Megan, darling, don't call me sir. Should I be calling you? Frank. Oh, I couldn't. But you love me, don't you? I couldn't help loving you, and I want to be with you. That's all. That's all? I shall die if I can't be with you. You shall be with me forever, Megan. Forever. We'll go to London. I'll show you the world. I don't care where we go. If I can be with you... That's all. Tomorrow, dear, I'll, I'll go to Torquay and get some money and get you some clothes that won't be noticed when we get to London. If you love me well enough, we'll be married. Oh, no, I couldn't. I only want to be with you. Oh, Megan, I'm not nearly good enough for you. Tell me. When did you begin to love me? When I saw you on the road and you looked at me. But I never thought you'd want me. Oh, my darling... Gypsy bogle. The gypsy bogle? Where well, I don't see anything. They're sitting on the stone under the tree. Megan, there's nothing there, only the moonlight on the rock. I saw him, and I'm afraid. Bad sign. A oh, bad sign. I must go in. Darling Megan, there's nothing there. There's no gypsy bogle. It's only your imagination. You don't see the bogles, but I see them. And I know. Good night. Megan. Megan. I heard the gate click. Knew she'd gone. Instead of a... Only this old apple tree and the scent of the woods, a little part of her, 
And above me and around, the blossoms, more living, more moonlit than ever, seem to glow and breathe. Next morning, I left early and went to Torquay. I wanted to get some money, and I had to cash a check, but I found that without credentials, I'd have to wait till they wired the London Bank for verification. While I waited for the answer, I shopped for a dress for Megan. Here's something, sir. It's very smart. The more I looked at those modish gowns, the less they seemed suited to Megan. It was incredible that Megan, my Megan, could ever be dressed in anything except the rough tweed skirt and battered tam I'd always seen her wear. Couldn't make up my mind, and yet she couldn't wear her old clothes in London. They, they wouldn't suit her either. Couldn't make up my mind. I walked the streets of Torquay, confused and undecided. Well, Frank Ashurst, haven't seen you since rugby. Oh, Halliday, Phil Halliday, this is a surprise. Hey, if you're not lunching anywhere, come with me. Uh, I'm here with my sister Stella. Oh, that's good. I... I'd love to see Stella, and I haven't any good reason for refusing, Phil. Oh, great, Scott. I've completely forgotten the time. It's after three and the bank's closed. Splendid. And that means you'll have to stay over in oh, no, no, I, I can't do that. Oh, we should love to have you. I know Phil's getting bored to death with me, and we've had such fun. Yes, it has been fun, Stella. I've been rustic for so long, I'd almost forgotten how pleasant London talk can be. Very well. <laughs> I'll stay. I sent a wire to Mrs. Narrocombe. I hoped that Megan would understand. Just this one day away from her wouldn't matter. It was the life that I'd always known. Gay, cheerful, normal people. Just a few more hours of their life before I left it altogether. Didn't seem wrong. Stella was a pretty thing. Curious the calm way she looked at me. As if she understood everything and... I never questioned too deeply. But that night I couldn't sleep. I thought of Megan. I was with her again. Under the living, breathing whiteness of the blossoms... The moonlight on her upturned face, a face of innocence and humble passion. Megan, poor little trusting Megan. How much did I really love her? How much was madness and the spring and the wild beauty of her? I thought of Stella. Stella, cool, poised and friendly. Stella belonged to the world I knew and understood, a world that understood me. Megan. Megan didn't understand, and she never could belong. She loved me, but was that enough for either of us? I didn't know what to do. Phil and Stella had asked me to go with them to Totnes for a picnic. I hadn't given them a definite answer, nor had I sent any further wire to Mrs. Narricom. Today I had to decide. I knew that. I went out for a walk along the cliff wall. There was a high sea running. There weren't many people out. I'd walked a mile or so, I guess, before I saw her. There she was. Megan in her old skirt and jacket and tam o She was looking for me. I knew that at once. She'd look up into the faces of the passers-by, wavering, lost-looking, and somehow pitiful. I followed her a long way. Once she stopped and leaned against the seawall. 
I wanted her again. I wanted her kisses. Her abandonment, all her quick, warm, pagan emotion. And the wonderful feeling of that night under the moonlit apple tree. Yet I... I couldn't move toward her. I couldn't let her know I was there. For suddenly I realized that to go back to the farm and love Megan out in the woods, among the rocks with everything around wild and fitting, that was what I wanted. And that was impossible. But to transplant her to the town, to keep her in some little flat, and when the wild ecstasy wore off to find her commonplace, unable to fit into my world and no longer able to go back to her own... That was worse. Far worse. I took another long, last look at that pathetic, wistful figure staring out over the sea. Goodbye, Megan. Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye. later, I went back to London, traveling with the Hallidays. On the last day of April in the following year, Stella and I were married. All this I remembered as I sat there on the hill in the warm sun. And as I remembered an ache for a lost youth, a hankering and a sense of wasted love and sweetness gripped me. And the sun no longer warm. I got up and walked a ways down the road. There was a man standing by what I saw was a grave, an old man, he was. And the grave was by the crossroads. There was a moor stone to the west. And on it, someone had thrown a blackthorn spray and a handful of bluebells. Good afternoon to you, sir. A nice day for a walk. Can you tell me whose grave this is? Well, now it's quite a story. It was a poor soul that killed herself. It was a long time ago. She was a pretty girl, but too loving-hearted. Too? Too loving-hearted? In them days, I was working for Mrs. Norricombe, and she was too... There was a college gentleman staying with us. She took a fancy to him. He was a nice fella, too. Then one day he went away sudden-like and never come back. After that, she was crying a lot, and then one day I found her... She was lying in a pool by the old apple tree, by the stone where the gypsy boulder sat. It was June then, but she'd found a little bit of apple blossom and stuck it in her ear. I walked away. I'd heard enough. On the top of the hill, I lay down and buried my face in my hands. Megan's face brushed close. Megan, with a sprig of apple blossoms and her dark, wet hair. If I can be with you, that's all. If I can be with you. Oh, there you are, Frank. Look at my sketch. It's pretty, don't you think? Oh, oh yes, it's very pretty. Still... There's something wanting, isn't there? Yes. Yes. There was something wanting. The apple tree. The singing. And the gold. You have just heard the Orson Welles Mercury production of The Apple Tree by John Galsworthy. Mr. Wells will return in just a moment. But first, 
Let me again remind you to be patient with your dealer when, occasionally these days, he is unable to supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like. He's doing his best, you can be sure of that. Yes, and here's something else you can be sure of. Every single bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon you do get will, as always, be the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. Yes, every foaming, frosty glass you enjoy will, as always, have that famous Pabst Blue Ribbon flavor. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with a real beer taste coming through the way you like it. So keep asking for blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now, Mr. Webb. Ladies and gentlemen, because we have a couple of minutes before it's time to say good night, I'd like to read you a poem. Like our story tonight, deals with love and lost love. It's by Ernest Dawson. It's a great favorite. It's called Cinera. Last night, ah, yesternight, betwixt her lips and mine, there fell thy shadow, Cinera. Thy breath was shed upon my soul between the kisses and the wine. And I was desolate and sick of an old passion. Yea, I was desolate and bowed my head. I have been faithful to thee, Cinera, in my fashion. All night, upon mine heart, I felt her warm heart beat. Night long within mine arms in love and sleep she lay. Surely the kisses of her bought red mouth were sweet. But I was desolate and sick of an old passion when I awoke and found the dawn was gray. I have been faithful to thee, Cinera, in my fashion. I have forgot much, Cinera. Gone with the wind, flung roses, roses riotously with the throng, dancing to put thy pale, lost lilies out of mind. But I was desolate and sick of an old passion. Yea, all the time, because the dance was long. I have been faithful to thee, Cinera, in my fashion. I cried for madder music and for stronger wine. And when the feast is finished and the lamps expire, then falls thy shadow, Cinera. The night is thine. And I am desolate and sick of an old passion, yea, hungry for the lips of my desire. I have been faithful to thee, Cinera, in my fashion. And now it's time to say good night. Next week's show is Shakespeare's King Lear. Till then, we remain as always obediently yours. This program came to you through the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, makers of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Summer Theater. Welcome to the Summer Theater, a dramatic hour of romance, love, and adventure. Tonight, we present Daphne du Maurier's startling tale, The Birds, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Don Wilson. Tonight, we're presenting a brand new story by the famous author of Rebecca, Jamaica Inn, Frenchman's Creek, and many other favorites, Miss Daphne du Maurier. Now, this new story, however, is far different from any of these, and in many ways far more exciting. It's a tale I am sure will haunt you for a long time to come. 
The title is simply The Birds, and our star is Mr. Herbert Marshall. Our scene is London and the office of a successful publisher of books. With him sits Jenkins, his editor. Before them on the broad, shining surface of the desk is a manuscript, tattered, worn, its bulk held together with a bit of string. Strange way to submit a story. You say there was no address on it? No, the author left no address. But I wish you'd read it, sir. You like it, huh? You think it's publishable? I don't know. It's terrifying. I can't seem to get it out of my mind. Hmm. All right, Jenkins, all right. I'll read it. But mind you, it better be good. Just read it, sir. Title, The Birds, by John Waite. John Waite. John Waite. <laughs> My name is John Waite. I'm writing this as a minute record of what has happened thus far because I I cannot help feeling that in the recounting of these events I may, in some measure, come to an understanding of what has happened and even perhaps why it has happened. The whole business is monstrous and overwhelming and I'm not sure that human eyes will ever fall upon this, my journal. I am a writer of moderately successful fiction, and this small house on the Dover coast is my castle, which I share with my wife, my 16-year-old daughter, my mother-in-law, and one yellow canary. <laughs> the canary. His name is Chippikins. No, I didn't name him. My mother-in-law did. Chippikins belongs to Mother Dobbs, and bringing him here was an open and shut case of coals to Newcastle for Dover is alive with birds. And it has been my daily custom, work over, to sit at the cliff's edge and smoke my pipe and watch and listen. The birds, soaring and wheeling in great rushing flocks, flickering in a fat gray sheet just above the grassy slope of the hills, and then bursting all of a bunch, erupting into the sky, restless, ceaseless, Ever moving, ever moving, slashing as one in a perfect arc up, and then for a split moment, almost invisible, as in their turning, the profile, thin as glass, presents itself against the sky. And then as one, in cadence, back again, and with a slow chorus, gone. Black and white, jackdaw and gull, Mingling in strange, restless partnership, seeking some strange liberation, never satisfied, never still. Flocks of starlings rustling like silk, and the smaller birds, finches and larks, scattering from tree to hedge and back again. Compelled. By what? And below the seabirds, waiting for the tide... They have more patience. Oyster catchers, red shank, sandaling, and curl you, watch by the water's edge. Race the surf as it sucks away, revealing the prize. Farther out, the fishermen. Slim, soaring gannets. Ancient, patient pelicans. Black gulls, grey gulls, pale gulls. Soaring, sighting, and plummeting. Wings folded. Feet tight in, beaks out. Knife through the surface, down in a flash of silver to the prey below. Autumn had been a long one, mellow and soft. The leaves had lingered on the trees, red and gold, somehow reluctant to fall. The days grew hazy and benevolent, shortening imperceptibly. And with their passing, the birds seemed more restless, more driven, more agitated. 
My neighbor, the farmer, drove his tractor. Long, even lines across the western hills and his figure silhouetted in the driver's seat would be lost from time to time in the great cloud of wheeling, crying birds which followed his movements. And I remarked on this. Lots of birds around today. Hey, there are more birds than usual, and daring too. One or two goals came so close to my head this afternoon, I thought they'd knock my cap off. As it was, I could scarcely see what I was doing when they were overhead, and I had the sun in my eyes. I have a notion the weather will change. It'll be a hard winter. That's why the birds are so restless. My friend the farmer said the weather would change on Tuesday, and he may have been right. I'm not certain. The fact is, the weather changed that night. And it was that night that it began. I've been asleep. <laughs> what? What's that? Mm-hmm. Oh, something at the window. And go back to sleep, dear. I'm going to find out what it is. It was a bird. What kind, I could not tell. The wind must have driven it to shelter on the sill. I went back to bed and, feeling my knuckles wet, put my mouth to the scratch. The bird had drawn blood. I supposed it was frightened, panicked, seeking shelter. The wind was indeed very cold. The weather had turned. Are you awake? Yes. See to the window, will you, dear? It's rattling. I've already seen to it, Megan. There's some bird out there trying to get in. <sighs> Shoot away. I can't sleep with that noise. All right, dear. What? No, get, get away. Get out. Oh, what was that? What happened? <sighs> they went for me. Oh, John, you're still half asleep. Come back to bed. No, I tell you, they did. Yes, dear, of course. Come to bed. <coughs> what was that? Mother, and Jill. I'll get a, light a candle. No, no, hurry. I opened the door to our bedroom and crossed the landing to the room Jill shared with Mother Dobbs. It was pitch black in the room and the air was filled with small birds. I could feel them all about me. And I, I swung my arms. They crawled through the open window. They stuck the walls of the ceiling. <coughs> Quickly, Jill, come out. Mother Hobbs. I'm under the cover. Run for the door. I slammed the door after them. I didn't want the birds spreading through the house. Now in the darkness, they sensed me and dove for me. Tiny beaks and needle claws set to pierce and tear. I seized the quilt from the bed, wound it over my head, and then, swinging a pillow at random, I went to work. I couldn't see what I was doing, but I could feel the thudding of their bodies. I swung, swung, till my arm began to numb. How long I fought with them in the darkness, I do not know. At last, the beating of wings subsided and withdrew. And through the density of the quilt, I became aware of light. I waited, listened... But there was no sound. I dropped the quilt and stared about me in the cold gray light. Dawn and the open window had called the living birds. The dead lay on the floor. They were all small birds. Robins, finches, sparrows, blue tits, larks, bramblings. Birds that ordinarily kept to their own flocks. Now dead and still in a shambles of feathers and broken glass. Outside it was cold, bitter cold. And the earth had all the hard black look of frost. Not white frost to shine in the morning sun, but black frost that the east, the east wind brings. And across the field, the sea, fiercer now with the burning tide, it broke and crashed in the bay. Of the birds, there was not a sign, not so much as a sparrow, 
Nothing but the east wind and the sea. Do you want the wireless left on? Please, Mother. Oh, easy, Meg. That stuff stings. I suppose to. Don't want these scratches to infect. No, I suppose not. I'd say you ought to thank the Almighty they didn't get in your eyes. That's what I'd say. Yes, Mother. Nasty little creatures. One would hardly believe they belong to the same species as little chippy chick chippikins here. Mmm, you're a proper little gentleman, aren't you, Master Chippikins? Not a bit like those horrid little savages, hmm? That's odd. What? He won't speak to me. Speak? Speak? Chip, chip, chee. Did Joe get off to school all right? Yes. I hope I brought the right clothing down. I didn't want her to see the room. Didn't want her frightened. <laughs> she thought it quite a joke. Imagine she's telling the class all about it right now. I suppose. Come, come, little chippikins. Speak. Speak. Good morning, Mr. Wade. Good morning, Mr. Bell. An ounce of tobacco, please, my usual. Your usual? Yes, sir. And what do you think of the weather? Wireless says it's going on all over. Uh, something to do with the Arctic Circle. Oh, really? Black winter, that's what it is, out of the east. I heard the wind come up in the night. Um, do you have any birds? Birds? What birds? We had them at our place last night. Scores of them came into the bedroom. Quite savage they were. Here, look, look at my hand. Well, well. My goodness, I never heard of birds acting savage, not our birds. I assure you, these scratches are real. Oh, maybe they were some of those foreign birds from the Arctic Circle. Tell you what, put out some crumbs for them. That's what I'd do, put out some crumbs. Bring the paper, John. Yes. No mention of birds. I've been watching the field. So have I. I haven't seen a single one. I know. Strange. Yes. Do you tell anyone? Yes. What'd they say? Put out crumbs. I'll get a sack and clean up the bedroom. Their bodies filled the sack. The ground had frozen during the night. It was too hard to dig. I went down the cliff path to the beach. The sky was leaden. The sea was flat, calm, oily. Not a sound of birds. I kicked a hole in the sand. And as I did this, I saw them. The gulls. Out there. Riding the sea. What I had thought at first to be sea scud, wind froth, were gulls. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. They rose and fell in the trough of the sea, silent, like a mighty fleet at anchor. To the eastward and to the west, the gulls were there. They stretched as far as the eye could reach in close formation, packed line on line. Somebody ought to know of this. Something should be said. But what? Could I call the police? Hello, constable? I want to report some birds. Oh, no, they think me mad. They think me drunk. Take my report with great politeness and thank me. But they were out there, waiting... Waiting. For what? John, come quick, 
quickly. It's on the wireless. What? About the birds. The Home Office at 11 a.m. today. Reports from all over the country are coming in hourly about the vast quantity of birds flocking above towns, villages, and outlying districts, causing obstruction and damage and even attacking individuals. It is thought that the Arctic air stream at present covering the British Isles is causing birds to migrate south in immense numbers, and that intense hunger may drive these birds to attack human beings. Householders are warned to see to their windows, doors, and chimneys, and to take reasonable precautions for the safety of their children. A further statement will be issued later. There, you see. Wait till Mr. Bell hears that. And just now, down on the beach, I saw a million gulls riding on the sea, waiting. Waiting? Waiting for what, Doc? I, I don't know. Well, the bulletin said the birds are hungry. In the shed were all sorts of boards and sheathings left over from the blackout days of the war. And I spent the next few hours putting these up. There was no thought of my novel this day. Actually, the the writer is a lazy creature and welcomes any diversion from his work. Somehow this seemed to be something a little bigger than diversion. Do you think that's really necessary, John? I don't like to take chances. But they were such little birds. I'm not thinking of those. Oh? The gulls. I see. Are you going to do the downstairs, too? I think I'd better. It'll be dark with the windows all boarded up. At each window, the process was the same. I nailed the boards to the sills from within the rooms. And by the time I reached the kitchen, Meg and Mrs. Dobbs were listening to the and wireless the again. The sky was so dense at one o'clock this afternoon that it seemed as if the city was covered by a vast black cloud. The birds settled on rooftops, on window ledges, and on chimneys. The sight has been so unusual that traffic came to a standstill in many thoroughfares. Work was abandoned in shops and offices, and the streets were, and still are, crowded with people standing about to watch the birds. We take you now to our roving microphone in Piccadilly Circus. I've been standing here for hours. We cannot begin to describe the enormous variety of birds which are circling overhead. I have never seen anything like it. Uh, standing beside me is a gentleman... Uh, what is your name, sir? Jenkins, Peter Jenkins. Uh, what do you think of the birds, Mr. Jenkins? Oh, never saw nothing like it. I swear I never did. Well, uh, just before we went on the air, you were telling these people and myself about your cat. I wonder if you would mind repeating that for our air uh, audience. Oh, lummy, they, they wouldn't want to hear none of that. Oh, I, I'm sure they would. Well, I, I've got these three mouses, you see. Big bully and alley cats they are, hard as nails. And out where I live, the birds keep a wide berth around my cottage. Well, this morning I looked out of the window and saw uh, what we all saw. And I says to my cats, I says, All right, men, Arthur, Freddy, and you, Leon, at and at em. You see, uh, one of their jobs, my cat's job, that is, one of their jobs is to keep the birds scared out of the vegetable patch. So I opened the door and they started out. Then they saw all them birds. And they just turned around with their back hair all up and their tails looking like porcupines. They turned and run into the bedroom and under the bed and wouldn't come out for love or money or the dish of cold water I throwed at them. Um, thank you, Mr. Peter Jiggins. And uh, now we have a lady here at our microphone. Uh, uh, what is your name, miss? <laughs> uh, come, come out. There's nothing to be nervous about. <laughs> What, what are you doing? Well, I thought I'd see if the American stations have heard about it. Uh, it seems that we're having a little trouble with our mobile unit. A number of birds have settled on the antenna. Uh, well, can't you chase them off or something? We've got to complete this broadcast. Well, try throwing something at them. I don't know. Stones, anything. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we regret this unfortunate circumstance. I, I'm sure we'll have the situation straightened out in a moment. Do you please bear with us on this most unusual of all days? And now we return you to our main studio for a brief program of recorded music. There. That ought to hold it. 
if you want my opinion, it's all nonsense. That's what it is. Oh, Mother. Boarding this place up so we have to light the lamp, and it's only three in the afternoon. Tell me, how much singing has Chippikins done today? Not a note. He's off his feet, that's what. Look at him. He's so nervous and agitated. What with all your banging? See? I saw. The bird seemed possessed. He flew from one corner to the other, his shiny black eyes flicking from one of us to another, yellow wings quivering. John, look out there. Where? The ocean. Hmm? Oh, you mean that cloud, that big black cloud? It's not a cloud, John. It was the gulls. A black mass of them that towered a mile high. They circled thousands upon thousands, lifting their wings against the wind. And they were silent. They made not a sound. They just went on soaring and circling, rising and falling, trying their strength against the cold east wind. John, where are you going? I'm going for Jill. I'll wait for her at the school bus stop. You keep the door closed. I'm frightened. Keep it closed until you hear me call. You look so funny. What is it? Please, Jill, do hurry. What's that strange cloud? That's it, I tell you what. Let's race the rest of the way. Oh, Father, you know I can beat you. Oh, come on, then. Get your shilling. Wait a minute. Look at the cloud, Father. Hurry, Jill, in the name of heaven. Why, it's birds. Look, Father, birds. And it's coming this way. Run. They won't hurt us, will they? I'm scared. Meg! Meg! Open the door! Hurry! Yes! Quick, Jill! Can you go? I'm holding the door for you, Father. Look out! Oh, wait! I'm almost there. The birds! Wait! John, there's a gang! It's Linklater Times 2, Tuesdays on CBS Radio. That's right. Tuesdays in the daytime, you enjoy a lively arc Linklater on House Party at its regular time. Then Tuesday nights on most of these same stations, Art is back again on People Are Funny. House Party in the daytime, People Are Funny in the evening. It's Linklater Times 2, Tuesdays on CBS Radio. Tomorrow, your share of fun is waiting for you on both of these laugh-packed shows. And now, Act Two of The Bird, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall as John Waite. My wounds were fortunately not deep. Had the gannet struck, I would surely have been killed on my own doorstep. The other birds, black gulls, white gulls, and so forth, had pecked and torn, but they were as yet still inexperienced at attacking human beings, and so had done no very serious damage. My preparations had been most fortunate. Throughout the afternoon, the birds assailed the house without luck, and we sat in the kitchen and listened... We listened, and we watched Chippikins. 
The madness which had seized the other birds now was his, too. He glared at us with malevolent hatred in his tiny eyes. Thrust his short, pointed beak at us through the golden bars of his cage. Threw himself again and again at the little gate, hoping to break it down. Oh, I'm afraid for him. He'll hurt himself. Good. Poor little man, he can't help himself. He must have caught something from all those awful birds outside. Turn on the wireless. Let's have the wireless. I'll do it. Father. What? The school bus. Do you suppose it... Do you suppose the kids are all right? Oh. Yes, I wouldn't worry about it. I hope so, Chippy King. Do leave off that, darling. You'll hurt your little self. Yes, baby. The Mars here. Oh! Father, what happened? He bit me. Here, look at my finger. <laughs> Oh, dear. I'll get the iodine. And you can leave off that, John Waite. As you said, Mother Dobbs, he can't help himself. I'm going upstairs and check things. Upstairs, it seemed worse. What worried me most were the bedroom fireplaces. They were quite close to the roof, and I could hear many birds which had made their way down the chimneys. Now, with only a thin plywood thickness between them and the interior of the house, they screamed and scratched at the wood. I reinforced whatever I could, particularly on the windows. For wood, I tore the bottoms from the bureau drawers, knocked the panels out of several closet doors, tore down shelves wherever I could find them. And then, deciding it would be too dangerous to hazard a night upstairs in separate rooms, I started carrying down armfuls of bedding to the kitchen. John, what on earth are you doing? I thought just for fun we'd sleep down here. Oh, you're carrying this game too far. How's your finger? Oh, be still. Here, Jill, help your mother. Right, old father. And Meg, uh, what for supper, huh? I very like the cheese sandwiches. I had intended going to the market this afternoon. Oh? I'll go in the morning. Yes, yes, of course. finished moving things, I locked both bedroom doors. If they should break through the bedroom windows or fireplaces during the night, the doors would hold them for a while. And perhaps in their mad jamming of the rooms, they would smother. Perhaps they would die. At the landing, I piled as much furniture as I could. Made a solid wall of bureaus, tables, chests, mattresses, and so forth. Now, should they break through the doors, they would have this third barrier to assail. But by that time, it would be over, surely. I regarded my handiwork with some pride and wondered. Outside, I could hear the birds beating against the house. Wings brushing the surface, sliding, scraping, seeking a way of entry. The sound of many bodies pressed together, shuffling on the sills. Now and again a thud, a crash, and some birds dived and fell. Many would kill themselves that way. But not enough. Never enough. John. Yes, Meg. There should be another report in a moment. The man said so. Good. Yeah, eat your cheese sandwich. It's good. Mm, oh, thank you. This is London calling. A national emergency was proclaimed at four o'clock this afternoon. Measures are being taken to safeguard the lives and property of the population, but it must be understood that these are not easy to effect immediately owing to the unforeseen and unparalleled nature of the present crisis. Unparalleled? Get him. Every householder must take precautions to his own building. And where several people live together, as in flats and apartments, they must unite to do the utmost they can to prevent entry. 
It is absolutely imperative that every individual stay indoors tonight and that no one at all remain on the streets or roads or anywhere without doors. The birds, in vast numbers, are attacking anyone on sight and have already begun an assault upon buildings. But these, with due care, should be impenetrable. The population is asked to remain calm and not to panic. Owing to the exceptional nature of the emergency, there will be no further transmission from any broadcasting station until 7 a.m. tomorrow. A gramophone? Father, could I have a gramophone for my birthday? Yes, sweetheart, a gramophone. You shall have the best that money can buy. Mother, did you hear that? Yes, Angel, I heard. Now, suppose we all go to bed. Hmm? It's been a long day. Wait. Shh. What is it? It's planes. The RAF. Good old RAS. I wonder what they intend doing. What was that, I wonder? Oh. Probably a bomb of some sort. I wouldn't worry about it. Mm. Well, I must say, I feel better now. Mother Dobbs, mind you say goodnight to Chippikins. I'm not speaking to him, the ungrateful little wretch. That booming, I knew the sound. The sound of an exploding plane. And I remember tales of flyers who had blundered into flocks of geese and ducks. Bodies that splintered propellers and smashed windshields. And what could pilots do against birds? Suicidal birds. But at least it showed that somewhere in the country they were trying. Somewhere in some small back room at this very moment they were thinking, working. And they would succeed. They had to. Had to. Had to. John. John, wake up. What? What is it? John, they're gone. Listen. What's the time? Ten o'clock. Ten? That means the tide has turned. It's on the ebb. I wonder, Meg, do you suppose it could be that they only attacked with the flood tide? I don't know, dear. What are you going to do? Where's the flashlight? On the mantel. I'm going outside. Huh? Uh, uh, what, what's happening? The birds, they're gone, Mother. Not gone, you say? Yes, John's going to have a look about. Oh, don't you do it. And why not? They're all out there waiting. Oh, mother. Waiting all around the door silently for you to open it. John, do you suppose that... Well, there's one way to find out. a scene of such violent death as few men have witnessed. All about me, wherever I threw the torch, lay their bodies, drifted as snow drifts, as sand drifts, their eyes bright in death, twinkling in unwinking points of fire. It was silent, so silent, yet I had the feeling that out there, somewhere, there was life. There was a shovel near the door, and I put it to use. First, I cleared a path from the door to the side of the house, and there I flashed my torch up. Every pane of glass had been smashed. The jagged edges flashed back my light. Many had birds impaled on them. Beyond, I saw the boards. They looked roughened and strange. There were flecks and streaks of blood on the boards, 
and a fine crisscross of splinters where the thousands upon thousands of bills had driven again and again into the wood. I shoveled the birds up against the windows and jammed them with my hands into the broken panes. Piled them on the sills and the cracks. A futile gesture. With the flood tide, another wave of assaulters would come and drive through these. But it would take time. And we needed time. John, what are we going to do now? I ought to go over to the farmers. They've got food there and wood. I need more wood. Well, you're not to go. I won't let you go. I'll not be left here alone, John. All right, Meg. I'll wait until morning, until the next ebb tide. Sorry. I understand, dear. John, what's that? Where? On the hill. See? Fire. It was just next to the spot where I'd spoken to the farmer as he drove his tractor. How long ago? Two days? Two months? On the same little hillside. One of the planes, Meg. Come on, let's, uh, let's go back to bed. The second attack was much worse. There was something different about it, something I found difficult to analyze. And while I was thinking about it, I watched the canary. He too had been quiet during the row, but now he stormed and raged again, beat at the bars of his cage. And I thought of the birds in cages all over the world. Parrots, lovebirds. Peacocks, yes, and ostriches. What of the ostriches? And the great red flamingos and the big swans in the parks with their powerful wings and beaks. Father, what's that noise? Noise? From the chimney. I don't know. Let's see. Hmm? Sounds like... Sounds like they're trying to get at us through this chimney. We've got the fire. Get too low. John, do something. Here, give me that can of paraffin oil. Now then, everybody stand back. Careful. Back. This will tear them out. That's got it. Jill, you keep the fire up. Don't spare the wood. All right, Father. I'll start the promise. We'll have some cocoa. Good idea. Shall I check and see what's happening upstairs? No, Jill. You watch the fire. Keep it blazing. Poor Chippikins. Now what? He's hurt his wing against the bars. Has he really? Silly little man. Mama warned you. At the head of the stairs, I pushed the barricade aside and listened at the bedroom doors. They'd broken in, and I could hear them screaming and scratching at the thin doors. And with the scratching, I became conscious of a new sound. It sounded like talons. Could the hawks have taken over what the gulls had failed to do? The hawks. The birds of prey. Buzzards. Kestrels, falcons. I'd forgotten the birds of prey. And as I listened, I could hear the soft patter of thousands of feet across the floors of the bedroom and the sounds of talons, of splintering wood. I rebuilt the barricade, descended into the kitchen. The others had not yet noticed that soft patter just above our heads. I prayed that they would not. Outside, the birds continued to dash against the ground, against the walls. Those were the herring gulls, the suicide boys, kamikaze fighters. They had no brains. The blackbacks were something different. They knew what they were doing. So did the buzzards, the hawks. I thought of the things to do in the morning. There were so many things we needed to withstand siege. A car. If I could hire a car between the tides and use it to carry things. Food. Oil for the stove. Lumber and nails. Sheets of metal for the windows. Oh, so many things. I wondered. And worried. And dozed.
John, it's seven. Don't you want to hear what the wireless has to say? Yes. It's 20 after. I can't understand it. Don't touch the knob. Leave it on the home station. I thought if I just jiggled it a bit. No, no, they've made a mistake. They meant they'd go on at eight, not seven. Oh, well, that must be it. It's ten after eight, John. Maybe it's broken. No, I've checked that. It's working all right. Birds are letting up. I thought I heard something. No, 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 nothing yet. Oh, nine o'clock's past. There's nothing on the wireless. Nothing. I know. What does it mean, John? Don't you see? Not even the short wave. Not even the cold things. No. Birds are gone. Look at Chippikins sleeping. Sure is someone, somewhere in the world, some one of the countless transmitters. Shall we open the door? Yes, there's a lot to do before the next flood tide. This is America's 10th Farm Safety Week, proclaimed by the President, supported by all agricultural organizations. The occasion is far more than academic interest to non-farms, too. Every farm accident that cuts production affects supply and prices. This week, on the farm and off, in all farm-connected industries, check your equipment and habits for safety first. One billion dollars a year is lost from farm accidents. Eliminate falls, fires, and equipment failure accidents. Live to farm as you farm to live. We now pause for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. And now we return to the summer theater as the curtain rises on Act Three of The Bird, starring Mr. Herbert Marshall as John Waite. A single brief glimpse through the open door was enough. I slammed it and paused to consider this new dilemma. The birds were out there, silent and watchful, waiting. Not a single one flew. They stood across the yard and in the fields, perched on the fence and on bushes and in the trees, all silent, watchful, and waiting. What are we going to do? I don't know. They didn't move. Just like chippikins, every one of them. Yes. Here, chippikins. Here's my finger, see? Go on, take a bite. He won't move. Is he asleep? No. No, he seems drugged. Or exhausted. What are you doing? Look at them. They're just sitting there. Here, give me that book. There. It's like they're all hypnotized. I'm going to the farm. Then you'd better take me. Me too, Father, please. All right. I guess we'd better all go. There'll be things to carry. Bundle up warm now. It's better cold out there. We 
went by way of the field. I didn't want to risk the road. It was a strange gray day, funereal, and the birds all about us, black and silent and waiting. These were the land birds. Out on the bay, I saw the endless gray carpet of seabirds riding the soft swells of the ebb tide and waiting. Well, there it is. Oh, they did have a time of it. Yes. John, hadn't you better go in alone? Yes. Yes, I think you three had better wait here. I want to go with you. No. I want you to stay and take care of your mother. Look, John, the cows are unharmed. And the sheep. I guess it wasn't them the birds were after. The poor thing, she wants milking. Good idea. There are some buckets over there in the shed, Joe. You and Mother Dobbs milk some of the cows. And I'll come with you, John. You sure you want to? Yes. All right. Here in the yard, the birds sat motionless, watching. And on the roof of the house, and in the trees, and on the sills of the broken windows. Sprawled near the back door, I found the farmer's body. Inside, the place was a shambles. But the lard in the storeroom was intact, and we took sacks of flour and a tub of butter, and sugar and tinned meats. Supplies for, for a siege. Upstairs, sprawled by the telephone, was the farmer's wife. I, I want to try the wireless. Oh, it's no use. Here, carry these things out of the car. We have much time, you know. We're taking their car? Yes. Is it right? Call it a neighborly loan, if you like. We'll need more oil for the stove. Yes, I'll get it. Come on, Meg, we have work to do. The farmer had been planning to build a new silo, and stacked in the barn were large sheets of galvanized iron. I found snips, too, and a keg of nails. I was racing against time. The second trip I made alone. This time I was in search of lumber, hardwood. I tore up the flooring in the hall of the farmhouse. There was a bale of barbed wire. I tied it to the back of the car. And with a final, futile gesture, I went upstairs to the telephone. One last look round. It was growing late. And the final gesture. Man lives not by bread alone. I took their gramophone. As I came down the little lane to our door, I glanced out to sea, and my heart stood still. I couldn't believe my eyes. There were ships there. Great battleships, three of them. The Royal Navy. Throughout the proud history of this isle. In time of crisis. No, I was wrong. The Navy was not there. The gulls were rising from the sea. The tide was turning. Help me quickly. It's time. All right. Come on, dear. Mother. Quickly. We'll have to leave the rest. Yes, hurry. In the house. The gramophone. No, not now. It'll only take a minute. Help her. Oh, here, then. You take the records. Come on. They're coming. What? That 
sound upstairs. They're in. Oh. I'm going to build a barricade at the foot of the stairs. Can you do it in time? I've got to. And, and at the door, the sound is different there somehow. Don't worry about it. All right, dear. Mr. Chippikins, you're an evil little man. Father. What? These are all Harry Lauder. Really? Every single one. Well, now, dear, it may seem a little old-fashioned to you, but your father and I used to find him quite entertaining. And we were caught in. Did you really? There was a soft scratching at the windows. This didn't bother me. Those were the small birds. But at the door were the hawks. There I would put up sheets of metal, but that meant nails, and the nails were in the car. Still, I had the snips. Oh, there were so many things to do. Fortifications to erect. A plan of defense to follow. I have done all I can until the next ebb tide. The barbed wire stands in the hall. I intend to nail it across the outside of the windows. I don't think they will be able to get through that. And the galvanized metal is cut to, to size. And when I get the nails, I will put it up. I am becoming distressed about the main door. The falcons, the hawks, the birds of prey continue to dig at it. But if we can but survive this phase of the attack, we may make out. We have food and fuel for a week. But with each new attack, they grow more intelligent. Their numbers are increasing steadily. When will it end? How will it end? And as I sit here staring at the pages that I have written, I cannot help wondering why. Why the Almighty has decreed that this is to be the end. Is this the entire manuscript, Jenkins? Yes, sir. That's all there is. Well, you're our editor. What do you make of it? I'm not quite sure, sir. I wish I could talk with the author about it, but as I told you, the story was submitted with no address. I, I haven't been able to find a trace of John Waite. Undoubtedly, he's one of those curious, shabby fellows who live in squalor and great prophetic visions. You know the sort. That's it, sir. What? Prophetic that's what the story is. Almost a warning. Oh? In what way, Jenkins? Well, sir, I think it has to do with nature and her system of checks and balances. You see, what he's saying is that a man, with his ever-recurring wars, his new weapons of destruction, threatens to destroy not only himself, but all forms of life. And nature might find a way to prevent this. By wiping out man, you mean? Getting rid of him? Yes, sir. Nature, or the Almighty, call it what you will, just isn't going to allow all life to come to an end. And so, through the birds, it will quite simply take care of the situation. Hmm. Yes, Jenkins. Perhaps that's it. Perhaps. Who knows? <laughs> Now, once again, here is our star, Mr. Herbert Marshall. You know, Don, 
It was a pleasure doing a story as odd as the bird, even though I do think you billed me incorrectly. Mm, what do you mean, Bart? Well, after all, I was scarce of the star of the piece when you considered the gulls and the gannets. Villains that they were, they ran the whole show. Well, I suppose you're right, Bart, but after all, we uh, couldn't bill a bird. Bill a bird, indeed. <laughs> oh, you made me say it, Bart, but seriously, you still like birds, don't you? Oh, of course I do. But now I understand something I never did before. Hmm? What's that? You remember during the war we had airplane spotters, men and women, too, who spent hours scanning the skies on watch for the enemy? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, tonight I think I've at last discovered what bird watchers are for. <laughs> well, I give up. But anyway, thank you, Herbert Marshall, for being with us tonight. It was a great pleasure. Good night, everybody. Tonight, you've heard Daphne du Maurier's terrifying tale, The Birds, especially adapted for the summer theater by James Pohl and starring Mr. Herbert Marshall. Featured in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson as Meg, Gloria Gordon as Dobbs, Betty Harford as Jill, Herb Butterfield as the publisher, William Johnstone as the editor, Tudor Owen as the shopkeeper, Ben Wright and Alistair Duncan as BBC announcers. Our producer-director is Fred McCarr. Herbert Marshall may shortly be seen in Riders to the Stars, a United Artists release. And now, this is your host, Don Wilson, reminding you to be with us again next week at the same time when the Summer Theater will present One Foot in Heaven by Hartzell Spence, and our star will be Mr. Dana Andrews. This is the CBS Radio Network. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall, your landlord in this mansion of terror. And often there's no terror quite like those nameless terrors, those undercurrents we can't put our finger on. We know something's not quite right, but we don't know why. It nags at those dark corners of our mind. And such is the story we have for you now. All seems to be sweetness and light. But watch out for those dark corners. Those things left unsaid. Jane and Mike Slater are young city dwellers spending their vacation in a quiet village called Granville. They thought it was the perfect spot to get away from it all. That's what they thought until they got there and tried to get away from it. Mike, we should have turned left back there. No, 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 no. We're on the main road out of the village. No, we're not. Look up there. There's another dead end. Well, this doesn't add up, Jane. We've been driving for a half hour trying to get out of this town. Every road is either a dead end or it takes us right back into the middle of the village. But we came in on the main road. Where is it? Why can't we find it? I think they don't want us to find it, Jane. We're trapped trapped in this town, and I don't know why. Our mystery drama, The Summer People, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Jura and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Two weeks 
in another town, a summer place. They all add up to a change of scene, something everyone enjoys. And for Jane and Mike Slater, a summer in the country was not only desired, but almost necessary. Jane is a serious painter, and Mike's a young reporter with a novel burning in his brain. A couple ripe for spending their vacation away from it all and working on their respective art. So it was no wonder that when Mike picked up the paper one evening, he enthused... Hey, Jane, listen to this. Mm, what? I think it's just what we've been looking for. For our vacation, I mean. Private rooms with bath in lovely private home. Quiet village on beautiful river. Complete peace and quiet. All meals, $50 a week per person. $50 a week? What's the date on that paper, 1910? It says 50, unless it's a misprint. Restricted to persons 23 years or younger. Well, at least we qualify there. Interested parties may phone for interview. 814 on the number. Interview? Oh, sounds too snobbish. It sounds intriguing to me. Doesn't the ad say where it is? No. Nope. Nothing more. It's a perfect place to spend the summer and start the draft on my book. It's okay with me if you want it. But phoning for an interview, isn't that strange? Well, whoever put the ad in had his reasons. We won't know unless we call. Coming. Mr. Slater? Yes. You're Mrs. Williams. That's right. Oh, we've been expecting you. Oh, but our chat on the phone, you sounded like the right kind of people. Come in. Thank you. Oh, what a cozy place. Jane? Mrs. Williams. Uh, that Dutch clock must be an heirloom. It's my great-grandmother's. Mrs. Williams, hello. Mrs. Slater? Uh, sit down, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, you may think this a bit unusual that we request an interview. Yeah, frankly, yes. Well, you see, Mr. Slater, we in Granville are... Well, we do invite the summer people into our homes. There are no hotels, and we want to be careful. I mean, we want to be sure our... Summer people will fit in. Your ad said only people under 23 years old. I think that's curious. Well, so you should. But we're a young town, Mrs. Slater. Oh, uh, Granville's been a village for 230 years, but the people are young. We stay young. And we want our summer visitors to be the same way. Uh, uh, how old would you say I was, Mr. Slater? Oh, no, no, no. Don't, don't put me on the spot. Uh, well, do you want to guess, Mrs. Slater? Well, since you asked, uh, 40, 42? Oh, I'm 79. 79? Oh, you can't. Be. Well, that's the way it is in Granville. We found the secret for keeping young. And we want our summer people to enjoy us just as much as we'll enjoy them. <laughs> it all sounds great to me. We're quite self supporting, but we do depend on the summer people. That's why we're willing to take the trouble to meet our prospective visitors personally. Um, you're both in good health? Oh, yes. Uh, no recent illnesses or operations? Would you like a blood sample? Oh, come on, Jane. This is ridiculous, Mike. Slater, I understand your reaction. Many people feel the same way, but if you're willing to cooperate with us, just these few questions, you won't regret it. Just where is Granville, Mrs. Williams? Oh, I'll give you the directions when we decide on your visit. Uh, what do you do, Mr. Slater? Well, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm a uh, news writer for the Post. Jane goes to art school, working on her master's. Oh, you're both artists. Oh, well, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> uh, the reason I was interested in your ad is uh, I want to spend the summer blocking a book, and Jane wants to paint. It sounded like just the place. Oh, I'm sure it will be. I can tell from meeting you both. So attractive, healthy, young. You fit in with Granville just perfectly. If we choose to come. Oh, but why wouldn't you? You haven't told us enough about the town or your home. You've been concerned in making sure we'd fit in. Well, maybe we couldn't from our point of view. Oh, well, you, you do have a point, Mrs. Slater. Uh, but I'm afraid there's not much more to tell... Granville is a pleasant little village on the banks of the Sakoni River upstate. I can offer you my second floor suite 
and the friendship and attention of all the residents of Brentville. We'll think it over. Uh, I'll call you in a day or two, but I'm pretty certain we'll be there. Uh, very well, Mr. Slater, Mrs. Slater. It's been a pleasure meeting you, and I do hope you'll decide to come to Granville. You're just the kind of people we want. Thank you. Forgive my reservations, Mrs. Williams. We'll let you know. I'll be waiting. Good night. Good night. What's the big deal, Jane? It sounds perfect. I don't know, Mike. It's something strange. The thing she didn't or wouldn't say. Yeah, well, that's all the more interesting. I'm dying to see the place. <laughs> and we're okay on our list. Yes. She seemed eager to have us. I'm not against it, Mike. Let's sleep on it. I'll probably feel different in the morning. You in there, Martha? Come on in there. How's Elizabeth? Oh, she's okay. Uh, Dr. Teal said it was indigestion. Hmm. The way she was carrying on, I thought it was a heart attack. <laughs> now, how'd you make out with the uh, summer people in the city? The uh, Slaters? They're perfect. Two of the best I'll ever have. I hope they decide to come. Oh, they're uh, not firmed up yet? Uh, the wife was a little leery of my questions. They didn't mm. call me. Well, what about the basketball player? Oh, he's upset. He didn't seem to mind at all all the questions and restrictions. Said he couldn't wait to soak the basketball season out of his bones in peace and quiet. I sure hope the Slaters come. I hate to start looking again. I think they will. I impressed them with the age thing. Mm. What'd they say? <laughs> like everyone else, they guessed around 40 and were amazed when I said 79. <laughs> Imagine what the summer people would say if they knew how old we really are. I wouldn't believe it, so, um, why tell them? It can't be much further. We passed the lily pond two miles ago. Oh, she said two miles past the lily pond, look for wooden sign on right and take road to the left. Well... It's been two miles, unless my odometer's wrong. There. There it is, up ahead. Oh, yeah. The arrow sign. Granville, four miles. But where's the road? Well, it's supposed to be on the left. Well, the sign points left, all right. Granville, four miles, but there's no road. Unless they mean those two ruts through the field over there. This is crazy. But I guess we'll have to see where they go. Okay, but talk about beating off a beaten track. <laughs> We're getting just what we bargained for. Oh, it looks as though it gets better up ahead. Yeah, yeah, there's at least some paving up there. You know, if it weren't for that sign back on the highway, you could go right past this place and never even know it was here. Well, this looks more like it. There is a town back in here. Welcome to Granville, population 210. <laughs> How can they be so accurate? After meeting Mrs. Williams, I can believe anything. Why, Mike, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's clean, all right. Nice-looking houses, too. It's almost unreal. It's so perfect. Uh, where do we head next? Oh, uh, continue along Thimble Street, that's what we're on, to the greenhouse on Maple Avenue. Well, I can't be too far. Hey, look at that, Jane. That little church. There's something to paint. My first subject. I wonder where the river is. Well, we've got plenty of time to find it. Oh, Mike, this really is paradise. We made the right decision coming here. I think so, too. I, I can't wait to... What's the matter? Well, where do we go from here? I mean, we're at the end of Thimble Street, and so far there's been no Maple Avenue and no greenhouse. We must have passed it. We were talking too much. I've been watching every street. We didn't come to Maple Avenue. Oh, we'll have to ask. I'll go in that little store. Uh, ask the fellow coming out. Uh, excuse me, sir. Oh, uh, hello there. Uh, could you tell me how to get to Mrs. Williams? Oh, sure. You're the uh, summer people. She's expecting you. 
Now, the direction said uh, straight on Thimble to Maple Avenue. Oh, you passed Maple one block back. Go back, left on Maple, by the green house. Then about a quarter of a mile, you'll find Mrs. Williams on the right. Big yellow house with a green porch. Oh, thanks so much. I can't see how we missed Maple Avenue, though. My name's Ned Broker. Glad to have you with us. I'm uh, Mike Slater. It's my wife, Jane. Mm. See you later. Thanks for the direction. What a pleasant man. That proves Mrs. Williams' point, I guess. Granville stays young. Well, it's nice to know we're not staying with a bunch of old fogies. Hey, they seem to be anything but that. Uh, Mrs. Williams and that guy back there, at least. Oh, there's the greenhouse. Maple Avenue. I don't see how we passed it before. Well, go left like the man said. A quarter of a mile and we'll be at Mrs. Williams'. I've been waiting for you. Here we are. Well, I wasn't sure when you'd arrive. No, we only made one bad turn. Not bad for newcomers. Mr. Broker in the village told us how to get here. Oh. Well, uh, come on in and get settled. Your rooms are all ready, and I've got a pot of hot coffee and homemade apple pie all waiting. Like I said, this is paradise. Your rooms are on the second floor. I'm expecting another guest toward the end of the week. He'll have the third. Your place is just charming, Mrs. Williams. That's yeah, exactly what we wanted. Well, I'm sure you'll enjoy it here. The whole town seems so fresh and clean. The people look so well. We're very careful about how we live here. We grow all our own vegetables. Meats imported. Oh, you love our food. Oh, there you are. Two rooms with connecting baths. It's lovely. Oh, this is great. Well, you get settled in and then come down to the kitchen. I want to introduce you to some real Granville cooking. You in there, Martha? Come on in, Ned. Yeah, your, uh, your folks settled in? Hmm, just about. Yeah, you were right about them. They seem like the right type to me. Mm -hmm. I know how to fix them. But when's the next one arriving? At the end of the week. I told the Slaters I'd drop around and see them set. Oh, oh, stay for pie and coffee there. They'll be down in a couple of minutes. I'll show them around town tomorrow. Are the girls a painter? Uh, that's what they said. Yeah, she'll be looking for subjects. I'll know what to show her. Yes. And what to keep her away from? <laughs> Charming people in Granville. Hospitable, friendly, attentive. But I can't help feeling... Oh, no, no, it's just my overly active imagination. There's nothing wrong, nothing sinister. How could there be with such lovely, youthful, healthy people? And yet... Uh, well, we'll return to Granville when I return with Act Two. I did say we'd return to Granville where Jane and Mike Slater have decided to spend some time in late summer. He to start a book and she to pursue her painting. But, uh, frankly, that town gives me the willies. If you don't mind, I'll just stay here and meet you later. You go on ahead and join Jane and Mike in the kitchen of that friendly Mrs. Williams. You might even get a piece of that apple pie. Another slice, Mr. Slater. Oh, no, thanks, Mrs. Williams. It's delicious, but two is my limit. Oh, now, come on. A young fellow like you ought to be able to put away a whole pie. <laughs> He's being polite. I'll, uh, I'll take another one, Martha. Help yourself. I understand you paint, Mrs. Slater. There's plenty of subject matter here in Granville. Well, that's what I was hoping. I'm dying to look around the village. I'd be glad to show you around. Well, I'll be glued to my typewriter most of the time. I'm glad Jane has a painting to keep her busy. Well, you you want to rest up today. Why don't we start out tomorrow? Fine with me. From what I've seen already, I know we couldn't have found a lovelier place. I've never seen such immaculate farmland. Mmm. We grow everything we eat. Uh, let's walk on down to the riverfront. The view there is something. Oh, what's that low brown building over there? A factory? No. 
No factories in Granville. That's our freezer. We freeze the harvest for the winter months. One of our few concessions to modern gadgets. Oh, you have such an idyllic place here. I'm surprised you want outsiders at all. Oh, living too closed up isn't good either. We like the right kind of summer people visiting us. Gives us perspective. Mrs. Williams is so warm and friendly. You'll find everyone in Granville's that way. So, how is the Grand Tour? Beautiful. It's a beautiful spot. Almost too perfect. Everything's laid out just so. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Well, nothing, really. It's just curious. I don't remember seeing any children. Not a single child. Or well, maybe they're all grown up. Uh, everyone seems to be proud of how old they are here and how well they look. But a whole village without any children? Yeah, that's unusual, yeah. What's the difference? Well, none, I guess. To us, anyway. I'm going to start on Mr. Broker's barn. It's so unique. Mrs. Slater, lunch is ready. Thank you. We'll be right down. Oh, I don't really feel like any lunch. Hey, that breakfast she poured into us would last me a week. Food's fantastic. But we can't hurt her feelings. I know you're going to like it here, Mr. Egan. Oh, I can see that already. Peace and quiet's all I want. Oh, well, you're on the third floor. A nice young couple has the second. Oh. Oh, uh, Mr. Slater, hello. Hello. This is Mr. Egan. Mr. Slater, our new resident. Hi. Hi. Uh, Mr. Egan's a professional basketball player. Right, recovering from the season. And Mr. Slater's a writer. His wife's a painter. We're sort of on a work vacation. Well, you won't see much of me. I'm just going to sleep and eat. Oh, that's what I like to hear. I'm afraid the Slaters aren't used to my big meals. Yeah, the food's great. There's just, uh, there's just so much of it. Well, it's my duty to keep our summer people well fed. Uh-huh. You won't have any trouble with me, Miss Williams. Well, now, come along. We'll, uh, we'll get you settled. I'll uh, see you later, Mr. Slater. Oh, hey, I didn't mean that the way it sounds. <laughs> Call me Mike. Okay, I'm Tim. See you later. Oh. The, uh, basketball player all settled in? Uh, yes. Eh. Yeah. Guess I'd better get out to the main road and take the sign down. We won't be expecting any more for a while. Not for a while. Oh, how's the painting coming along, Jane? Oh, I don't know, Tim. I started out with a bang, but lately I haven't been able to concentrate. Can I look? Sure. Well, that's two weeks of work. Mm-hmm. Looks good to me. Oh, it's all there. The barn and the sky and the field. But it's just there. There's no spark. You know, I've been so lazy lately. I, I can't get up steam. <laughs> I'm the same way and enjoying every minute. <laughs> it must be Mrs. Williams cooking. And this country air. Oh, hi there. I didn't know you were back. You finished for the day? Yeah, I can't work up any enthusiasm. You know, that's my problem. Talk about writer's block. I've been staring at that typewriter for a week. I'm beginning to wonder if we came to the right place after all. We wanted peace and quiet to work, but between the food and the climate, we're growing fat and lazy. Oh, uh, well, it suits me fine, but I'm going to have to take off ten pounds before the new season starts. How did you happen to find this place, Tim? Oh, uh, just an ad in the paper. Yeah, same as we did. Did uh, Mrs. Williams give you a personal interview? Sort of. She came to my apartment, took one look at me, and gave me directions to Granville. Didn't you think it was funny they made such a fuss about meeting us? Well, yeah, I did, but she was so nice, and this Granville sounded so great, I didn't care. I just wanted to get away. You know, I didn't even tell my fiancé where I was going. Well, have you looked around the town, Tim? No, I've done what I said I'd do. Just sit, eat, and sleep. Hey, Jane, there's no need to bring that up. What's that? Well, Jane thinks that uh, there's something unusual here. Tim, um, there's not a single pet in town. Everyone in Granville is a youthful senior citizen. Oh, well, there's nothing odd about that. I was in Florida one time, and there were these old this people. This isn't an old people's retirement community. It's a plastic village. Everyone's very charming and gracious, like mannequins. 
Well, I still don't see anything wrong in that. Well, it just bothers me. Why are they so anxious to have us come for the summer? They say they need their summer folk. For what? Well, the money. I mean, they don't have any industry here. They just, uh, they just need cash for some things. The money? Fifty dollars a week for the two of us? What are you paying, Tim? Twenty-five. It's not the money. But this lethargy. We all have it. I think they're draining our strength in some way. Oh, come on. Don't make such a big deal out of... In some way. Oh, come on. Don't make such a big deal out of nothing. <laughs> I'll see you two at supper, okay? How about some homemade ice cream? It's already in the kitchen. Oh, thanks, no. Uh, uh, no thanks, Mrs. Williams. Yeah, I was just going to take a snooze. Maybe later, Miss oh. Williams. Well, whatever you wish. It's there when you want it. She was listening. She heard what we said. Oh, I doubt it, Jane. Look, if she thought we suspected her of something, she would have said so. Not necessarily. Not if there was a good reason for us not to know. What's up, Martha? I don't think the Slaters will be staying the whole summer. Mrs. Slater's particularly nervous. Hmm. What you going to do? I've advertised the rooms, Mr. Egan's too. Oh, he was due to leave the end of the month anyway. Well, okay, if uh, if you're sure you can get replacements. Three summer people aren't enough. I know, but I won't have trouble filling the room. Hello there. Hi, Mr. Egan. Out for stroll? Well, I just like to watch other people work. Getting ready for the barbecue tomorrow? Yeah. Real great time, our July barbecue. It's a lot of work, but we think it's worth it. Well, I'm glad I'm going to be around for it. Say, Mr. Egan, I wonder if you could help me later on? Sure. A couple of chores that could use your muscle power. Oh, any time. Tell me where and when. Well, I'll come by for you at Mrs. Williams'. This evening. Well, don't make it too late, though. I've been hitting the sack earlier and earlier. I never slept so good in my life. <laughs> oh, we'll all be bedding down early tonight. With the barbecue and dance, nobody will be going to bed tomorrow night. More corn, Mrs. Slater? Oh, yes, maybe just one more. Another round of steaks are on the grill, too. What a shame Tim had to miss her. Yes, too bad. I'm so surprised he didn't say anything to us before he left. Well, when Mr. Egan got the phone call last night, he said it was an emergency at home. He just grabbed his things and ran. He seemed very upset. I'm so curious because he... Uh, I thought... One second. Martha, want to give me a hand with these? Oh, be right there. Uh, help yourself to salad, Mr. Slater. What were you going to say? I'm wondering who could have called him. I remember him saying he didn't even tell his fiance where he was going. May uh, may I have the honor of a dance, uh, Mrs. Slater? Oh, I, thank you, no. No, please, I couldn't. Go on, Jane. I'm too full. Maybe later. Well, Martha, it looks like us uh, old folks have to show the youngsters how to have fun, huh? <laughs> My arm, Mrs. Williams. Delighted, Mr. Broker. Excuse us. Just one dance and I'll be back for you, Mrs. Slater. Hey, Jane, we might as well pack up and go back to town tomorrow if you're going to act like this. I'm sorry, Mike. I... There's no reason for these suspicions. But do you want to leave? No, no. You have your work to do. Well, I'm not getting anything done. I mean, maybe we'd better pack it in. No. I won't say anything more about it, Mike. I'll get back to my painting tomorrow and try to enjoy the rest of the summer. You ought to be back writing instead of watching me paint. I don't see why you're unhappy with this painting, Jane. No, it's Mr. Broker's barn to a T. I have a new idea for it. This morning I hit on what's wrong. What? Well, all you see is the outside. You don't feel a whole barn in the picture. It's because I've never bothered to look inside. What do you mean? Come on. Mr. Broker won't mind. Even though I'm not going to show the interior, 
if I know in my mind what it looks like, I'll give the whole painting more character. That makes sense. Hmm. It's the first barn I've ever seen with no dust on the windows. Door's not locked. Not surprising. Mrs. Williams never locks her house. I don't think any of them do. Well, well, let's go get that mood you're after. It's clean as a you-know-what. Yes. What's the matter? It's too clean. Whoever saw a barn without any hay or harnesses or just plain junk? Oh, well, there's a loft. Maybe there's some junk up here. Oh, hey, be careful climbing that ladder. It's steady. You see anything? <laughs> Sorry. No plain junk, but... Hey, wait a minute. What is it? I'll be darned. For heaven's sake. Look at this. It's the sign. It's the sign we saw out on the main road. Oh, maybe it's one like it, an old one. No, no, no. It's the same sign. It's the one that pointed to the two ruts through the field. Well, why would Mr. Broker have it in here? And without this sign out there, you could go right past that field. Go right past Granville and never know it was here. Is that what they want? <laughs> Maybe your suspicions weren't so wrong, Jane. Oh, Mike. What does it mean? I want to ask some questions. But don't let on we found this, huh? Come on, let's get out of here fast before Broker gets back. Let's leave this town right away. Yeah, I only hope we can. Tim Egan did. Oh, did he? You were suspicious about that sudden departure. Now I'm beginning to wonder. He departed, but I'd like to know where. How are things in Granville? You'll forgive me for not going along with you, but maybe now you know why. I much prefer to stay here and let you tell me what's going on there. I'm dying to know what happens next to our friends Mike and James later. You'll be able to fill me in after you return to Granville shortly in Act Three. Still feel you want to return to the odd little village? Well, if you insist. And don't say I didn't warn you. Mike and Jane Slater have finally awakened to the fact that Granville isn't all it's cracked up to be. Jane felt it first. And now Mike, having found that Granville can shut itself off from the world with them in it, decides Jane wasn't so wrong after all. The thing that makes me curious, and perhaps you too, is why. Why do these sweet townsfolk of Granville appear to be increasingly sinister? I hope you'll be able to tell me when you get back. That is, if you get back. What kind of danger are we in? I don't know. It's so damn maddening, I don't know. Do you think it's even safe to go back into the house? Oh, we've got to get our things from the car. Well, tell Mrs. Williams that we've got to leave sooner than we thought. Oh, won't she be suspicious after Tim Egan's disappearing? Hey, I'd like to find out if that guy really went home. Oh, forget about him. Let's get ourselves home. There's Ned Broker just leaving Mrs. Williams. He probably knows we've been to his barn. Don't let on about anything. Well, good morning, you two. Rested up from last night? Oh, yes. Yeah, still stuffed, though. Uh, been putting the finishing touches on that painting, Mrs. Slater? Uh, yes, it's finished, as a matter of fact, and uh, it's a present for you. Oh, now, Mrs. Slater. Oh, please, take it. Well, thank you. That's real special. I put it over my mantle. Uh, sorry to run off. Got the chores at home. Well, that's okay. See you around. Bye now. I don't know why I did that. You didn't like it anyway. Listen, the phone. Maybe we can sneak up the stairs while she's on the phone. Hello? Oh? Oh, oh, Slater. Oh, yes. It's for us. No, no, they never arrived. I was expecting them the first of July. That's right. They were dating the second floor for the summer. I called their apartment in the city twice and didn't get an answer. I, I assumed they changed their plans. My, I wish they'd let me know. I could have gotten other tenants. And you haven't heard from them since they left the city? 
Oh, dear. Well, I wish there was something I could tell you. Yes. Yes, perhaps you'd better. All right, goodbye. Mike. He's gone into the kitchen. Mike, this is unbelievable. We are in danger. I don't know what or why. We have to get out of here. Don't let on we heard that conversation. Don't do anything to make them think we're suspicious. We've got to give ourselves time to... Time to make an escape. Why would she say we weren't here? That we'd never arrived? So they can do whatever they intend to do with us. That, that, that call had to be from Stu Hendry. He's the only one I told where we'd be. You must be frantic. Well, I've got to call him. How can you? There's got to be a public phone in the village. Uh, Mr. Slater, Mr. Slater, lunch is ready. I couldn't eat a thing. Try when I slip into town and call Stu. <laughs> Mrs. Williams, uh, could I use your phone? Well, of course. <laughs> I couldn't find a public phone in town. Oh, so that's where you were when I had lunch ready. You didn't have to go all that way. All you had to do was ask. My phone's right here in the parlor. I only want to call my publisher about my book. I'll reverse the charges. All right, just help yourself. I'm going to a friend's for the afternoon. It's our backgammon day. And uh, help yourself to the refrigerator. Mrs. Slater hardly touched a thing for lunch. Henry here. Stu, so, it's Mike. Mike, where the hell are you? In Granville. Listen. What? Why, I just fall there and some dame told me you never arrived. I know. Listen, Stu, we're in danger here. I don't know what it is, but Stu, listen. This is important. Jane and I are leaving here in a couple of minutes. We'll call you as soon as we're out. If you don't hear from us in one hour, I want you to get all the police you can and get up here to Granville. Well, how do I find the place? Take Route 47 north to Minerville, then Route 11 west two miles, and look... Oh, no, 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 no. The sign won't be there. Look. Ah, you look for two ruts across a... Stu, do you hear me? Stu. Stu. No. Jane! Jane! What is it? Is everything packed? Yes, I just finished. Oh, we're leaving now. Mrs. Williams went to a friend's. Hurry. What did Stu say? We were cut off, and it wasn't any accident. Grab those cases. I'll take the trunk and the typewriter. Oh, I'm so glad to get out of here. I'll kiss those hot city sidewalks. This is our only chance. Someone was listening in on my talk with Stu. I just hope we can make it in time. I'll get the door. Wait. Anybody out there? Not a soul. Okay. Let's go. Do you think they're watching us? I don't know. Just keep walking and we'll, we'll load the car. There's nothing they can do to stop us here. They don't seem to have any guns. None that you know of. Uh, help me with the trunk. That's it. Now the case. Okay. Get in. Still not a soul on the street. So much the better. Where are you going? You should have turned right. No, we got to get back to Thimble Street. We came in through Thimble to Maple. It's it's left on Thimble. Oh, I guess that's right. You know, the green house, remember? Yes, there it is. Only, what's that sign say? Well, that was Broad Street. Oh, there wasn't any Broad Street when we came in. Well, it's probably the next one. Uh, keep going. I can't. We're coming to a dead end. Well, we'll have to go back. Try turning right on Broad Street. Oh, gee, this is getting crazy. We turned left coming in. Turn right here. Okay. Well, this looks right. This takes us right out onto the main road. Oh, thank God. Mike, we should have turned left back there. No, no, no. We're still on the main road out of the village. No, we're not. Look, look up there. It's another dead end. Can't be. We've got to go back and take the road to the left. Oh, this doesn't add up, Jane. Look, we've been driving for a half hour trying to get out of this town. Every road's either a dead end or it takes us right back into the middle of the village. But we came in on the main road. Where is it? Why can't we find it? You don't want us to find it, Jane. We're trapped. We're trapped in this town, and I don't know why. I don't know why, but they don't want us to get out. <laughs> We're 
right back at Mrs. Williams. Oh, all roads lead to Mrs. Williams. I don't know what to do anymore. Driving around is useless. I'm going to confront that woman. I'm going to find out what's going on. Then we'll never get out of here. <laughs> Again, I have to say, I don't know. Come on. We're going to wait for Mrs. Williams to get back from her backgammon. <laughs> Mr. Sather, uh, Mrs. Sather, something wrong? Uh, very, Mrs. Williams, very wrong. I, I don't understand. I saw all your things in your car as I came in. We're leaving, Mrs. Williams. That is, we're trying to leave. But why? Well, you, you want to know. You listened in on my phone conversation. You know now that we're on to you, all, all you lovely people in Granville. On to us? Oh, come on, Mrs. Williams. We're prisoners here. We know it. You know it. Why? That's what I want to know. Why? Uh, Mr. Slater, if you want to leave, I think you'd better. I've never had guests act as strangely as you. All right. What happened to Tim Egan? Why was the road marker hidden in Broker's Barn? And why? Why can't we find our way out? Every street's changed since we came in. For a half an hour, we drove in circles trying to find the road we came in on. Mr. Slater, if you want to leave Granville, I'll have Ned show you the right way. It's no secret. Uh, Ned will be over in two minutes. Have your coffee. You've nothing to worry about, Mr. Slater. Mrs. Williams, I guess we seemed awfully strange. But things have happened here that... We don't understand. Oh, I know. Mr. Slater enumerated them. I I have some more coffee. All right. I guess I'm feeling better. Mrs. Williams, we we enjoyed your hospitality. Maybe we're making a big deal out of nothing. Of course you are. I can't see a thing we've done to make you think we want to harm you. Well, I was trying trying to get out of town. I'm Road marker, like uh, you you were trying to hide us. Oh, we... Uh, well, maybe our imagination's got the best of us. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we ought to stay the rest of the summer, Jane. We've, we've chased away the boogeyman. No, I'm afraid it's time for you to leave. I'm sorry, too. I don't think you've got enough of my good home cooking. Martha, you in there? Come on in there. I think they're uh, about ready. Mm-hmm. They each had two cups. I do hope you got some replacements coming. A new couple tomorrow, two more on the weekend. Good. Uh, Mr. Slater? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mrs. Slater? Mm-hmm. When do we go home? Uh, I'd uh, better get them over to the freezer. Oh, dear, I wish I'd had more time to fatten them up a bit. Oh, you did fine, Martha. Same as always. Oh, I hope so. It's my job. Well, I'll get them packed down. Then I'd better get that sign out again. Don't want to miss the folks tomorrow. Be right there. Oh, hello. Uh, Hello, uh, Mrs. Williams. We're the Rental. Oh, of course. I've been expecting you all morning. You didn't have any trouble finding the place? Oh, no. Oh, well, come on in. Rooms are all ready. You're on the second floor. Lovely couple just moved out. I know now why you're so particular about your guests. This home is so beautiful. Well, yes, we have to be. Oh, my, the, the whole town is just a picture. I just know we're going to enjoy it here. And we're going to enjoy you. We stopped at that little store in town to ask directions, and everyone seems so happy and healthy. It's so so youthful. Like you. We just can't believe you're 79. Oh, well, we keep young in Granville. The secret's in our diet. We're very particular about what we eat. It's all in the diet. Oh, your health food fat is. Well, we do raise everything we eat. I, I hope you brought good appetites with you. It's my job to fatten up my summer people. <laughs> I warned you not to go back there, but you went anyway. You can spare me the details. I know what went on there in Granville. Suffice it to say, a trip to Granville 
is a one-way trip. But I'm glad you got back safely. Relax and order anything on the menu. I'll be back shortly. I do hope you won't make the mistake of ever returning to Granville again. You're lucky to have gotten out with your skin. I can tell you one thing. You wouldn't catch me dead in the place. But you will find me in this same place tomorrow with another menu of suspense, mystery, and horror. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Jennifer Harmon, Grace Matthews, Leon Janney, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. And it's a simple enough request. I think it's high time I heard it. You're high time. <laughs> As you can hear, I have my own doctor whom I trust implicitly. He finally has told me that my life can be measured in hours. I want you to promise to be by my bedside. I want you to do for me what has never been done before. I want you to mesmerize me in articulo mortis, in the act of death. But just before it, so that the old man with the scythe will be stopped in his tracks. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Good evening, this is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon, the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night, Pabst Blue Ribbon presents you with a front row seat in America's favorite summer theater. So while America's famous producer, writer, director, Orson Welles, entertains you, pour yourself a tall, frosted glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon and enjoy at the same time great entertainment and this truly great beer. Ladies and gentlemen, last week, right after signing off, we met a man from Canada who ran off a record for us, the transcription of a broadcast presented by Stage 46, that exciting radio series produced by Andrew Allen up in Toronto. We loved it, all of us in the Mercury who listened, and we figured you listeners stateside shouldn't have to miss the fun from up above the border. So, the previously announced Treasure Island goes back on the shelf to make room for a light-hearted little libel entitled Life with Adam. A sort of satire this is on somebody of a similarity almost photographic and certainly surgical to your obedient servant. In other words, the hero of tonight's story is me. But I refuse to admit it to the extent of playing the part myself. No, I'm just going to sit back in the control room and make myself comfortable, as comfortable as possible under the circumstances. When lampooning a contemporary, the neatest evasion of the libel laws, you know, is a simple switch of the victim's name by translating... I'd better try that again. By translating Alexander Walker to Sheridan Whiteside, the authors of The Man Who Came to Dinner were spared a lawsuit, although the model of the comedy could not be restrained from enacting himself in the road company. 
turning the name Orson Welles into the even unlikelier Adam Bonney Castle, playwright Hugh Kemp of Canada not only scored a thundering success on the radios of our good neighbors to the north, but wins a half hour of his model's hard-won airtime without having to endure a performance of the model by the model himself. No, I definitely am not going to act myself. And no cracks, please, about how I never have. Canada's celebrated and very, very talented Fletcher Markle, who's the man who brought us the record and who created the role and who is also the show's director tonight, will be heard in what might be described as my place. Since there is no valid contribution I can make to Life with Adam beyond having posed for the original of this advertisement, I therefore yield the studio to an impersonation which, believe me, is something less than a compliment and something more than a comment. <laughs> Hello, Chester. Hi, Chubb. What are you doing? Melting. I'm melting away. Hello, George. Same old thing. Yes, Miss Holiday. Now, Avery, what is all this? Yes, what are you doing in New York when you could be at Sneedon? Mm, it's a long story, Chubb, but it goes in one sentence. I'm sick of the people I know. Does that sound awful? No worse than it did the last time. How's New York? Dull. Who's around? The kids that are working. What about you, Chubb? Oh, nothing I haven't written about. Oh, hey, I've got something to show you. Right. Oh, that. A day with Eve Holiday. Have you seen it? They sent me a copy. I think it's swell. Let me see it. The pictures are nice. Just a sec. Turn back a couple of pages. Hmm? Oh, there. Life with Adam. Adam Bonnycastle writes, produces, acts, lectures, composes, paints. I saw him act once. Cute. He needs a shave. I think he's here in town. Oh, I see you've read this. I had nothing to do on the train. The 27-year-old wizard, who can do everything but add, is absolutely tireless. Fresh from a successful run in his own musical, Big Nemo, Bonnie Castle is now in rehearsal with a traditional version of Richard III. He lectures twice weekly at two universities. Will guest appear as Sidney Carton on the August 12th broadcast of All Star Theatre. He's super thyroid. All Star Theatre? Hey, that daddy show he's a sponsor. You want to go, huh? Might be something to do. Tell them, it's not me. I'll get tickets. You want to ask anybody? Let's go alone. Oh, I forgot you're sick of people. How about this? Adam Bonnycastle rejected the agency's adaptation of A Tale of Two Cities. <laughs> to the new stylized version himself. I see him, foremost of just judges and honored men, bringing a boy to my name with a forehead that I know and golden hair. Hey, he's all right. What do you say, Dean? He needs a haircut. No, I wouldn't mind an evening with that boy. Not my type. I tell the child my story with a tender and a faltering voice. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. of Shakespeare's Richard III to appear on tonight's All-Star Theater. I couldn't possibly make it. Mr. Bonnie Castle, there are people on all phones. Take messages, please, will you, Jenkins? Where's Jenkins? Here I am. Take a note, will you? Page 18, Richard. Um, subjective approach. I don't know what that means. Remind me. Yes, Mr. Bonnie Castle. Mr. Bonnie Castle, your elevator's waiting. 
Castle. I'll be right there. Here's the producer, Mr. Bonnie Castle. Well, Mr. Bonnie Castle, do do? beautifully played, beautifully played. It was a real pleasure to produce, a real pleasure. I don't know why. Uh, Mr. Bonnie Castle, you do at rehearsal at the well, I'm coming right away. I have an idea for Buckingham's costume. Tell Forrest to see me at breakfast. Breakfast is booked. Breakfast is booked. You can drive over to the university with you. Mr. Bonnie Castle, I'm Chubb Horton. My father. Mr. Bonnie Castle, long distance wants you to Hollywood. It's that ridiculous woman. I can't talk to Mr. her. Mr. Bonnie Castle, my I father. I was about to tell you the car won't be ready till tomorrow. Now get an ambulance, will you? I can't stand taxi. Mr. Bonnie Castle, my yes, father. little girl, what is it about your father? Does he want to act? I'm Chubb Horton. My father sponsors this program. Why? I don't know. I don't know either. It's perfectly dreadful. Uh, may I present Eve Holliday, Mr. Bonnie Castle? How do you do? Hello. Jenkins, I like the fellow read the sentry. Get his name, will you? Come on, Chubb. You've met the boy wonder. Mr. Bonnie Castle, I have a car right out front. I'd be glad to drive Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Very kind. Chubb, I'll meet you somewhere afterwards. Oh, you don't be a prima donna. Come for a nice drive. Come on, Jenkins. Goodbye, kiddies. I love you all. <laughs> Quite, thank you. Very pleasant. How about you, Eve? I will be soon. How far is the theater? Oh, bear up, Miss Holliday. Jenkins, this child doesn't admire me. What's the matter, Miss? Do you want to be an actress? I do not. Thank heavens. What were you doing there tonight? You're much too fashionable to be interested in radio. I was trapped into it. So was I. May I ask a question, Mr. Bonnie Castle? Of course. Are you really as unbearable as you seem? <laughs> I don't know. Jenkins, am I as unbearable as I seem? Sometimes, Bonnie boy, sometimes you're a prize. And at other times, you're a dear. Tonight, I'm a prize. Uh, what about you? Are you really the empty shell you seem? Eve is a doll, and you leave her alone. You like her, huh? What do you like about her? Everything. She's wonderful. She has looks, style, social position. She spends too much time dressing. Why don't you get your hair cut? Eve's trouble is that she's bored. Ah, bored. That's wonderful. What are you bored about? You at the moment, also the summer. I'd forgotten how dull New York is in the summer. New York is exciting. You are dull. Well, let's not discuss me. What do you mean by dull? Everybody's away. No good parties. No good parties. What a mind you must have, my butterfly. No wonder you wear dark glasses. <laughs> I'll bet you have full-length mirrors on your wall. You're stealing my line. The theater's just around the corner. We'll get out here. All right, All right I'll stop on the other side. Excuse me. I, I enjoyed the play, Mr. Bonnie Castle. See you again, I hope. Thanks very much, Chubbin. You too. What did you say your name was? I didn't. She's Eve Holliday. Eve Holliday. Nice. Miss Holliday, you have good legs. Jenkins? I like the pretty girl. Well, Eve, what did you think of him? Who? Adam Bonnie Castle. Who else? Isn't he dreadful? Where's that magazine? You're sitting on it. Don't you think he's good looking? I suppose if you like the type. Right, producers, acts, lectures, composers, paint. That Miss Jenkins seemed like a nice person. How old did you say she was? Oh, 35. You think she's given up hope? <laughs> oh, no. Born in Dayton, Ohio, Bonnie Castle was doing finished paintings at the age of five, composing at seven. Hmm. He needs the mustache, though. <laughs> Hello? Adam Bonnie Castle. Adam Bonnie Castle, what? This is Adam speaking. Yes? You drove me to the theater a couple of nights ago. Yes, I remember. You were very busy. You were very bored. Are you still bored? At the moment, yes. After my rehearsal tonight, I have three hours off. Will you meet me? I have three dates. Don't be irrelevant. I have a whole cast waiting. Of course I won't meet you. How'd you get my private phone? I didn't. Jenkins did. She can get anything. Did you get your hair cut? I have a picture magazine here, Life. It says, A Day with Eve Holiday." I've seen it. Eve Holiday believes in glamour around the clock. She breakfasts on grapefruit and coffee, wearing a beautifully designed mandarin coat of chartreuse. What a horrible waste of a life. What are you being so useful about? Life is a race against death. And you hope to win? I'll be through at midnight. Will you meet me? Definitely not. At the theater? No. Kitties, that was a very bad dress, kitties, but I love you all. Your little lamb. Lampkins. Do it like that in Boston and we'll all have to work in radio again. Jenkins! 
Jenkins, get Smith for breakfast and tell him to bring his sketchbook. Okay, Mr. Bonacastle. Smith for breakfast. Adam, we're going out for smoked meat. You want to come? Can't send one over for me, will you? I'll be here. And coffee, a quart of coffee. Adam, Bonnie! What is it, Jenkins? Someone down here to see you. Huh? Oh, look who it is. Didn't expect you. You see the dress? I just came in. If you'll excuse me, I um, I haven't slept this week. Thanks, Miss Jenkins. Okay, Jenkins, quits for tonight. In the morning. Night, Bonnie. So, you didn't expect me. I never expect a woman. Where are we going? I have to get this stuff off my face. You do your own makeup? Yes, always. I'm an expert. You wear too much. Ha! That's a horrible mouth. I'll fix you it. You leave it alone. It droops. What a dismal droop. Why did you ask me out tonight? Why'd you accept? What's that stuff? Ben's a dream. You look terrible. Are you sick? I'm a little tired. Why don't you go to bed? It's habit forming. What's the point behind all this routine? You resent it, don't you? Why should I resent it? It's a challenge to your way of life. Why do you do it? When I was 20, it seemed a good way to be very important. Now you're 27. Why do you keep it up? Nothing else seems very important. Poor man. How'd you get time off tonight? I canceled things. Where are we going? Any ideas? You want your picture taken, is that it? Autograph. No, that isn't it. What is it, then? You're beautiful. You fascinate me. I have a farm about half an hour out Westchester. Do you want to go sit on a swing? I do not. How about a club? I thought you were tired of that life. I'm no farm girl. Well, here you are sitting on a swing. Do you like it? What are you doing with the farm? I bought it for Jenkins. There are times when I haven't any money. Jenkins keeps me. Who is Jenkins? She used to be an actress, but it made her sick at the stomach. Now she manages me. What are you doing next month? Boston, Richard, and I. Starting a new radio series. And I have lectures. We're planning a new Hamlet. When do you rest? I take a deep breath every now and then. What are you doing in New York in August? I got sick of the country life. I want to be useful. You're out of character. You dislike me, don't you? I like you very much. Why did you ask me out? Why did you come? Put you in your place? You're not trying very hard. No. You're not playing fair. You're being defenseless. You're disappointed? No. Surprised? Yes. Why? That public performance of yours is a lily. You're not like that. What am I like? You'll hate this. Go ahead, offend me. You're more like Huckleberry Finn. Matt? No. Please. Why? I didn't think you'd read Huckleberry Finn. You'd be surprised what I'd read. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Why? Surprise is mainly an act. People aren't surprised nearly as often as they think they are. Well, being honest tonight. I'm being honest. You're being sulky. I'll be honest, too, Adam. What? I want to be kissed. <laughs> surprise, surprise. You're not going to be. You're very cute. I thought we were being honest. I told you about your mouth back in the dressing room. Let's go home. I've had enough of the country. Huck. This is your obedient servant, Adam Bonner. Excuse me, Orson Welles. You are not listening to me. You're listening to Canada's radio star, Fletcher Markle, in his own production of Hugh Kemp's Canard, called Life with... Or, or, excuse me, Life with Adam. And now, while Mr. Markle and I rest from his exertions, here is Jim Amici to tell you about smooth and sparkling... Yes, smooth and sparkling Pabst Blue Ribbon. As one of the Mercury players was saying just before the start of tonight's show, Jim, you're right when you tell folks to keep on asking for Pabst Blue Ribbon... For shortage or no shortage, that Pabst Blue Ribbon taste is as perfect as ever. Yes, of course it is. After all, Pabst Blue Ribbon, as always, is happily blended of those never less than 33 fine brews. Naturally, the flavor is just bound to be not too light, not too heavy, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with the real beer flavor coming through just the way you like it. So... When occasionally your dealer is unable to supply you with all of this truly great beer you like, please keep right on asking for blended, splendid Paps Blue Ribbon. Comes now 
act two of Life with Adam. And remember, please, any similarity to living persons is purely intentional. Well, don't keep me waiting, Eve. What about him? What about Adam Bonacastle? Is this really it? Oh, Chubb, what would I do? Sit at rehearsals all the time? Besides, I'd get very tired of his shouting at Jenkins. Jenkins! Coming, Bonnie. What is it? You take that other phone. I'm busy on these two. Okay. All right, Harry, I'll catch up with you in Boston. Speaking. Yes, I'd Can like I to do it very you? much. Depends on how long Richard well, runs. Well, Mr. Bonacastle isn't passing just about a moment. About a month, I'd say. Well, what have you done? Now, goodbye, Harry. Oh, Hello, uh, uh, Frank. Uh, about well, those pictures, will you take them again? You, but, uh, he has so no, Frank, just pictures. If I want portraits, I'll get paintings yes. made. Yes, I'll Anytime you say between it. 4 and 4.15. Try us again. Okay, goodbye. goodbye. Jenkins, don't give me that reproachful look. Bonnie, you're 40 minutes late. What have you got there? And the remains of the mail. Do I have to read it? There are a couple you should look at. One very personal. What does it say? It's an invitation to a something on Saturday afternoon, Eve holiday. Oh. You want to go? We drove out to the farm the other night. Did you have a time? She excites me. She's not your type. What is my type? Me, about ten years ago. She gives me a lift. That's important. Well, go to a party. You can do your card trick. I did a social season once. I can't stand repetition. Well, maybe you'll like the little chums. The dialogue will be very bright, I'm sure. Well, she's not like the rest of them. She's trying to break away. Oh, pardon my guffaw. Jenkins, you're very sweet. I love you, you know. I know. You won't leave me, will you? No, Bonnie. I'll be around. Jenkins? Yes? Cancel everything between now and Monday. Rehearsals, meetings, lectures. What's the matter, Bonnie? Let's not be analytical. I've got to do my lines. Memory slipping. All right. I'll be in my office if you want me. Fine. Flourish. A flourish, trumpets. Strike alarm, drums. Let not the heavens hear these telltale women rail on the Lord's anointed. Strike, I say! Either be patient and entreat me fair, or with the clamorous report of war, thus will I drown your exclamation. Yes? Hello. Hello. Oh, it's you. Well... Say something. I can't think of anything. Why did you call? Jenkins told me to. I'm busy, Adam. What are you doing? Chester's here. He's playing the piano. The amateur hour. How I hate amateurs. You're getting insulting. I want to see you. When did that come over you? Just now. I can't possibly see you. I'll pick you up. We'll do some bars. No. In about half an hour. No, I mean it. I want you. No. Did you get my invitation? Yes. Well, are you coming to the party? I'm terribly busy. My weekend is filled. Chester's pounding. I have to get back. I want you. No. Goodbye, Adam. Jenkins! What is it? I feel fine, thank you. Very bright. Slave, I have set my life upon a cast, and I will stand the hazard of the die. I think there be six Richmonds in the field. Five have I slain today instead of him. A horse. A horse, my kingdom for a horse. You. Hey, you, how do I get out to the garden? Right through there. But yell bingo before you do. Thank you. Look. Look, what is done cannot be now amended. Men shall deal unadvisedly sometimes which after hours give leisure to repent. If I did take the kingdom from your sons to make amends, I'll give it to your daughter. Hi, Adam. Huh? Come over, over here. Oh, Chubb. Who's that? King Richard. What are you doing out here by yourself? Getting my breath. This is some party for August. Who are these people? Eve's friends? Some are. Some just came along. How do you tell them apart? You don't like us very much, do you? I don't lump you all together. We're not really like this. A lot of us just an act. The trouble with us is that we're bored. Nuts. All right. But you have to understand that if you want to understand Eve. Chubb, you seem like a good fellow. Why don't you stop this nonsense? What do you want me to do? Sit at home? Try it at once? Didn't like it. Eve doesn't seem too ecstatic at the moment. Eve gets moved. Hmm. Besides, you're not supposed to be out in the garden when she's inside. Oh, there's Joe. I better go in. You mean there's another one? Really, it's a 
darling winter place, it's stone, has four huge bedrooms, one smaller one, an enormous living room, wood paneled, and the cutest furniture. Is it as nice as our place last year? Yes, I think so. And Peggy has promised to find us a maid. A job, darling. It's about time. Mm -hmm. It sounds wonderful, June. June, this is Adam Bonnycastle, June Delaplante. Eve, darling, he's cute. How did you get him? Madam, take your arms from around my neck. He's shy. Oh, isn't that, darling? June has found us a house for the winter. What's the matter with this house? A winter place in the Laurentian. Oh, that's wonderful. I hate the thought of being stuck in town all winter. What do you do up there? We ski, silly boy. We ski. <laughs> I don't think I'd be much of a skier. <laughs> What's that got to do with him? The man's human. He's actually human. He doesn't ski. Did you see anybody else? Yes, Peg told me the thought he's thinking that little blue place. You know, the one that looks like French pastry. Yes, sir! Adam, don't. Shout. Chester, if you must play that, for heaven's sakes, give it a reasonable expression. Don't push. Now, Chester, watch. Listen. See? Like this. Like this. 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 You get it? Do you get anything? No. It does sound better, Chester. I'm going home. Chester. I feel like singing. I feel like singing. Adam, do you know row, row, row your boat? I do not. Do you know it's the talk of the town? Will you stop clinging to me? Don't you disagreeable. Don't you know any popular music? I mean, it's Saturday. How about onesie, twosie? Chester! Chester, wait for me. Adam, isn't that awful? Adam! Adam, if you leave now, we're all through. All through. We were all through before we ever met. Onesie, twosie, it's the talk of the town. No, I'm very sick now. I'm upset. So, you fell off your good behavior. Bonnie, you do learn the hard way. Job, the little girl, a fat one, turned out to be a campfire singer. I could have told you There was that. a girl there, not a girl, a creature. If you wrote her into a script, people would say it was corny. She kept talking about a house. Well, what about the weekend? I canceled everything. Do you want me to uncancel? Might as well try to save some more of this evening's gone. I'll work by myself. All right, I'll check with you first thing in the morning. Take it easy, Greasy. It's a long, Thanks long for flight. coming over. Do you want a cab? Charlie! Oh, I forgot he went out for the night. I'd rather walk. Night. Night. <laughs> As I intend to prosper and repent, so thrive I in my dangerous attempt of hostile arms. Myself, myself confound. Heaven and fortune bar me happy hours. Day yield me not thy light, nor night thy rest. Oh, as I intend to prosper and repent, so thrive I in my dangerous attempt. You change your mouth. You haven't changed your manners. No, come in. What are you doing? Rehearsing? It's Saturday night, didn't you know? So I heard. Where's your party? You behaved dreadfully this afternoon. Why do you bother with those people? They're unbelievably unimportant. They're my friends. What's the matter? Can't you interest any real people? Oh, stop acting. Who decorated this place? Nobody. I hate decorators. It just grew. Parts of it are still empty. Who was that June character? June's a darling when you know her. I'll never find out. Who painted this portrait? I did. Who is it? Shirley. My wife. You were married? When I was 20. For a year. What happened? I needed more people. So did Shirley. Where is she now? In San Francisco, I think, enjoying a very successful second marriage. Are you in love with her? What are you doing here? Oh, Adam, Adam, Adam. That's what I came for. I should go. Why do you want to? No. No, no, no. There's no sense in this. Since when have you tried to make sense? When we're alone. Oh, good. More, more, more. When are you leaving? In a week, I'll be away a year. Why so long? Richard closes in New York. I'm going to the West Coast. Want to come? Yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't it? I never knew what incompatibility meant until I ran into you. I suppose Miss Jenkins is going with you. I couldn't live without her. Will you think of me? Not for long. Another winter with your little chums in the north, and you'll be undistinguishable. I want the winter. We could have fun if you stay. Yes, couldn't we? We could all get suntanned. You don't laugh enough. We'll do you good to have some fun. My dear child, I have more fun in a minute than you have in a week. Don't call me a child. When you were 17, somebody convinced you that you were very important. You've carefully preserved the illusion. And the age. Adam, 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 I want to be kissed. Adam. 
Oh, <gasps> this is impossible, ridiculous. We have nothing in common, have we? Absolutely nothing. I know it couldn't work. I know that. Nobody's fault. Just a difference of background, a temperament. Would be miserable. Completely. Perhaps if we met in another lifetime. Under totally different We'd have a magnificent week, and then we'd run into that party crowd of yours. Oh, a week of rehearsal. Not hating each other. Really hate. Oh, it would be impossible. Quite impossible. Oh, but let's try it, shall we? Shall we? Darling. Love. Phew. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Life with Adam. And for this unabashed assault upon us, the Mercury leased out its studio tonight to an all-star cast of talented Canadians. Grace Matthews was Eve, John Draney was Chester, had there any was, among other things, the waiter and producer... Mr. Judre was Chubb, and there was Mr. Fletcher Marco, whose excruciating portrait of your producer, your producer, is not likely to live down. A few Mercury refugees did just manage to nudge up to the microphone. There was the old maestro Bernard Herman, for instance, who conducted the original music, which was, conducted, which was written by Lucio Agostini for the original Canadian broadcast. There was Mercedes de Cambridge for a minute there, June, and sharing the top billing with Mr. Marco a Mercury veteran who's added stardom on Broadway to her position as one of radio's most highly regarded artists, our own Miss Betty Gard. She was Jenkins. And now, before telling you about next week, a word from Jim Amici. Let me remind you to be patient with your dealer when, occasionally these days, he's unable to supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like. He's doing his best. You can be sure of that. Yes, and here's something else you can be sure of. Every single bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon you do get will, as always, be the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. Yes, every foaming, frosty glass you enjoy will, as always, have that famous Pabst Blue Ribbon flavor. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with the real beer taste coming through the way you like it. So keep asking for blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now here's a very important message from Secretary Anderson of the Department of Agriculture. Mr. Anderson says, quote, the immediate problem that faces a war-torn world is food. For after this week of spade work and education comes the constant performance through autumn that should result in making this year the greatest season of home food preservation in history, unquote. And now, Mr. Wells. Next week, a real thriller dealer, Moat Farm by Norman Corwin. Until then, speaking for my sponsors and for all of us in the Mercury, I remain as always obediently yours. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabs Blue Ribbon, the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night, Pabs Blue Ribbon presents you with a front row seat in America's favorite summer theater. So while America's famous producer, writer, director, Orson Welles entertains you, pour yourself a tall frosted glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon and enjoy at the same time great entertainment and this truly great beer. And now, Mr. Welles. Looking back over our years of broadcasting over literally hundreds of radio plays and productions, we remember nothing that we've done with more pride than the documentary we're bringing you tonight after some eight seasons for its first revival. This is our own Mercury adaptation of the account by Commander Edward Ellsberg of the disastrous first expedition to the Arctic, Hell on Ice. As retired chief engineer of our Navy, a fair share of honors have come my way. But I can only humbly hope that the name of George Melville may be a little remembered as one who served under Captain DeLong on the last voyage on the steamship Jeanette. I still read and reread my log of that trip, though the ink's been dry near 30 years. Here's the first entry. July 8th, 1879. 3.40 p.m. Pacific time. Jeanette weighed anchor. Destination, the North Pole. Already below, Captain DeLow. Weigh anchor. Captain 
I'll never forget them on the bridge together. George Washington DeLong, a scholarly-looking man with glasses, commander of naval vessels for 20 years on the seven seas. And by his side, with her pretty head flung back, Emma DeLong. Chief, I want you to meet Mrs. DeLong before she deserts her husband. How do you do? Glad to meet you, ma'am. Mr. Melville, tell me, what do you think of a man who'd rather go off to the North Pole than stay home with his wife? <laughs> Being a bachelor, I can't properly say, Mrs. DeLong. Emma, the chief will think you really don't want me to go. Look, George, something I have for you. No, stay here, Mr. Melville. I want you to be a witness. Uh, silk flag. I want you to unfurl it. Well, the point farthest north. The point farthest north. The North Star, George. I'll watch it, and we'll be looking at the same thing. Things equal to the same thing. Remember your geometry, Captain. <laughs> Brief embrace, and then DeLong was once more simply the sailor. For a few minutes, with strained eyes, I watched a white handkerchief fluttering across the water at us. And then it faded in the distance. Of our passage to Alaska, there's not much in my journal. August 2nd, with the aid of a tow hook baited with salt pork, the newspaper man, Collins, bagged an albatross. Crew none too pleased. The ancient superstitions of the sea persist even to the day of steamships. August 14th, course set north for northwest through Bering Straits into the Arctic Sea. And off the coast of Alaska, towards Wrangell Island. Yes? Oh, Eric, what is it? Take a head, Captain, on the river bows. Nice. Come on, swing her hard to lee. Hard to lee, all hands on deck. Ever am on my station, Clear fast, ship. We're closing fast. No use. She won't clear it. Ice, 200 feet ahead. Yeah, there it is. Ice, We're going to strike. Hold the steamer, sir. Hold the steamer. No use, Captain. We're done. that ice pack head on. Lucky for us, we had that 19-inch planking or the flow would have stove us in. As far as we could see, the pack was unbroken. Except in back of us, a narrow lane of open sea. Supper that night was a somber meal. Here was ice only 240 miles north of Siberia. Latitude 71 degrees 30 minutes where it had no business to be this time of the year. Finally, the captain, chewing earnestly away on his mutton, broke a silence that was almost as solid as the ice pack. Well, Mr. Chip, I think by morning we'll find a lead through this ice. No, Captain, we won't. Hmm. Seem pretty certain, Mr. Chip. What are the rest do you think? Van and now, what do you think? You're, you're a navigator. Well, I think that Chinese cook's coffee is even worse than usual, sir. All water and no coffee beans. What do you say, Chief? Maybe I say I'm saving coffee, in case the ice pack holds. Collins seems to be able to drink his. What I drink is my own affair. Don't take it so hard, Collins. More coffee? Anybody? Next day, with broken ice piling up along our side, the captain gave the order to unship the rudder. So the end of the first week found us a rudderless ship, drifting with the ice pack. All chance of exploration gone. Stopped at latitude 71 degrees north, which had been reached in these same waters 20 years before by an ordinary sailing ship. This same day, the captain wrote in his log. Uh, the same faces at every meal. Same irritations pricking our nerves, the same routine day after day. No shore leave, no ports to visit, nothing but endless ice. Drifting willy-nilly, a thousand miles from that pole, which, <laughs> in a blaze of publicity, we'd 
set out to conquer. December 1st. On board the Jeanette by now, we've told all our stories, read all our books, played all our games. Each morning we wake to the same faces, the same dogs, the same ice. We take the same exercise, make the same calculations of the drift. Eat the same food and return each night to the same beds. With the same conviction that tomorrow will be the same as today. December 24th. Our first Christmas Eve on ice. Say, how about some mistletoe over the rigging? Yeah. We might catch an Arctic mermaid, like Collie caught this albatross. Collins is my name. Oh, so it is. Excuse me. Well, uh, what about this? Holy mackerel, Irish whiskey. <laughs> Hand it over, Chief. Here, first the captain. Oh, thanks, Chief. Uh, here, I'll pour my own. Careful, Dan, now. You've only got one good eye. Uh, I can always see good enough for this. <laughs> Is that right, Dan? No, Dan. I'm going to save some for the crew, you know. That's right. Uh, Collins, how about you? Well, uh, what's it like? Uh, is it good whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> give Collie a written guarantee, Chief. <laughs> Collins is my name. Uh, I'd give you another if I'd been your old man. Uh, don't waste any of that stuff on him, Chief. Uh, you can take your whiskey and go to the devil. Well, that's a nice Christmas thought. Oh, let's forget him. Can't help it, I guess. Say, uh, how about a toast? Yeah, if anyone proposes James Gordon Bennett, I'll follow Collie. <laughs> <laughs> Melville's got one. I can see it fizzing. Yes, I have. I propose a toast to Emma DeLong. Oh. Thank you, Melville. I couldn't say it, but I was thinking that, too. Emma DeLong. January 5th, temperature 57 below zero. Sun appeared for the first time since November. Today, Dr. Ambler had to operate on Dan and I's eye. He has to sit in the cabin without a crack of light. We take turns talking to him. We speak next summer and break up the ice. He likes to talk about that. February 1st, more trouble. I noticed Erickson, bosun of the crew and one of our best workers, was laying down on the job. I decided he was sick. Captain, I know being sick. I've been watched. Who's watching you, Nels? What are you talking about? There'd been mutiny on this ship. Mutiny? There'd been mutiny, sir, on this ship, sir. Mutiny in the crew? Where'd you get this, Erickson? Yeah, uh, Captain, I tell you, it's been like I say. I've been asked to join, but no. No say yeah, no say no. So I've been watched. They got guns. They killed me for it if I tell you. Erickson. What do you mean by they? Please, they look and tell they killed me. Now, look, I'm your captain. Do you know what disobedience means? Now, come on, who's behind this? It been... Nobody hear us? Nobody's hearing us. It been... Ah, Sam. Ah, Sam. Yeah, Chinese cook. Erickson, look at me. Now, right in my eye. Follow my fingers, I move it. Here. Yes, now over here. Follow my finger. Over here. We're going to see Dr. Ambler. But they been killed me. No, I won't sure. let him, Nels. I'll take care of you. But they tell you. I know, I know. Now, you take my hand, they That's tell it. You. That's a good they fella. They tell you. Now, come along. Come along. January 6th. Four months on the ice. Part of the crew sick. A blinded officer, now a seaman gone mad. What'll this ice do to us before this winter's over?
Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to our Mercury production of Hell on Ice. And now, before we bring you the final act of this true life drama of adventure and heroism, Hell on Ice, here for a brief breather, is Jimmy Wallington who says, For something S W E L L, swell on ice, there's nothing like blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. No, sir. Especially if it's only a little chunk of ice wrapped in a square of burlap and stuck under the stern seat of a rowboat. Oh, boy, does it make a day's fishing the real McCoy when you can reach for a frosted bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon and enjoy the familiar smoothness, the unforgettable taste you know. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clear, sparkling as the sun on a summer lake with a real beer taste coming through just the way you like it. Listen, folks, if your dealer can't always supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like, Keep on asking for those never less than 33 fine brews blended into one great beer. Blended splendid, perhaps blue ribbon. And now, Orson Welles brings you part two of Hell on Ice. On February 25th, after six months in the ice, we were still drifting. Waiting for the thaw to free us. March 5th, first glimpse of sunshine. Three minutes of bleak twilight. Then darkness again. March 30th. Temperature rising. Noon reading, five above zero. Ice still 14 feet thick. I turn back to my own records. Our hopes for what the summer sun would do are beginning to fade. It is July now. We find rifts in the ice at sundown and then see them knit again overnight. The days grow shorter, and with them, men's tempers. Hey, Mr. Collins? Mr. Collins, come here, sir. I have Mr. Chip's report that you failed to give him an observation. Well? It's in Chip's province to receive that information and enter it in the ship's records. I was going to write it on a piece of paper and hand it to you. Oh, him. Mr. Collins, I've issued an order for an hour's exercise. I've noticed for several days you've been cutting down the time. Today I'm satisfied you're doing it deliberately. And when you say that, I say it isn't true. I'm making allowances for your ignorance of naval regulations, but I advise you not to repeat that contradiction. When you charge me with violating an order, I deny it, and I'll repeat that as much as I please. That's enough, Mr. Collins. When we get back to the United States, I'll have you court-martialed. Meanwhile, turn in your instruments and perform no further duties on this ship. You're under arrest. <laughs> That second winter, the temperature reached 59 below. In May, we saw the sun again. June 10th, my watch, 9 p.m. till midnight. 11 p.m., disturbed by heavy shocks drumming against our hollow hull. Those words were all I had time to write. I remember the captain rushed up on deck. At this season, even at midnight, the sun's above the horizon. We could see about 80 yards ahead. A lead had opened in the pack some 10 feet wide with cracks zigzagging across the surface of the ice, moving towards us. Then the floe split wide apart beneath us. The Jeanette lurched wildly to port and suddenly slipped off the ice into open water. We were thrown across the deck. The ship rolled like a drunken man. Shaking with fear, we waited the next move. At six bells, the pack started to press down that open canal. Slowly, it closed in on us. Thick and jagged, and behind it the push of endless miles of surging ice. On came the pack. The ice reached our sides, started to squeeze. We're sinking, Captain. Ice is coming through the side. What's that? Ice in the hole? Pipe down, Dan, and now you're an experienced seaman. Make your report to me as if you were one. The seams are opening below, sir. The sides will give way. It's only a question of minutes. All hands. Stations for abandoned ship. Ice, sir. Ice, sir. Ice, sir. Ice, sir. Ice, sir. Ice, sir. I only brought part of them. She's still in fast. Shiver. Better jump on me. Ben, ship Ben. Over the side. Over the side. The last to jump was the captain. Scattered over the ice like flies, we watched the doomed Jeanette. Silent now, to gray. Thirty-three men cast away on drifting ice floes. Our fate totally unknown to the world we left two years ago. The impossible reach of relief. Five hundred miles away, 
lay the Lena Delta. June 17, 6 p.m. We made our start course due south. Men and officers harnessed together, tugging at their mountainous burdens. Dogs unable to drag a single sledge. Dr. Ambler far ahead, planting black flags to mark our course. Sledge is sinking in weak ice. Dan and our blind, but pulling on a rope. Fell in open water. Pulled him out before he went under the ice. Lee and Erickson collapsed in their harness. One sled used for dragging the sick. Chip all in, tried to fling himself from the hospital sledge to save us weight, but we strapped him in. Chip cried like a baby at adding to our burden. Unloaded and ferried over open water. Dogs drowned as color overturned. Only saved snoozer. My favorite. By morning, we reached our two-mile flag. Tried to get some sleep. On again at evening, on the ice firmer. June 23rd. Dawn, the first sledge reached Ambler's 12-mile flag. Our chief. Yes, Captain. Come over here. Six days, we've made 12 miles south, right? Just about, sir. Well, we're 20 miles further north tonight than the day we started. North with drifts got us in tow. Are you sure? Don't tell anyone else. The men found out I couldn't get them to lay a hand on another sledge. They just sit here and wait to die. Look at this map. Back here is where the Jeanette sank, you see. And here's where we are today? That's right, 77 degrees, 43 minutes north. We're walking against the drift, and the pack's moving faster than we are. I'm changing our course from south to southwest. That way we've got a chance of reaching the edge. One chance in a hundred. We're going to take it. Well, Skipper, I'll cut a third off the rations. Good. The last 90 days instead of 60. I knew I could count on you, Chief. I always can. <clears throat> now, you remember you're going to be my witness at a little ceremony. This flag. This is DeLong's flag. Yes. The point farthest north. Well, we'll hope this is it. Hold the other hand, Chief. We'll unfurl it for... for Emma. <clears throat> I think she knew, Chief. Sure, Captain. The North Star. She's right over our heads. Things equal to the same thing. She'll be glad, Chief. Let's fold it up so nobody will know we had it out, or else they might guess the reason. Got any tobacco left, Captain? I could stand a pipe full. Don't feel like supper. Or is it breakfast? Hand your pipe over. I'll fill it up. Thanks, brother. Chief, this is a grand country to... To learn patience in. The most we covered in one day was six miles. Some days not more than two. And the men growing weaker every day from frostbite, scurvy. September 9th, 91 days after the sinking of the Jeanette... We reached the edge of the ice in the open sea. We crawled into camp. And then DeLong mustered his crew. Called the roll for the last time. That night, he held divine service. Even the sick joined him. Only Collins stayed in his tent. Thank God for thy mercies. We pray thee deliverance to our homes. To thy continued service. Amen. Amen. At 7.30 on the morning of September 12th, we shoved off in our three boats for Cape Borkin on the Lena Delta. According to our charts, 96 miles of open sea third boat was under my command. By nightfall, we were left alone. Eleven frozen men in one tiny whaleboat in utter blackness.
By morning, the ocean calmed. In the gray light, we saw land less than a mile away. But no sign of the captain's boat. The story of the last days of Captain DeLong and his men were pieced together many months later from the captain's diary from the ship's papers that were found in his camp. 135th day. Around October 1st, nothing... Nothing to report. 136th day. Reached Lena Delta. Doctor says some of the men can't walk even a mile. They'll have to. Erickson dropped in his tracks, both feet frozen, flesh falling off his boots. We cut him some crutches out of the driftwood. Let me stay, Captain. Don't move me. My legs been killing me. Crutches no use. I want only die. Get up, Erickson. Do you think I'm going to leave you? Come on. I'll carry you. Please, Captain. Up, I tell you. We're going on. Hundred and thirty seventh day. This morning Ambler shot a reindeer, men too famished to wait for fire, ate the beast raw. Gave bone to snoozer. My dog. Hundred and thirty eighth day, trapped by open water, have to cross and try to build raft. Men are broken. Can scarcely lift planks. I'd drive them hard. Hundred and thirty ninth day, raft completed, crossed water. Raging blizzard. Midnight Erickson died. Sea burial. First. First a prayer and then. Then sleep. 144th day. Today killed. My dog snoozer for food. He never whimpered. Too far gone. Alexei dying. Doctor baptized him. Alexa dead. Out of the depths should I cry unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Hundred and fifty second day, Mr. Collins' birthday. Forty years old. Food, willow, tea, and two old boots. 153rd day. Calm and mild. Snow falling. About sunset, Lexi died, covered him with Anson and laid him on a crib. Lee dying, ah, Sam dying. Doctor rubs their hands to keep them warm. 156th day, found ship dead in the morning still. Sitting between the doctor and myself. 157th day. Near end of October, very little hope. Sun said our Sam died. He still leans over his kettle. Can't move him. 160th day. Gressler died during the night, Ambler. Now weakening. God help us. 164th day. Hambler calls over to Iverson. Feels his pulse. Iverson dead. 167th day. Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins dying. Collins dying. The captain's last entry in that fateful book. No word of himself. His frozen fingers scrawled their last words. Mr. Collins dying. Months of searching finally brought us to that gale-swept hill. There I made out stiff and stark above the snow an upraised arm. The arm belonged to Captain DeLong, half buried in the snow. I figured he tossed his journal to safety on higher ground and his stiffening arm had frozen on the gesture and I was right. The journal was just above. His face was calm. 
as if his work was done. Atop a rocky promontory looking to the north, towering 400 feet above the great, great bay of the Lena Delta, and far beyond the reach of any possible flood, I prepared for my captain and his crew their final resting place among the Siberian snows, looking out over the Lena's great bay at the desolate cape below, which had witnessed their last agony, and northward across that polar sea which he had volunteered, given his life to conquer. De Long and his men of the Jeanette lay at last beneath the huge cross on the rocky cairn where the fierce Arctic gales they'd so often bravely faced, mournfully wailing their eternal dirge. Reproduction. Be back to the microphone in just a minute. Let me again remind you to be patient with your dealer when occasionally these days he is unable to supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like. He's doing his best, you can be sure of that. Yes, and here's something else you can be sure of. Every single bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon you do get will, as always, be the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. Yes, every foaming, frosty glass you enjoy will, as always, have that famous Pabst Blue Ribbon flavor. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with a real beer taste coming through the way you like it. So keep asking for blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And uh, I'd like to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, before signing off, that our cast included John Brown, Lorene Tuttle, among many other Mercury players, Elliot Reed, an old Mercury pillar who comes to us through courtesy of Paramount Pictures, whose current release is the Hal Wallace production, The Strange Loves of Martha Ivers. Till next week, then, I remain, as always, obediently yours. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sure. Pour me a cup, Gracie. You know, Maxwell House is always good to the last. <laughs> drop. And that drop's good, too. Yes, it's Maxwell House Coffee Time, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen. Yours truly, Bill Goodwin. The music of Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. Mel Blanc and our guest, Francis Langford. For your Thursday night comedy enjoyment, it's George and Gracie. And for your everyday coffee drinking enjoyment, it's Maxwell House. Expertly blended and radiant roasted for rich, mellow, extra flavor. Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. Well, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, George and Gracie do their final broadcast of the current season. So for 13 weeks, you won't be hearing from radio's most charming comedian and most talented actor. Uh, but Gracie and I will be back in September. <laughs> so will Gracie's husband. <laughs> Meanwhile, let's look, at the, look in at the Burns' home... <laughs> Where George and Gracie are figuring out where to spend their vacation. An idea that appeals to George is the big automobile race in Indianapolis. Uh, you know, uh, you know where I'd like to be tomorrow, Gracie? Indianapolis. Indianapolis? Indiana. Well, now, where do you want to be? Indianapolis or Indiana? <laughs> Indianapolis is in Indiana. Oh. Well, that makes it handy. You can visit both of them in one trip. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, that's where I'd like to go tomorrow to see the big race. Oh, well, it's just as well you won't be there, George. You'd lose. You'd bet on the wrong horse. <laughs> they race automobiles. Oh, well, then you'd be sure to lose. Horses can't run as fast as automobiles. <laughs> they don't use horses. Men run the automobiles around a track. Well, now, that's the silliest thing I ever heard. 
Men can't even run as fast as horses. <laughs> Look, at Indianapolis, the automobiles do not run against people. Hmm. Certainly different from Hollywood, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to try once more. They have a big track where these automobiles, driven by men, whiz around about 150 miles an hour. Now, if I were there, I'd get a ticket. Well, if and... that isn't unfair. Now what? They drive 150 miles an hour and you get a ticket. <laughs> Let's forget about Indianapolis. What would you like to do on, on, on our vacation? Well, I'd, uh, I'd like to get a nice suntan. Well, that's easy. But it's such a long way to Florida. <laughs> you don't have to go to Florida. You can stay right here in Los Angeles and get a very dark color. I know, dear, but the smog washes right off. <laughs> um, I've got an idea. I'll run down to the travel bureau and get some folders on different resorts. Uh, where are the uh, car keys? In the filing cabinet. The filing cabinet? Mm-hmm. I-, I wanted to put the house in order, so I organized an alphabetical filing system. Just look in the cabinet and you'll find the keys. Okay. Now, let's see. Keys would be under K. Hey, there's nothing under K but handkerchiefs. You've made a mistake. No, I haven't, no. Uh, when do you use handkerchiefs? When you sneeze. K for kachoo. <laughs> <laughs> That's some system. Well, where are the car keys? Judge, the filing system won't do you any good if you don't learn to use it. Now, think. Car keys, car keys. Oh, sure, they'll be on the sea. Well, for Pete's sake, what's a picture of your brother Willie doing filed on the sea? George, can't you figure anything out? Willie's in the Navy. (laughs) Yeah. He's on a submarine. Yeah. A submarine is an undersea boat, so I... And you file them under sea, sea. I (laughs) see. Look, uh... I'm a little slow in catching on to things. Suppose you tell me where the car keys are. Well, just where any intelligent person would look for them, under P. P? Well, certainly. Think about our car. Oh, I get it. P for Plymouth. That's not bad, Gracie. I apologize. No, no. Not P for Plymouth. Don't you remember we had our car painted green recently? Yeah. Well, was it bright green or pale green? Pale green. P for pale. <laughs> It couldn't be P for Plymouth. Well, of course not. Suppose we traded it in for a Pontiac. (laughs) Well, I won't try to figure it out. I've got the car keys. I'll settle for that. Come in. Good morning, all. Oh, Oh, hello, Mary. Hello. Has your discussion concerning the destination of your vacation reached a satisfactory culmination? (laughs) Get somebody to write a melody, you got something. If that means have we decided where we're going, no. Well, then may I suggest a most delightful spot? An earthly paradise which lies in the vicinity of my hometown in Iowa. What's the name of it, Meredith? Lake Winnie Oscarbega Wandakichi Poopoo in the Willows. <laughs> However, some folks wa- would like to shorten the name. Some folks are right. Mm-hmm. They uh, they want to call it Lake Winnie Oscarbega Wandakichi Poopoo in the Pines. <laughs> Yes, that's much shorter. Now, the name was derived from an old Indian saying, which translated into English means, woman love man, man love woman. What else? (laughs) We now have the mad Russian. (laughs) Oh, that, Meredith, that's very interesting. Interesting. Well, there's a most fascinating legend told about the lake. Would you care to hear it? No, I wouldn't. Well, once upon a time, there dwelt... On the shores of the lake, a beautiful Indian princess. Her father was tall buffalo, and her mother was little squirrel. I wonder what they saw in each other. (laughs) The uh, princess had many suitors, but she said the man she married must dive to the bottom of the lake and bring her an alligator. Oh, big eater, wasn't she? Uh, yes. (laughs) No man dared to try. Because the alligators were very fierce, you know. However, along came a handsome Indian warrior. His father was Screaming Eagle and his mother was Purple Pansy. Well, <laughs> those Indians come from the darndest combinations. 
<laughs> when he heard the desire of the princess, he didn't hesitate a moment, but he dove right to the bottom of the lake. Oh, and he, he brought her the alligator. No, never came up. <laughs> Beautiful legend, isn't it? <laughs> Meredith, you're leaving now. I am? You are. Well, you know best. Good day, all. Good day. What a schmo. <laughs> but at least he gave me an idea. It would be nice to spend our vacation at some lake and fish. Well, I've never tried to catch a fish there. Oh, uh, you'd enjoy it after I taught you what to do. First, I'd show you how to make your tackle. But fish are so slippery. I couldn't hold them after I tackled them. <laughs> never mind, I'll explain it later. Let's go down to the travel bureau and get some information about lakes. All right, dear. Ma, it'll be nice to relax for 13 weeks while Francis Langford takes over the show. Oh, will Francis be on the, uh, on the mm-hmm. show for us or something? Yeah, the sponsor sent us a letter about it this morning. Oh, that's wonderful news. I'd like to see the letter. I knew you would, dear, so I put it in the file for you. <laughs> Not that Chinese puzzle again. Now, George, you're just being stubborn. You can find it easily. Who's the letter about? Francis Langford. Mm-hmm. And what's the first thing you think of when you see Francis Langford? Well. Uh, better make it the second thing. I give up. You think of her husband. Now, who, who is she married to? John Hall. Mm-hmm. And who is he? He's a big, handsome, well-built movie star. So, look under S. Oh, S. S for star. No, S for should happen to me. Well, okay. <laughs> Sweetheart of Sigma Chi. Say, she's a mighty popular girl this time of year, Meredith. She and every other co-ed, Bill. Yes, these are big days on the campus, all right, with final exams just about over and that long-awaited graduation week in sight. Yes, there'll be a senior prom, of course, and a varsity show. And most of all, there'll be graduation itself, with Mom and Dad looking on proudly in the class of 1947 marching in the sheepskin parade. Moments that'll live in memory, these... Belonging so truly and inescapably to the American scene. Reminds me how down through the years, Maxwell House coffee has become so real a part of the American scene. Coffee? Well, we Americans love it. It's our national drink. And it's a fact worth noting that today, more people buy and enjoy Maxwell House than any other brand of coffee at any price. How explain this overwhelming preference? Flavor is the answer, of course. That good-to-the-last-drop Maxwell House flavor that comes from the skillful blending of these selected Latin American coffees. Manizales for mellowness. Medellins for richness. Other choice coffees for vigor. And Bucaramangas for full body. Adding up to great coffee at the peak of perfection. Friends, why not enjoy coffee at its absolute best? You can for just a fraction of a penny more per cup than you'd pay for the cheapest coffee sold. Just say, Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. One thing is settled. We'll spend our vacation at some lake. Mm-hmm. Oh, before we make a definite, George, I have a letter here inviting us to spend it with the O'Briens. That's my sister Pearl and her husband. Oh, so the O'Briens want us to visit them this summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they live in a nudist camp. <laughs> a nudist camp? Yeah, that's what this letter says. See, it says, come and stay with us. We have nothing on for the summer. <laughs> That means they have nothing on their minds. Or any place else, either. 
Uh, Gracie. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I'm certainly not going to any nudist camp. They say the food is awful. <laughs> Look, Gracie, the O'Briens do not want us to visit them at a nudist camp. They do, too. My sister Pearl says right here, she says, uh, please come. This will give us a chance to see more of each other. <laughs> Forget it. We won't visit the O'Briens. I'd rather go to the Ozarks. Oh, you have some Irish relatives, too. <laughs> yeah, my hillbilly cousin, Max Ozark. Oh, I didn't know. Sammy's nephew, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, well, come on. We'll go into the travel bureau and get some folders on lake resorts. Well, this looks like a nice travel agency, George. Yeah, I'll speak to the fellow at the desk. Um, excuse me, sir. Could you recommend some nice lake resorts? How do you do? So you're planning a vacation. First, let us consider the mountains. Ah, they are breathtaking. There, one uh, fine scenic splendor Mr. here. Mr. Look, all we want to know is about some lakes. Well, I get to them later. How do you do? So you're planning a vacation. <laughs> look, look uh, I, don't want you to get, I, I, I don't want you to get to them later. Tell me about the lakes now. Oh, sorry, mister, I can't. This is the way I got the spiel memorized, and if I don't say it straight through, I get all mixed up. <laughs> How do you do? Aren't you the same man who sold us office furniture and real estate? Yeah, I got fired off of them jobs. How do you do? So you're planning a vacation. Boys, let us consider the mountain. Well, I can't understand why you got fired. Weak union. (laughs) How do you do? So you're planning a vacation. Gracie, stop interrupting the man. Mister, couldn't you possibly leave out the other stuff and get to the lakes? Well, I'll try. Um, if you prefer lakes... We can recommend, uh, uh, if you prefer, uh, how, how you do you do? <laughs> <laughs> at least, <laughs> at least speed it up. How do you do? So you're planning a vacation. Please, let's consider the mountains. Ah, oh, they are breathtaking. They are looking to sing fine. Description. Oh, if you prefer lakes, we can recommend the oh, land of the 10,000 lakes. 10,000 lakes, yes. Which are as follows. Lake Adirondack, Lake Abercrombie, Lake Allegheny. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look, wait a minute. Look uh, Abercrombie, I, are you going to name Are you going to name the 10,000 lakes? Yeah, that's part of the spiel, mister. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> Well, thank goodness we finally got reservations at Lake Louise. Now, Gracie, our train leaves tonight, so we've got to pack in a hurry. You know how long it takes us to get our clothes together. Not this time, George. This time we can pack quickly. No stopping to look for things. Gracie, mm-hmm. you... All our clothes are filed alphabetically. <laughs> oh, no. George, I don't believe you appreciate my filing system. That's an understatement. The idea of filing my clothes in this thing. Where'd you ever find these wide drawers? Oh, that's your regular underwear, dear. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> By the way, where is my underwear? It should be under you. Now, what would your underwear be doing under me? <laughs> <laughs> Not under you. Under you. George, you're nervous. <laughs> yeah, I fainted twice today. Gracie, where have you filed my underwear? Under X. Underwear? Yeah, underwear. Where have you filed it? Under X. Why? Not why, X. Look, Estella. (laughs) Why did you file my underwear under X? Well, because every time I see you in your underwear, it reminds me that you need exercise. X X for exercise. (laughs) Well, here, pack it. Yes, dear. Now, be sure to take your green and purple necktie. You'll find it under J. Why? Not why. J. Don't stop that. Why is the necktie under J? Well, who gave it to you? Your mother. Mm-hmm. And what does my mother call you? A great big... Under J, J under J. <laughs> Here it is. Oh. This looks like the same loud tie she gave my daddy one. My mother used to present my daddy with the strangest things. I know. I married one of them. <laughs> 
Now, let's get back. Come in. Hello, George and Gracie. Well, oh, thank you. Oh, we're so glad to see you. Uh, please excuse the clothes lying around. George is such a messy packer. I know, Gracie. So is John. Really? Yes, I guess husbands are the same whether you're married to George Burns or John Hall. <laughs> you're cute. <laughs> Francis, we're delighted that you're taking over the Maxwell House coffee time for the summer. But are you nervous about it? You seem scared. Oh, well, that's because on the way over here, one of those Hollywood wolves tried to pick me up. Oh, how awful. He drove along beside me and yelled things like, Hey, beautiful, and where'd you get those pretty legs? And wow, what a build, and things like that. I had to walk around your block three times. So why didn't you come in? He hadn't finished. (laughs) I see. But his car finally ran out of gas right up the street. Well, good. That'll teach him not to... Come in. Hey, George, could I borrow some gas? (laughs) Oh, so it was you. Francis, here's your wolf on the roof. Baby, why'd you run from me? I'm harmless, like the radio serial. I'm just plain Bill. Well, I'm not like the radio serial. I'm John's only wife. <laughs> oh, Mary. Yes. Yeah. Well, George, who's doing the summer show? Well, I've got a. You've got a surprise coming, Bill. This yeah. summer, Maxwell House Coffee <laughs> will be sold by the sweetest voice and the best figure in radio. Now, wait a minute, George. You promised me a vacation. <laughs> Bill. Besides, you shouldn't say I've got the best figure in radio. I'm leaving out pictures, I yes, know. Yes, you're leaving out pictures. <laughs> you know, let's try one. I was talking about Frances Langford. She's doing the summer show. She is? Oh, I see. Well, then, Franny, I better tell you about Maxwell House coffee. Now, you see, Maxwell House It's a is... wonderfully satisfying, so rich, delicious, and mellow. Yes, yes. Uh, that famous flavor it's is a result, result of... It's a result of careful selection and blending of distinctive Latin American coffees... Radiant roasted to perfection. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, and it's economical, Francis. You see, Maxwell House... is the very best in coffee-drinking pleasure, yet it costs but a fraction of a penny more per cup than the cheapest coffee you can buy. You're really telling a bell. <laughs> <laughs> well, Francis, here's something you don't know. With more than a thousand brands to choose from... More people buy and enjoy Maxwell House than any other brand of coffee in the world. Yeah. And Maxwell House is always... Well, <laughs> Maxwell House is always good, good to, to the... the last drop. <laughs> that does it. I'm getting out of here. Where are you going, Bill? I have to take singing lessons. I'll get even with her. <laughs> Go on, kids. I'll see you in September. Bye, Bill. Well, Francis, Bill may think he has the best figure in radio, but we know who has the sweetest voice. How about a song? Thanks, Gracie, but my singing starts next week. Oh, please, thanks. Just sing something. No, really, I couldn't. <laughs> well, all right, then George will sing. Okay. <laughs> oh, 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 me misbehaving all by myself. <laughs> what would you like to hear, Gracie? <laughs> oh, you see, you've changed your mind, huh? Well, anything you want to sing, Francis? I'll sing You Belong to My Heart. All right. You and you'll always belong to my
Gracie. And your command of that foreign language was amazing. I never heard such perfect Russian. <laughs> you must hear my Spanish sometimes. Oh, I'd love to. You're quite a songbird, Francis. Almost as good as George. Oh, Gracie. Don't say she's almost as good as me. She is as good. <laughs> Francis, in some ways, you and George are different. My husband will be pleased to hear that. <laughs> George, George has more power, more depth, but you're good. Would you like to hear him sing again? Uh, no, Grace, it really oh, I, I... Of course you would. Pour it on a sugar throw. <laughs> Just open the birdcage of your mouth and make this room sound like Capistrano at swallow time. <laughs> okay. For a bird to sweetly singing and perfume flowers are bringing in the winners when I just passing by. Just passing by. You're unbelievable. <laughs> Did you hear that, Francis? Yeah, just passing by. <laughs> Did you notice how easily those golden notes came sliding out? Well, they should come out easily. He flattens them first. <laughs> Oh, you do your very best this summer without him. It's a promise. Well, goodbye, George and Gracie. See you in September. Watch a lot, Francis. Goodbye. Uh, let's finish the packing. Oh, by the way, um, where are my cigars? I put them in the filing cabinet. <laughs> Again, the file. Give me the cigars, please. No, George. You've got to learn to be self-reliant. You can find them. Oh, don't tell me. Let me figure this one out myself. All right. Let's see. Cigars are made from tobacco. Tobacco grows in the South. The South was the home of Robert E. Lee. <laughs> Robert E. Lee was a general. A general is the head of an army. So you put him under A for army, right? No, that's ridiculous. <laughs> well, then where did you put them? Under C for cigars. <laughs> Again, I... It's almost time to catch our train. Has everything been taken care of? Yeah, the baggage company picked up our trunk an hour ago. I'm all dressed and ready. Oh, good. Let's get started. Did you put our train tickets and our reservation in the filing cabinet? I should say I didn't. Put George in there. They'd be safe. You and that filing system. I put them in a really safe place. Right here in my... Uh, right here in uh, the pocket of the... Uh, well, what's the matter? I put them in my coat pocket. Here. Oh, well, then get them out. It was the coat of my other suit. Oh, well, get them out of that. The other suit is in the trunk. <laughs> and the trunk? It's on its way to Lake Louise. Oh! Don't say it. Just file me on the deep for drip, that's all. Join us again next Thursday at the same time for our summer Maxwell House Coffee Show, starring Francis Langford. With Toby Reed, Carmen Dragon, and his orchestra and chorus. That's right, and we know you'll enjoy them if you listen every Thursday night. And by the way, I'd like to tell you that a new George Burns and Gracie Allen record album will be ready shortly. Oh, yes, and maybe you'll enjoy listening to it, too. Goodbye, everybody. See you in September. Good night. The George Burns and Gracie Allen show is written by Paul Henning and Keith Fowler. Good night and good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, the coffee that's always... Good to the last drop. Breakfast bother gets you down? Why the frown? Get instant Maxwell House. It's instant, it's new, it's good to the last drop, too. Yes, trust Maxwell House to make a better instant coffee. True coffee flavor, true coffee aroma, because it's all coffee made from America's favorite, the famous Maxwell House blend. And thrifty. A jar of instant Maxwell House makes fully as much as a pound of regular coffee. Get instant Maxwell House. Enjoy coffee that's instantly good to the last drop. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Good evening. This is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon. The Mercury Summer Theater of the Air.
night and every Friday night, Blended Splendid, Pat's Blue Ribbon, presents you with a front row seat at one of the greatest plays ever produced. And now is America's most famous producer, writer, director, Orson Welles. Our story tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is an original for radio by that most original of radio writers, Miss Lucille Fletcher. Its title, The Search for Henri Lefebvre. Mercedes and Cambridge will be heard as Madame Lefebvre, and so that our story may move without interruption, there'll be no between-acts intermission on this broadcast, our sponsors having very kindly omitted their usual commercial message at that time. So right now, before we get started, let's give Jim Amici a chance to say his say about... About blended, splendid, perhaps blue ribbon. Friends, as you relax in the comfort of the summer evening to enjoy Mr. Wells' exciting radio drama, I hope that right beside you... On chair, arm, or table is a tall, frosted, foam cap glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon. Believe me, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon are doing their best these thirsty days and nights to supply your dealer and thus supply you with all this truly great beer you'd like. Occasionally, conditions make this pretty difficult, but of this you can be sure. Every bottle you do get will be, as always, the happy result of blending never less than 33 fine brews into one great beer. As always, 33 fine brews blend their individual taste tones to give you that splendid flavor. Not too light, not too heavy, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with the real beer taste coming through just the way you like it. So please keep right on asking for it. It's sure worth asking for. Blended, splendid, perhaps blue ribbon. And now, Orson Welles and his own Mercury production of the search for Henri Lefebvre. I had just set down the last note on paper. Do you know what it is to write a piece? The agony, the drudgery, the exultation. To rest the thought out of the drab days of rain. To hear music in one's head. While outside the drizzle patters down and the heads of the mountains are shrouded in mist. And then, one morning it comes. It is spring in the branches outside the window. The mountains glitter. The air is blue and bright. And the melody comes into your heart and nestles close as though it had always been there. A fever consumes you. Hours melt away at the piano. Time people mean nothing. The world revolves around this rocking song. This tender magic. There are no terrors. Save to break the spell. So it was with this piece. I had just set down the last note on paper... I was happy and weary and full of peace. I lay down on the sofa to relax before Miss Warren brought in my supper. There is a radio near the couch. That night, I turned it on. It was it. upon me sometimes out of the shadows like an animal thing. It grimaces at me from the corner of my room. But this time it was upon me. It was in my brain. For that music on the radio playing now was the music I had just set down on paper. Miss Warren! Miss Warren! Miss yes, Warren! Mr. Come here, listen to this thing. You hear it, don't you? That is real music playing. Yes, sir, the radio's playing real music. It is not an illusion. An hallucination of some kind in my own brain. Oh, of course it's real music. And very pretty, too. Pretty? Oh, you don't like it? We'll turn it off. No, no, then. leave it alone. Listen to it. Sit there beside the radio. I'll get it for you. What, sir? My score, my score. Here. Here, look at it. Note for note, even as they play. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Flynn. I can't read music. I don't understand. Perhaps someone in this building has heard me playing, but... No, no, the orchestration is the same. The orchestration is a secret, quiet thing that one does alone. 
Perhaps they've stolen the score or someone has copied it. But I only finished it this afternoon. It has been here in this drawer and on the piano. Unless... Unless someone else... There is someone else. Someone like me with my brain. My soul. My genius. A kind of... Double. Kind of... Double. It's over now, sir. Do you want me to turn it off? No, no. No, no, see what they announce. See what they dare to say. You have been listening to the elegy for Orchestra Opus 42 by Henri Lefebvre. This concludes... Henri Lefebvre. Henri Lefebvre. Huh? Huh? Henri Lefebvre. After she left, I sat there staring at the freshly written pages. My brain was reeling. It was my music. Every little note, every turn of phrase. The silent radio faced me like a mocking, sardonic sphinx. Adolphus, my good fellow. Oh, Picard. Excuse me, old friend. Miss Warren, did you call the broadcasting station? Yes, sir. And what did they say? Calm yourself, what my dear What did they fellow. say, they Miss said... Warren? Oh. Oh, Mr. Picard, I'm afraid. They said, Adolphus, that it was composed by this Henri Lefebvre. An old piece. He wrote it nearly 15 years Fif- ago. 15 years ago? But I finished it today. If, if I'd remembered it, Picard, even in my own subconscious, it would have flowed out like a dream, but I had to struggle. Look at these erasures and these cuts, this colder. Mm. And you say it was exactly this way on the radio? Exactly, as though they had copied out the parts in the twinkling of an eye and an orchestra was reading my score. Oh, very strange. The man either still... stole my piece somehow or... Well, sir, some terrible coincidence, some simultaneous crooked streak of identical inspiration that leaped across the Such world. things don't happen. Fifteen... Fifteen years ago, they said. Fifteen years ago, he set it down. And finally, like a a wave traveling slowly across a boundless ocean, it came to me. Adolphus. Who is this Henri Lefebvre? He was a rather famous composer. What's happened to him? Is he still alive? I don't know, Adolphus. I'm not a musician. But could you find out for me soon? I suppose I could, but do you really think it wise? What good would it do you to see this man, this perfect stranger? I must confront him, do you hear? There is some horrible linkage between this man and myself, some string vibrating in his brain, which has caused a like vibration in my own. I must find him. I must somehow break the spell. And supposing this Henri Lefebvre is dead? Dead or alive. I I, I must find him. I must find him, Picard. I must find him. Henri Lefebvre, born 1885, Rouen, France. Rouen, France. Educated at the École Normale. École Normale. Fellowship student in composition, the Paris Conservatoire. Paris Conservatoire. One Prix de Rome, 1908. Do you want me to go on, Mr. Flynn? No, 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 Miss Warren. These dictionaries tell you nothing. They make everything smell of dust. Dust and corruption. Adolphus. Oh, Picard. I have a letter from his publishers. He's still alive. Thank God. But there's some mystery about him. They wouldn't give me his present address. What do you mean? They say they haven't heard from him in ten years. His musical output has ceased. He submits nothing, doesn't answer their letters. Then how do they know he's still alive? Well, they hear occasionally from Madame Lefebvre. Madame Lefebvre. He has a wife who lives in Rouen. Madame Lefebvre. Rouen. Word came at last from the Red Cross. Home of Henri Lefebvre in Rouen, destroyed by bombs. Whereabouts of composer and Madame Lefebvre, unknown. He's alive, I tell you, he's alive. Oh, what if they were dead, I would not feel it. I would be free. But I cannot take up my pen, I cannot write, I cannot even think one thought 
without wondering whether it may not already be his. How can you think such things, Adolphus? This poor, hounded, homeless man is probably ill, old, dying. Even, even dying is reached out a hand to clutch away my genius. Picard was I ever lazy. My musical outfit has been enormous. Symphonies, operas, tone poems, songs. Now what do I do all day long? I stand at my window and stare out at the mountains. And at night, I am tortured by visions. Vision? Nightmares. Nightmares. Nightmares of crooked foreign streets and church steeples and bells. Bells. Run by clockwork, the bells are tolling the hours. I dream of rooms, dark, ugly little rooms, and a little girl. Yes, a little girl. With long, honey colored hair. Who cries. Who cries. You have been reading too much, Adolphus. Your brain. No, 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 don't you understand? These streets, these rooms, that little girl. It is his life of which I am dreaming. It is Rouen. You think me mad, don't you, Picard? Mr. Picard? Yes? There's a lady downstairs to see Mr. Flynn. A lady? She says she heard that Mr. Flynn was making some inquiries about her husband. Madame Lefebvre. Adolphus. Madame Lefebvre, bring her up. Bring her up at once. I stood quite motionless in the center of the room. A woman dressed in black confronted me across the waste of polished floor. She was thin, middle-aged, a little stooped. Her pale eyes looked washed out with crying. Yet there was another look in them. A look of some drowned and monstrous terror. I am Cecile Lafevre. I have heard that you are searching for my husband. Yes, madame. Why do you wish to see him? Why do I wish to see him? <laughs> You have not heard of my strange predicament, madame. And what of your husband? My husband remained in Switzerland. Switzerland? He has lived there for many years. That's why I thought they said your home was in Rouen. Rouen was my home. My husband and I have been estranged for the last ten years. Oh. You, you've not seen him for ten years. Do you know his opus 42, his elegy for orchestra? I do. When did he write it, please? About 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Then you would know the music when you see it. Is this the piece, madame? Yes. I wrote this music, madame, a month ago, out of my own head. Impossible, monsieur. Impossible, but I tell you, it is so. But how could this be? This is my husband. I remember the night he wrote it. A hot midsummer night. The windows were open. We could hear the bells of Rouen ringing the hour. He could not sleep. Our little daughter had been crying. Your, your little daughter? He rose from his bed saying that his head ached. A little while later, I heard the piano begin to play softly. I called down to him and warned him not to waken Louise. Louise. Our little daughter, who Louise. had been crying. Yes, then I fell asleep. Next morning when I woke up, the bed was empty. He was downstairs at the piano writing out the final chords. Go on. He said it was her piece. It belonged to Louis. And that he had been thinking of her crying all the time he set it down. It was as though all the sadness that was in his love for her had gone into that melody. Sadness, but... I still don't understand. I wrote this music out of beauty, out of and wind and bird song and joy. My husband used to say this piece held in its heart all the horror of life. Horror? He could never understand why it was so popular. He did not want to publish it. He hid it away saying it was like a premonition that it had come to him from some 
some other world like a hideous omen from another world. And he was right, monsieur. How do you mean? Our little daughter, Louise. She died a little while later. Madame Lafayette. Yes, monsieur. I beg your pardon for crying. I do not want to see your husband or hear this music ever again. My search is ended. Do you believe in ghosts, madame? No. I have been through too much to believe in poor, sad ghosts. Oh, but I, I do. I believe that neither your husband nor myself wrote that piece. There is some further horror. Some demon force at work in this music. It captured him. It has captured me. I do not know. My husband was always a wretched, melancholy man. Tell me, Madame Lefebvre, did your husband write any music after he wrote this piece? Not much more. You mean it wrecked his brain as it has wrecked mine, leaving him without inspiration? No, no, it was not that. He continued to write. He still writes, but nothing he has written for ten years has had any meaning. What do you mean? Mr. Flynn, have you not already guessed the truth? My husband has gone mad. He mad. has been mad for the last ten years, shot up in an asylum in Switzerland. Oh. I have told this to very few people. It is a form of horrible neurosis. Work neurosis, the doctors call it. He seems to have lost his heart. The events of his past life are meaningless to him. He has forgotten Rua. He has forgotten me. He has forgotten our little dead Louise. Oh, how terrible. Now he sits in a bare room and writes music all day long. He has become a slave, a machine. They tell me that his shelf is packed with scores, but all of them are only an endless jumble of notes, notes such as a child might scrawl across a paper. And, 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 and it was the music, the ghost music that did this. Who knows? Mm. Terrible things happen. The mind snaps. Terrible. If I told you I should betray my husband, I should tell you something which has never passed my lips till now. But you, you, you must tell me, you... Do you not see how vitally important it is to me? I am linked somehow with your husband. And perhaps I too am destined to, to to go mad. No, no, monsieur, you must not think such things. There were the seeds of madness in this thing, even from the beginning. There was something uncanny. Why should that radio play that music just after I had finished the piece? Why should you... You, a perfect stranger, have come here and found me. Mr. Flynn, believe me, people do not go mad so easily. To be destroyed as my husband was destroyed. One must have deep sadnesses and love. One must have human ties, a wife, a beautiful little child. You have no such ties, have you? No ties. I have no ties. My husband went mad because he loved too much. When our little Louise died, he thought that he had killed her. She died of simple pneumonia, but he could never understand that. He became insane with grief. He thought he was her murderer. Don't you see, Mr. Flynn, you who live here alone, whose life is so quiet. Madam. Madame Lefebvre. I beg your pardon. I have seen you before, Madame Lefebvre. I, I have met you somewhere. I have heard your story. You have come here before. No, I have never come here before. Then... Then why should your face seem so suddenly familiar and your words? There's something uncanny about this thing, madame. For a... Mo for... A for a moment, I thought I knew. You knew what? I thought I knew you and your husband and Louise. Who is? I thought I had... I'd lived. <laughs> Maybe it was only one of my nightmares, but somehow... I try to remember. Please. Remember. Remember. The little house in the wild, hmm? the stone house, the tree in the garden, the coffee on Sunday afternoon, the Beckstein piano by the window, the bedroom with the calico curtain, the little... The little doll carriage underneath the stairs. Louise's dark carriage. <laughs> Louise. Louise. Bobby. What have they done to her? 
They have taken her away and I killed her. Her little doll carriage waits at the bottom of the stairs. But she'll never come back. Never come back. No, no, no. She has been dead for ten years. You must not think of her anymore. No, no, no. You are getting better now. Dr. Picard says you are getting Doctor. better. Doctor. Doctor Picard. Your doctor, darling. What are you talking about? I have no doctor. Don't you see? Don't you see, my darling? Your long search is over. No. You are on real affairs. Oh. And your own music has come back to you at last. And little by little, it will all come back. Uh-huh. Your memories, your genius. You will be able to go out into the world again. I... I am on real affairs. Yes, yes. darling. I... <laughs> I... <laughs> It's the little old madman. No. I locked up in the walls of a lunatic asylum for ten years, writing a jumble of notes like a little... little child. Then... Who? Who is Adolphus Flynn? A name you made up, my darling. A poor mad name. My symphonies are rubbish, you say. My adoring public are only... Shadows running across the walls. And these mountains beyond my window, these mountains. <laughs> you are lying to me! I, I tell you my name is Adolphus Look, Lynn. Sorry, look! This room, these bare white walls, these bars across the window, this door one cannot open from the inside. For ten years, aren't we? For ten years I have waited for a glimmer to come for some little memory like that music. For ten years I have prayed for, for you every day. For ten years. Ten years what I said here. I, I do not believe it. Not to be God. Henri, my dear fellow. You call me Henri too? I cannot tell you how happy I am, Madame Lefebvre. The experiment has worked beyond our fondest hope. He can't. And... Am, am, am I Henri Lefebvre? Yes. I have been mad for ten years. You deceived me for ten years. Not deceived you, my dear fellow. We only humored your whims, hoping that you'd snap back someday. It was your whim to think that you were a composer named Adolphus Flynn. Your whim to sign your name to all these scores. Your whim to live utterly alone and work all day and half the night. You were quite happy until one day a little piece you'd composed for your daughter long ago came back into your mind. Memory began again. You began the search for your lost self. Naturally, after ten years, one cannot be cured overnight. But you will see, in a few months, we may hope for something quite remarkable. Monsieur and Madame Lefebvre. In a few months. In a few months. In a few months. In a few months, I would be able to go back. I would... I would take up the threads of my old life as only the fed. I'm still here. Here in this room... With its bare white walls and its door that locks from the outside. <laughs> I'm still here. Although I know now for sure that man, that man, that my name is Henri Lefebvre. <laughs> the sadness. It's in my heart. An unutterable sadness and pain that I can never conquer. Rouen has come back. The stone house. The little doll carriage underneath the stairs. And my arms ache with a longing for a little dead child. With long... 
honey-colored hair. <sighs> there is no music in me now. No music save that one tune which sings in my head all day long. My song for Louise. If I could only get it out of my mind, I might be able to work again. I might be happy. <laughs> as, 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 I, as I once was happy. I might look out of my window and find a symphony and a sunset on the mountains. That is why I will not go back. I will not leave this room. I will not leave this room until I find him again. Until I find Adolphus Finn. Just heard Orson Welles' Mercury production of The Search for Henri Lefebvre, a radio play by Lucille Fletcher. Mr. Wells will be back in just a few seconds to tell you about next week's offering of the Mercury Summer Theater. But first, a few words from our sponsors on a very important subject. The makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon are holding their prices at the levels established by OPA last month. Also, ever since government price control ended... They have urgently counseled each household distributor of Pabst Blue Ribbon throughout the country to do likewise. Further, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon strongly urge beer retailers all over the country to do the same. For we believe it's up to all of us to do our utmost in the battle against inflation. And now, Mr. Wells. Well, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we're bringing you... The first radio show we ever put on the air for CBS. We haven't done it since. We look back at it fondly. We hope our memories uh, aren't mistaken. We hope you'll enjoy it. It's a great favorite of everybody's childhood, and I don't think anybody ever outgrows it. The Great Tale of Adventure by Robert Louis Stevenson, Treasure Island. So join us next week, please, same time, same station. Until then, speaking for my sponsors, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, and for the whole Mercury Theater, including, as usual, maestro Bernard Herman, who was responsible, as usual, for the music on tonight's show, and speaking for Mercedes in Cambridge, who was responsible for a very fine performance of Madame Lefebvre. For the whole gang, I remain, as always, obediently yours. <laughs> came to you through the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, makers of blended splendor, Pabst Blue Ribbon. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. enjoy best plays. But first, they invented radio, developed color TV, and are responsible for two-dimension motion pictures for nervous people who faint from fright in three-dimension movies. Who are they? Why, Bob and Ray, of course. And every weekday night, you'll enjoy their antics over these stations. The boys join such other great weekday shows as Bob Hope, Dave Garraway, One Man's Family, and NBC's award-winning News of the World. Yes, each weekday, NBC brings you the best in music, comedy, drama, and news. 
Now it's Best Plays on NBC. From New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays with John Chapman. drama selected from the outstanding successes of the New York stage. Now, John Chapman, drama critic of the New York Daily News, is here to introduce Geraldine Page and Richard Kiley in Summer and Smoke by Tennessee Williams. <laughs> Mr. Chapman. Thank you. Our play has had an interesting career. Summer and Smoke was first produced by Margot Jones in her Theater in the Round in Dallas. Then she brought it up to Broadway, where it had a moderate run of 100 performances. Later, this work by Tennessee Williams went back to another Theater in the Round in Greenwich Village, where it had an amazing run of one year. Much of this new success was due to the acting. An unheard of young woman, Geraldine Page, was giving a luminous performance as the maidenly music teacher. Later this season, Miss Page came uptown into a comedy titled Midsummer, and the professional Broadwayites, uh, Broadwayites hailed her as a new star. This week, a poll of drama critics put her in a tie with Oscar-winning Shirley Booth as the season's best actress. So, now we're going to have what I might call a theater-in-the-ear performance of Summer and Smoke, and we're happy to have Miss Page in our company. Happy, too, to have Richard Kiley as young Dr. John Buchanan. Imagine now that we're in the fancifully named town of Glorious Hill, Mississippi. Here we first encounter a Mrs. Bassett, who is a town gossip. Mrs. Bassett, what do you know? I'll tell you, somebody used to have a pretty voice, and that was Miss Alma Winemiller. Of course, she doesn't sing anymore, but back before the First World War, in all of Glorious Hill, Mississippi, there was nobody could sing like Miss Alma. I remember one Fourth of July, she sang at a band concert they had down at the park. Kind of nervous little thing, Miss Alma was. Remember that day after she finished singing, how scared she looked when she came off the stage and looked around for her father and that poor old mother of hers. Here we are, Alma. Where is ice cream, man? Her mother, Hustler. Alma, here we are over here. Oh, Father, my fingers have just frozen stiff. Oh, I don't know what came over me. Absolute panic. Oh, never, never, never again. As long as I live, it isn't worth it. The talk that I go through. You're having one of your nervous attacks. Oh, my heart's beating so. It seems to be in my throat the whole time. Was it, was it noticeable, Father? You sang extremely well, Alma. <sighs> But you know how I feel about your singing in public. Well, I don't see how anybody could object to my singing at a patriotic occasion. Where is the ice cream man? Uh, Mother, there isn't any ice cream man. No, 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 there isn't any ice cream man, Mother. But on the way home, I will stop by the drugstore and pick up a pint of ice cream. Well, Mother, uh, we'll run along now. Uh, Don't stay out late, daughter. No, Father. Uh, This way, this way, Mother. Come along. Strawberry, Alma. Chocolate? Mm -hmm. Chocolate and strawberry, Miss. All right. Not vanilla. Yes, yes, Mother. Vanilla. Evening, Miss Alma. Oh, good evening. I enjoyed your singing. Why, thank you. Uh, Are you home for the summer? Yes. Are you planning to stay here and take over some of your father's medical practice? I haven't made up my mind about anything yet. Oh, I hope so. (laughs) I mean, we all all hope so. Your father is so proud of you and so pleased over your accomplishments. The last time I was in his office, you should have heard him singing your praises, telling me how you graduated magna cum laude from Johns Hopkins. Uh, That's in Boston, isn't it? Baltimore. Oh, Baltimore. Baltimore, man. Well, it's such a beautiful combination of names. And uh, I've been told that Johns Hopkins is the finest medical school in the world, practically. Oh, it must be a great satisfaction to you to be standing on the threshold of a career in such a noble profession as I think medicine is. <laughs> I didn't know you had such a high regard for the medical profession. <laughs> well, I am a great admirer of your father's as well as a patient. And, oh, it's such comfort knowing that he's right next door, almost within arm's reach, as it were. <laughs> Why, do you have fits? <laughs> fits? Well, no, no. Oh, but I uh, do have attacks <laughs> of our nervous heart trouble, which seems so alarming that I run straight to your father 
And he always reassures me. <laughs> you know the trouble with you, Miss Elm. Hmm? It isn't nervous heart trouble at all. Well, what is it, Bev? You have a doppelganger. Oh, my goodness. And the doppelganger is badly irritated. An irritated doppelganger? Mm-hmm. Oh, for that sound. Well, I shouldn't have said anything. I'm not your doctor. <laughs> Who's that? Well, I'm surprised that you don't know. I've been away quite a while. Well, that is the Gonzales girl. Mm-hmm. Her father is the owner of the gambling casino on Moon Lake. <laughs> well, what can she be laughing about? Maybe she thinks we're funny. I hope that you have a strong character. Solid rock. Mm-hmm. The uh, pyrotechnical display is blazing fine. The what? The fireworks. Oh. oh. Uh, I suppose you've lost touch with most of your old friends here? Yeah. Well, you must make some new ones. Now, uh, I belong to a little group that meets every Wednesday, and, oh, I do think you would enjoy them, too. They are young people with intellectual interests. Oh, I see. You must come. Uh, sometime. I'll remind you of it. Thanks. Good bye, Nellie. Bye. Oh, well, now, here comes one of my adorable little vocal people. She's the youngest one and the prettiest one with the least gift for music. Oh, I know that one. Hello there, Nellie dear. Oh, Miss Alma, <laughs> you were so beautiful and made me cry. Oh, now, it's sweet of you to kiss her, but I thank her. <laughs> You're just being modest, Miss oh. Alma. Hello, Dr. George. Hello. Uh, that book you gave me is too full of long words. Look them up in the dictionary, Nellie. I did, but you know how dictionaries are. You look up one long word, it gives you another. You look up that one, it gives you the long word you looked up in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming over tomorrow for you to explain it all to me. Good night. Good night, Good night Nellie. Nellie. Well, what book was she talking about? Oh, a book I gave her about, about the facts of nature. Oh. She came over to the office and told me her mother wouldn't tell her anything, and she had to know because she's fallen in love. <laughs> well, well, Cautious little Eob. Hmm. What sort of mother has she? Oh, Mrs. Ewell is the merry widow of Gloria Hill. They say that she goes to the depot to meet every train in order to make the acquaintance of the traveling salesman. <laughs> <clears throat> Why do you laugh that way? <laughs> what way? <laughs> that way. <laughs> oh, well, now I do declare you haven't changed in the slightest. It used to delight you to embarrass me, and it's still dark. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't tell you this, but I heard an imitation of you at a party. I? Mm-hmm. I? Well, what did they imitate? You singing the voice that breathes or Eden at a wedding. Well, how mystifying. Oh, well, I shouldn't have told you. You're upset about it. No, 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 I'm not in the least upset. I'm just mystified. I'm always mystified by unprovoked malice in people. You know, I wonder... If these people who do these unkind imitations of me ever stop to think that I've had certain difficulties to cope with, which may be partly the cause of these uh, peculiarities of mine, which they find so often. Don't they know that my father and I have had a certain cross to bear? You mean your mother? Well, she had her breakdown while I was still in high school. And from that time on, I've had to manage the rectory and uh, take over the duties that would ordinarily belong to a minister's wife, not his daughter. And I, well, that may have made me seem strange to some of my more critical contemporaries. Well, in a way, it may have deprived me of my youth. Let her go out with young people. <laughs> I am not a recluse. Oh, it's true I don't go flying around here and there giving unkind imitations of other people at parties. Being a minister's daughter, I have to be more selective than most girls about the society I keep, but I do go out now and then. Well, I've seen you out, but always with somebody like this Roger Doremus. Oh, you may feel that you can speak that way. After all, you were born with surgeon's fingers. You have a chance to serve humanity. But what do you do about it? Everything you can to alienate the confidence of nice people who love and respect your father. Driving your automobile with a reckless speed from one disorderly roadhouse to another. Well, what are you thinking of, John? You, be, you behave like an overgrown schoolboy, once known as the wildest fellow in town. And I call that, I call it a desecration. Miss Alma, you know that I really like you. Oh, no. No, you don't. Sure. A lot. How'd you like to go riding? In your automobile? Uh-huh. Well, would, uh, would you uh, observe the speed limit? Oh, strictly with you, Miss Alma. Why, why then, I'd be glad to. 
John. Golly Moses. Oh, my apple. Well, hello, Roger. Well, how'd it go, Miss Alma? Uh, how did what go? Well, my solo on the baritone horn. Oh, I paid no attention to it. Oh. Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Doremus, uh, this is Dr. John Buchanan, Jr. Oh. How to do, I'm sure. Well? And Dr. Buchanan has just graduated magna cum laude from Johns Hopkins University. Oh, uh, that's New York, isn't it? Baltimore. <laughs> oh, there's that awful Gonzalez girl. Such a raucous laugh. Yes, indeed. I think we'd better go. Um, John, will you walk back with us to the rectory? Mm. Oh, I, I think I'll just stick around here, thanks. Oh, well, good night, then. Uh, good night. Uh, good night. Na- Miss Alma, I would put you above that kind of thing. What kind of thing? Looking back to see what those two are doing. Uh, what are they doing? He's gone over to her. Well, maybe he knows her. Well, he didn't. He does now. They're walking their way together. <laughs> I guess if anybody really knew Miss Alma, it was old Dr. Buchanan, young John's father. He was the best doctor we ever had in this community, and everybody thought the world and all of him. People would just drop in and talk to him whether they were sick or not, especially Miss Alma. Doctor, I don't think I will be able to get through the summer. Oh, you get through it, Alma. How? How, Dr. John? Well, one day you'll come after another, and one night you'll come after another. Till the sooner or later, the summer will be all through with. And then it'll be fall, and you'll be saying, I don't see how I'm going to get through the fall. Mm-hmm. Dr. John, there is someone who wants me to marry him. Who is the young man, Miss Alma? His name is Roger Dorena. Oh. Well, why do you say that? Now, please say what you think. Well, I think he's a very nice young man. Well, then what is your specific objection to him? Uh, what are yours? Well, I have none. Then what are we talking about, Miss Alma? Well, my objection to him is just that I... Well, I don't love him, and I cannot imagine myself... Making uh... love to him. Oh, Dr. John. Well? Well, yes, I suppose that's it. Oh, Dr. John, suppose I get left high and dry with no one, nobody. Now, look here, Miss Alma. You've got to ask yourself whether or not the physical side of marriage means anything to you. A gentlemanly fella, abstemious and easygoing, is all some women look for. On the other hand, there are some women who want to love and be loved with passion. Now, which are you? Well, I believe in the possibility of a deep love between a man and a woman. Good. A physical love? Well, with me, it cannot be based on a physical passion. I think a very term is somewhat unpleasant. Uh, forgive me for using it. But uh, naturally, marriage leads to our contact and embraces. Yes. And I just don't see how I ever could with Roger. Well, it even offends me when he touches my hand in in spite of all the respect that I do have for him, and even affection. Has and... anyone ever touched you? I mean your hand, without creating this uh, distasteful feeling. Oh, yes. I'm not a cold person. Johnny! Johnny! Oh, where is John? I haven't seen him lately. The last I heard, my son was taking part in what is called a floating crap game. Well, when do you expect him back? When he has lost his shirt, socks, and tie, and the belt to his trousers. Well, when he comes back, uh, I wish you would remind him of something to me. All about a month ago, he said that he would take me riding some afternoon in his uh, automobile, but he seems to have forgotten all about it. Well, I'm afraid you have to remind him yourself. When he comes back, he'll find his belongings moved to the Alhambra Hotel. There's no place in my house for wasters, drunkards, and lecherers. Oh, now, why do you say lecherers? He spends his nights at the Gonzales place out on the lake. He isn't fit for you to associate with, Alma, as your father told you a long now, time ago. Now, now, you have got to be patient with him because he is young and he's confused. Yes, he 
We've all of us got to be patient, at least until the end of summer. And if we can go that far, well, then we can go much further. And somewhere, sometime, there must be some revelation. A visit of some angel to straighten things up for us. <laughs> How will we know this angel, Miss Alma? John. <laughs> Hello, Dad. You will find your things at the Alhambra Hotel. That's the way you want it. Oh, don't you be too severe with him. Go upstairs and wash and shave and put on a clean shirt of mine. Okay, that's the way you want it. Infernal whelp. Hello? Oh, John! Miss Alma? Uh, I have a bone to pick with you, sir. Well, at the time of our last conversation on the uh, 4th of July, well, you said you were going to take me riding in your automobile. Oh, I say that? Oh, yes, indeed you did, sir. And all these hot afternoons I have been breathlessly waiting and hoping that you would remember that promise. But uh, what I was really calling you about is, is, do you remember my mentioning that little club that I belong to? Oh, yes, Oh, now, 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 don't you call it that. It's just a little informal gathering. And uh, we talk about the new books and uh, read things out loud to each other. Is this an invitation? Oh, well, didn't I promise that I would ask you? And uh, it's going to be tonight at uh, 8 in my house at the rectory, so all you have to do is cross the yard. <laughs> I'll try to make it, Miss Alma. Oh, don't say try, so it requires some Herculean effort. All you have to do is cross the yard. Oh, excuse me, Miss Alma, but Dad's got to use this phone. No, 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 no. I will not hang up until you said you will come without fail. All right, Miss Alma. I'll be there. You can count on it. Hello, Miss Alma. Oh, Nellie, no. where did you come from? <laughs> oh, Miss Alma, something marvelous has happened. And what is that, Nellie? Well, you know about Mother. How mm -hmm. I was brought up so nobody nice except you would have anything to do with me. Mother's meeting all the trains to pick up traveling salesmen and bring them home to drink and play poker. All of them acting like pigs. Pigs, pigs! Oh, Nellie. Well, I thought I'd always hate men, loathe and despise them. But last night, well, I'd heard them downstairs for hours, but didn't know who it was. When all of a sudden, my door banged open. <laughs> you thought it was the bathroom. No, Nellie, I'm not sure I want to hear any more of this story. Guess who it was? Well, I couldn't possibly guess. The wonderfulest person in all the big, wide world. When he saw it was me, he came and sat down on the bed and held my hand. And we talked and talked until Mother came up to see what had happened. You should have heard him bawl her out. He said she ought to send me to a girl's school because she wasn't fit to bring up a daughter. <laughs> then she started to bawl him out. You're a fine one to talk, she said. You're not fit to call yourself a doctor. John Buchanan was with your mother? Oh, he wasn't her beau. He had a girl with him. The mother had somebody else. Who did he have? Oh, some loud, tacky thing with a, a V in her name. Gonzalez. Rosa Gonzalez? Yes, that was it. <gasps> but him. Oh, Miss Alma. He's a wonderful... No, your mother was right. He's right. he not fit to call himself a doctor. Now, I hate to disillusion you, Nellie, but this most wonderful person is pitiably weak. Daddy! Someone's calling him. Daddy! Yes, they out his name in front of his house is such a character that the old doctor cannot permit them to come inside the door. All the gifts of the gods were showered on that young man. Yay! And all he cares about is indulging his senses. Here he comes down the steps. Look. Now he come away from that window. <gasps> Look at him jump. Oh, Over the banister. Now don't lean out the window and have us caught spying. Oh, you didn't show Nellie how you spy on him. Mother. Oh, she's a good one at spy. Well, you go back to She stands behind the curtain and peeks around. Oh, but whenever he comes in at night, she rushes downstairs to watch him out the window. <laughs> Sometimes she sits oh. down here and waits until he oh, comes my. home. Just sits and waits and watches. Oh, oh Miss in love with him. That's Mother, be still. Well, uh, Nellie, will you please go? All right, Miss Alma, I'm going. Good night, Mrs. Wynella. Good night, Miss Alma. Mother, 
If ever I hear you say such a thing again, if ever you dare to repeat such a thing in my presence or anyone else's, then it will just be the last straw. No, oh, yes, you act like a child, but you have a devil in you. And God will punish you. Yes, and I'll punish you too. I'll take away your cigarettes from you. I'll give you no more. I'll give you no more ice cream either because I am tired of your malice. I am tired of your malice and your self-indulgence. People wonder why I am tied down here. <laughs> they pity me, thinking me as an old maid already. And I'm young. I am still young. Well, it's just you. You have taken my youth away from me. <laughs> oh, now listen here. Don't you ever dare to tell a disgusting lie about me to that girl or anybody else. <laughs> Everybody noticed the change that came over Miss Alma that summer. The first chance I had to notice it was the night we had our regular monthly literary meeting. Miss Alma had promised us a surprise visitor, and sure enough, she had one. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies, um, before we begin our meeting tonight, I would like to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. John Buchanan. Hello, everybody. Well, now, we are all completely assembled. And I believe the first item on the agenda for this evening is... Vernon has his birth plate with him tonight. Oh, well, we decided to put that off to colder weather. Yes. Uh, Miss Alma is supposed to read us a paper tonight on William Blake. <laughs> Those dead poets can keep. Oh, yeah. well, no. Mrs. Bassett, everybody. Now, this is the way I feel about the verse play. Now, it is much too important a thing to be read under any but the most ideal circumstances. I mean, not only our atmospheric, on some cool evening, with music planned to go with it. Now, why don't we just have the paper on Blake, and then we can talk... Insane, insane. That man was a mad fanatic. Now, Mrs. Bass... I've been up on him, and I know what I'm talking about. He traveled around with that Frenchman who fired a gun at him in a drunken stupor, oh, no. and later one of them died of TB in a gutter. Oh, oh no. All right, all right. I'm finished. I won't say anything more. But why was your paper, Miss Alma? If, uh, if you... What's the matter, John? Uh, if you folks will excuse me, I'm afraid I have to leave you. I have to call on a patient. Oh, well, 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 that's too bad. Well, uh, wait, I'll, I will come to the door with you. Oh, no, that's all right, Miss Alma. I'll let myself out. Uh, good night, everybody. Shall we go on uh, with the meeting? I bet I know who the patient was. That Gonzalez girl, whose father owns Moon Lake Casino and goes everywhere with a pistol strapped on herself. John Buchanan will get himself shot in that car. Why, Mrs. Bassett, what gave you such an idea? I don't think John even knows that Gonzalez girl. Mm, those are all right, in the biblical sense of the word, if you'll excuse me. No, I will not excuse you. A thing like that is inexcusable. I think Miss Alma has fallen for the young doctor. They tell me he has lots of new lady pages. You stop that. I won't have malicious talk here. You know you drove him away from this meeting. After I bragged so much about how bright and interesting you all were, you put your worst foot forward, you simpered, you chattered, and carried on like idiots. Idiots! Oh, go oh, away! All of you, go home! Go home. Father, would you tell me what time it is, please? Five of eight. I'm working on my sermon. Well, why don't you work in the study? The study is suffocating. So don't disturb me. Father, would there be any chance of getting Mother upstairs if anyone should call? Are you expecting a call? No, 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 I'm not expecting it. Just a chance of it. That boy next door is coming to see us. That's who's coming to see us. You can't be serious, Alma. He asked me if he might, and I said yes, if he wished to. But it's now after eight, so it doesn't look like he's coming after all. If he does come, you will go upstairs to your room. And I will receive him. If he does come, I will do no such thing, Father. I will receive him myself. I don't judge people by the tongues of gossip. I happen to know that he has been grossly misjudged and misrepresented by a lot of old busybodies who are envious of his youth and his brilliance and his charm. You're not out of your senses. Then I'm out of mine. I dare say we are all a bit peculiar, Father. 
And I have had one almost insufferable cross to bear. Insufferable cross to stop your windbag, mother. And perhaps I can bear another. But if you think I'm retiring to my study when this young man comes, probably with a whiskey bottle in one hand and a pair of dice in the other, you have another thing coming. Very well, then. I'll wait outside and meet him there if he comes at all. Very well. Have you lost your mind? Oh, no, Father. I think I just found it. Alma, come back here. Alma. I don't understand why we have to sit out here in the arbor. Why can't we go into the casino? I am a minister's daughter. That's no reason. We do have doctor. That's a better reason. We can't afford to be seen. And that makes any more than I can last hey, year. Dusty. Hey, Dusty. Yes, sir. Bottle of vino rosa. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. What you got there? Some sleeping tablets our father gave me. I need one. You want to turn into a dope fiend taking that stuff? I need one. I feel faint. Well, stop swallowing air. You'll get over it. Here you are, sir. I'll put it on the tab, Dusty. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, when does the, when's the cockfight start, Dusty? Oh, about 10 o'clock, Dr. Johnny. When does the what start? Well, they have a cockfight here every Saturday night. That's what we came for. I didn't think such exhibitions were legal. This is Moon Lake Casino, where anything goes. You are a frequent patron? I'd say constant. I'm afraid you must be serious about giving up your medical career. You bet I'm serious about it. Doctor's life is walled in by sickness and misery and death. May I be so presumptuous as to inquire what you will do when you quit? Well, I've been thinking of South America later. I've heard that cantinas are lots more fun than saloons. And senoritas are caviar among females. Those Latins all dream in the sun and indulge their senses. You know who's crowned with most of the glory on this earth? The one who uses his senses to get all he can in the way of satisfaction. Self-satisfaction? What other kind is it? Oh, oh, I will answer that question by asking you one. Have you ever seen a picture of a Gothic cathedral? What about it? How everything reaches up. How everything seems to be straining for something out of the reach of Stone or human fingers, the immense uh, stained glass windows and the great arched doors that are five or six times the height of the tallest man and the vaulted ceiling, and all those little delicate spires, they are all, all reaching up to something beyond attainment. And to me, that is the secret. That is the principal fact of existence, that everlasting struggle and uh, aspiration for more than our human limits to place within our reach. Oh, no. Who was it said that? Um, <clears throat> uh, all of us are in the gutter, but some of us are looking at stars. <laughs> Mr. Oscar Wilde. Oh, well, regardless of who said it, it is still true. You know, I've only gone out with three young men at all, seriously. And with each one, there was a desert between us. Wide, wide stretches of uninhabitable ground. Of course, none of them ever engaged my serious feelings. You, uh, you do have serious feelings of that kind. Well, doesn't everyone sometimes? Some women are cold. Some women are what is called frigid. Do I get that impression? Under the surface, you have a lot of excitement. A great deal more than any other woman I met. Well, of course, the soul. Oh, of the any... soul again. Gothic cathedrals. Your name is Alma, and Alma is Spanish for soul. You know, sometime I'd like to show you a chart of the human anatomy I have in the office. It shows what our insides are like. And maybe you can show me where the beautiful soul is located on that chart. <laughs> Oh, well, come on. The talk by started. Let's go watch. No. I know something else we could do. Oh, I had heard that you made suggestions like that for girls to go out with, but I was too believe that such stories were true. What made you think that I might be amenable to such a suggestion? That you wanted all along, isn't it? Uh, I want to go home, but I won't go home. I'll go home in a taxi. Boy, boy, call a taxi. I'll call one for you, Miss Alma. You are not a gentleman. Taxi! You are not a gentleman.
In a moment, Act Two of Summer and Smoke, starring Geraldine Page and Richard Carley. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Louisville's Radio Center. Every child a camper. This is the 1953 goal of Louisville's 14 resident camps and seven-day camps. Camping is recreation and good living in the out of doors. Call your Red Feather Health and Welfare Council, Jackson 2391, for information about Louisville's camp. Your coronation station, WAVE 970, Louisville. Now, Act Two of the Best Plays production of Summer and Smoke. while after her date with Johnny Buchanan at the Moon Lake Casino, Miss Alma seemed to act more like herself. If she had another date with him, none of us found out about it, and it was commonly thought that something might develop between her and Mr. Roger DeRemus, who came to the rectory more and more often. And this is a photograph of Ceylon, the Pearl of the Orient. And who is that fat young lady? That is Mother in a hunting suit. Oh, well, I'm sorry. What was your mother hunting? Well, heaven only knows what she was hunting, but she found Papa. Oh, <laughs> she met your father on this Oriental tour. Yes, yes, he was returning from India with dysentery, and they met on the boat. Oh. Oh, and here, here she is on top of a ruined temple. How did she get up there? Oh, climbed up, I suppose. Mm, what an active woman. Oh, yes, yes, active is no word for it. Oh, look here. Here she is on an elephant's back in Burma. Uh -huh. You're looking at it upside down, Miss Alma. Oh, oh well, deliberately, just to tease you. Oh. oh, perhaps that's your mother come to fetch you home. 10.15. I'll never leave till 10.30. Well, the door was unhooked, so I'll just walk in. Why, Mrs. Bassett. I was just wondering who I could turn to when I saw the rectory light, and I thought to myself, Grace Bassett, you trot right over there and talk to Mr. Winemiller. Oh, father has retired. Oh, Alma, we'll just have to wake him. If it isn't too late for human intervention, your father's the one right person to call up old Dr. Buchanan at the fever clinic at Lyon and let him know. But well, not five minutes ago, a friend of mine called to inform me that young Dr. John and Rosa Gonzalez have taken out a license and are going to be married tomorrow. Are you quite certain? I'm always certain before I speak. Well, why would he do such a thing? Oh, August madness. They say it has something to do with the fallen stars. Of course, it might also have something to do with the fact that he lost two or three thousand dollars at the casino, which he can't pay except by giving himself to Gonzalez's daughter. Alma, what are you going to do? Hello. Long distance, please. Hello, hello. Long distance, please. Get me the fever clinic at Lyons. I want to speak to Dr. John Buchanan. <laughs> Johnny, you have blood on your face. But my ears. Turn that music off. No, I like it. Never make love without scratching and biting, Rosa. If I leave you, I have a little blood on me. Why is that? Because I know I can't hold you. Well, tomorrow we leave here together. We sail out of Galveston, don't we? You say it, but I don't believe it. I have the tickets. Two pieces of paper that you can tear in two. Oh, we'll go all right. We'll live on fat remittances from your papa. <laughs> You know, not long ago, that idea would have disgusted me. But not now. <laughs> Did anyone ever slide downhill as fast as I have this summer, Rosa Gonzalez? Hey, tell me, why does your papa want me for a son-in-law? I want you. I want you. Rosa! In here, papa. I don't want him coming in this house. Si, si, papa. Aquí estoy. Johnny! Happy years. Happy years. Papa, Johnny asks why I want him. Listen. When my girl Rosa was little, she see a string gold bead. And I don't have money to buy string gold beads. So next day I walk in dry goods store, I say to the man, please give me string gold beads. He say, show me the money. And I say, here is the money. And I reach down to my belt and I take out, <laughs> not the money, what is gone. Now I have the money, but I still have this gun. She got the gold beads. Anything that she wants, I get for her with the money. 
What have these guns? You just stick the breath out of my face. Come Get the chamaco. Hey, hold that echo. What's going on here? Dad. Dad, uh, this is, uh, this is Mr. Gonzalez and his daughter, Rosa. Senor. I know who you are. What is going on in my house? John's giving a party because we're leaving tomorrow. What? Yes, together. I hope you like the idea. But if you don't, it don't matter because we like the idea and my father likes the idea. Guys, he lame it. Gonzalez. Get your swine out of my house. Oh, no. Get your swine out, I say. Get him out. Get him into the bucket. Get him out. Get him out. Get him out. What? Oh, God. Oh, God. To whom all hearts are open and from whom no secrets are hid. Help this thy servant oh, in his hour. Oh, that mumbo-jumbo your father's spotting. And if it be thy will, I'll tell him to quit. Take him we don't want that worn out in magic. It is no longer Can't a question of what you want. Of life everlasting. Well, you've got to go in and see him, John. Amen. Oh, you wouldn't want me. Well, this happened because of his devotion to you. No, it happened because some metal somatic called him back here tonight. I called him back. But you can't put the blame on anything but your own weakness. Uh, you white-blooded spinster. Listen, you call me whatever you want, but don't let your father hear your drunken shout. There's something here I want you to see. It's sort of anatomy. Look. I don't want to see that. Oh, how can you behave like this with your father dying? I want you to look at this chart and listen to a lesson in anatomy. You see? Very well, I'm listening. This is a picture of the human body. This upper story is the brain, which is hungry for something called truth. Doesn't get much, but keeps on being hungry. This part here is hungry for food. This part's hungry for love. Because it's sometimes lonesome. I've fed all three. You've fed none. Nothing. Well, maybe your belly a little. Water is subsistence. But love, but truth, nothing but hand-me-down notions. Attitudes, poses. So that is your high conception of human desire. Well, I reject your opinion of where love is and the kind of truth the brain is seeking. There's something not shown on that chart. Oh, you mean the part that Alma's Spanish Yes, yes, it's not shown on the anatomy chart, but it's there somewhere. Not seen, but there, and it is that that I love you with. Yes, did love you with, John. Did nearly die of when you hurt me. I wouldn't have made love to you. What? That night at the casino. I wouldn't have made love to you. Even if you'd consented, I couldn't have made love to you. <laughs> you know, isn't that funny? I'm more afraid of your soul than you're afraid of my body. Because I wouldn't feel decent enough to touch you. Let me more easily now. He wants you out now. I... I he asked if she... Oh, I couldn't... No. Go in and sing to him, Miss Alma. Well, all right. I don't really... Sir? Yes? Do you think I might... Yes, John. Go on in. I think he'll want to see you. John... Death? Death? It's too late, John. Too late. After his father's death, Johnny Buchanan left town, and some time passed before it was learned where he had gone off to. While he was away, a kind of strangeness came over Miss Alma. She very seldom left the house, and if anybody called at the rectory, they would come away with stories of the funny way she acted and dressed. Is there a parade in town, Father? Haven't you looked at the paper? Well, no. No, not lately. He's finished the work his father started. Sent out the fever. And gotten all of the glory. Well, that's how it is in this world. I'll not come away from that window. Oh, there he is. He's home. Then why don't you rush right over? That's what you want to do, isn't it? Oh, that's exactly what I want to do, Father, but I'm afraid someone else has already gone to welcome him home. 
of that Gonzalez creature. No, no. Here she looked like Nellie Ewell, but you now that little girl used to be one of my music students, but it couldn't be her. What Nellie is just a child. <laughs> All that fall and early winter, Miss Alma was sick. Nobody knew what she had because she wouldn't see a doctor, nor anybody else for that matter. I'll never forget the first time I saw her after her sickness. It was down in the park just a few days before Christmas of that year. Hello, Alma. Oh, good afternoon, Mrs. Uh, Bassett. Such wind. Oh, such wind. Yes, nearly swept me off my feet. I had to sit down for a while to catch my breath. Good to see you out again after your illness. Thank you. Our poor little group broke up after you dropped out. Oh, what a pity. I think next spring we might reorganize. Well, will you look at that? Oh, that's Nellie Yule, isn't it? Mm, the image of her mother. Disgusting. Miss Alma, hello there. Oh, hello, Mrs. Bassett. <laughs> Goodbye, Alma. Come to see me. <laughs> What's the matter with that old frump? Nellie. My, how you've grown. I was by the rectory, just popped in for a second. The holidays are so short, but every minute is precious. They told me you'd gone to the park. Yes, this is the first walk I've taken in quite a while. You've been ill? Oh, no, not exactly ill. Just not very well. Oh, how you have grown up, Nellie. It's <laughs> just my clothes. Since I went off to Sophie Newcomb, I picked out my own clothes on. Mm, I'm sure it must be very fashionable to school. Oh, yes. That the time is to be young ladies in society. Hmm. <laughs> what a pity there's no society here to be a young lady in. Yeah, you'll find other fields to conquer. What's this I hear about you? Well, I have no idea, Nellie. But you've quit teaching singing and gone into retirement from the world? Well, naturally, I had to stop teaching while I was ill. That is for retiring from the world. Uh, it's more a case of the world retiring from me. I, I brought you something, Alma. It's a Christmas present. Oh, Nellie, you shouldn't have given me anything. Go on, open it. Oh, Nellie, what an exquisite handkerchief. There's a card, too. Oh, yes, so there is. Hmm. <laughs> Joy is Noel to Alma from Nellie. And... Uh, and John? Well. Son of Buchanan, Dr. John. He yes. got me that present last night. When we came to yours, we talked about you. Your ears must have burned. You mean he spoke well of me? Well, of? I was right. Simply right. Oh, he told me the influence you'd had on him. Influence? Mm. He told me about the wonderful talks he'd had with you last summer when he was so mixed up and how you inspired him. And you, more than anyone else, were responsible for his pulling himself together after his father was killed. And he told me about... Where are you going, Miss Alma? I'm going home, Nellie. Uh, you run along and deliver the rest of your presents. But wait, and I told you the most wonderful thing. No, I... no, I'm going home now, Nellie. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Alma. Yes, I was mostly in line, finishing up Dad's work in the fever clinic. Covering yourself with sudden glory. Redeeming myself with good work. Well, it's rather late to tell you how happy I am, and also how proud. But no, you're right, I haven't been well. You see, I've thought many times of something you told me last summer, that I have a doppelganger. And I looked that up, and I found out that it means another person inside me, another self. And I don't know whether to thank you or not for making me conscious of it. For a while, I thought that I was dying, but that was the change I had waited for all summer long. When did you have that feeling? August, September. But now... The gulf wind has blown that feeling away like a cloud of smoke, and 
I know now that I'm not dying. It isn't going to turn out to be quite that simple. Have you been anxious about your heart again, Miss Alma? Oh, you've gone back to calling me Miss Alma again. You never really got past that point with each other. Oh, yes, we did. We were so close. We almost breathed together. I didn't know that. Is it impossible now? I think I know what you mean. Oh, you know what I mean, all right. So be honest with me. One time I said no to something. You may remember the time and all that demented howling from the cockfight. But now I have changed my mind. Oh, well, the, the girl who said no, she doesn't exist anymore. She died last summer, suffocated in smoke from something on fire inside of her. Alma, I have a respect for the truth, and I have a respect for you. So I'd better speak honestly, if you want me to speak. You've won the argument that we had between us. What argument? The one about the anatomy chart. Oh, the chart. It shows that we're not a package of rose leaves, that every interior inch of us is taken up with something ugly and functional. And no room seems to be left for anything else. In there. No. But I've come around to your way of thinking. That something else is in there. An immaterial something, thin as smoke, which all of those ugly machines combine to produce. And that's the whole reason for being. It can't be seen, so it can't be shown on the chart, but it's there just the same. And knowing it's there, but in this whole thing, this unfathomable experience of ours, it takes on a whole new value, like some wildly romantic work in a laboratory. Don't you see? Oh, yes, I see. But, you know, you needn't try to comfort me. Now, you... You said let's talk truthfully. Well, then let's do unsparingly truthfully, even shamelessly, then. After all, it is no longer a secret that I love you. You never was. I have loved you as long ago. Well, as long as I can remember. I remember the long afternoons of our childhood when I... And to stay indoors, practice my music. I heard your playmates calling you Johnny. Yo, Johnny. Oh, it went through me just to hear your name called. And I was rushed to the window to see you jump the porch trailing. And I stood at the distance halfway down the block, only to keep sight of that torn red sweater as you raced around that vacant lot you played in. Oh, yes. It's begun that early. This affliction of love and it has never let go of me since but I'm growing I have lived next door to you all the days of my life a weak and divided person who stood in adoring awe of your singleness of your strength and well that's my story so I wish you would tell me why didn't it happen between us? Why did I fail? Why did you come almost close enough and no closer? Whenever we've gotten together, it wasn't the physical you that I really wanted. No, you said that already. You didn't have that to give me. Not at that time. You had something else to give. <laughs> what did I have? Well, you couldn't name it, and I couldn't recognize it. Oh, I thought it was just a puritanical ice that glittered like flame. But now I believe it was flame. Mistaken for ice. I, I still don't understand it, but I know it was there. Just as I know that your eyes and your voice are the two most beautiful things I've ever known. And also the warmers. Although they don't seem to be set in your body at all. John, 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 you talk as though my body had ceased to exist for you. Oh, well. Ah, oh, the tables have turned. <laughs> the tables have turned with a vengeance. John. Oh. 
woman is coming, John. One of uh, my vocal people. The youngest and the prettiest one with the least gift for music. One that helped to wrap up this handkerchief for me. Darling. Oh, hello, Miss Alma. Oh, hello, Nana. I've been all over town to shout. Shouting. Shouting what? Glad tidings. Well, I thought we weren't going to tell anybody for a while. I couldn't stop myself. Oh, Alma has, he told you. Oh, he didn't need to, Nally. I guess. From that Christmas card with your two names written on it. So, Alma, you were really the first to know. I'm proud of that, Nellie. See, on my finger, this was a present I couldn't tell you about. A solitaire. Oh, but a solitaire is such a wrong name for it. Solitaire means single. And this means two. Well, it's just blinding, Nellie. It hurts my eyes. Oh, Alma, I'm so happy. Alma, you know, you're going to sing at the wedding. The very first Sunday in spring, which will be Palm Sunday. The voice that breathed o'er Eden. Young man. You say something, miss? A train at night makes a lonely sound, don't you think so? Yeah, it sure does. The water in the fountain is cool. Is you thirsty? No, not right now. Even in summer, it keeps cool. It comes from deep underground. That's what keeps it cool. Glorious Hill is famous for its artesian springs. Why well, didn't know that? Oh, didn't you know? Are you a stranger in town? I'm a traveling salesman. Oh, you are salesman who travel. But I should say you are younger than most of them are. And not so fat. Why don't you start now? Oh, I do. I uh, travel for Red Cross shoes. Delta is your territory. From the Peabody Lobby to Catfish Row in Vicksburg. The mm, well, life of a traveling salesman is interesting. But lonely. You're right about that. Hotel bedrooms are lonely. Well, all rooms are lonely when there's only one... one person. You're tired, aren't you? I can tell from the board. Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> Well, yes, a little. But I shall rest now. I have just taken one of my sleeping tablets. So early? Oh, it won't put me to sleep. It'll just, uh, quiet my nerves. <laughs> what are you nervous about? Oh, I won an argument this afternoon. Well, that's nothing to be nervous over. You ought to be nervous if you lost one. Well, it wasn't the argument that I wanted to win. Well... I'm nervous, too. Oh, really? What over? It's my first job, and I'm scared of not making good. Oh, then you must take one of my tablets. Hmm. Oh, shall I? Please take one. Yeah, yeah, I shall. And you'll be surprised how infinitely merciful they are. Well, life is full of little mercies like that. No, no big mercies, but comfortable little mercies. And so we go on. You're falling asleep. Oh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm just closing my eyes. You know what I feel like? No. I feel like a water lily. Oh, a water lily? Yes, indeed. I feel like a water lily on a Chinese lagoon. <laughs> Why don't you sit down? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, sure. Yeah, thanks. My name is Alma. <laughs> that is Spanish. Oh, and what is yours? Mine's Archie Kramer. Oh. Mucho gusto, as they say in Spain. Mm. Usted habla español, señor? Un poquito. Ah. Usted habla español, señorita? Oh, dear. Uh, me, también, un poquito. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sometimes un poquito is plenty. See, <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's uh, there to do in this uh, town after dark? Well, there's not much to do in this town after dark. But... There are resorts on the lake that offer all sorts of after dark entertainment. There's one called Moon Lake Casino. It's under new management now, but I don't suppose its character has changed much. Well, what, what was its character? Oh, gay, very gay, Mr. Kramer. Well, then what are we sitting here for? Let's go. Why not? I'll call taxi. Yes. Hey, taxi! Hey, taxi! You coming? Oh, in a minute. Well, what are you waiting for? 
Why, I thought someone called my name. Oh, the... No, it couldn't be. Nobody knows where I am. Tamara! Yes, coming. Coming! You have just heard the best place production of Summer and Smoke, starring Geraldine Page and Richard Kiley. And here once more is your host, drama critic John Chapman. A touching drama, don't you agree? And fine performances by Miss Page, Mr. Kiley, and their fellow players. Our thanks to them all. Next week, we are going to try one of those melodramas the English know how to make so well. This one is Barry Lyndon's The Amazing Dr. Quitterhouse. Dr. Quitterhouse is a reputable man who becomes an extremely clever criminal in a spirit of pure psychological research. I think you'll enjoy it. And we'll be pleased to learn that our Dr. Quitterhouse will be the star who created the role on Broadway, Sir Cedric Hardwick. This is Chapman saying goodbye until next week. Tennessee Williams' Summer in Smoke was adapted for radio by Earl Hamner. Heard in the cast were Agnes Young as Mrs. Bassett, Virginia Payne as Mrs. Winemiller, Santos Ortega as Reverend Winemiller, Edwin Jerome as Dr. John Sr., Jane Webb as Nellie, Louis Van Ruten as Gonzalez, Raleigh Bester as Rosa, William Griffiths as Roger Doremus, and Lawson Zerby as Archie Kramer. Best Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welch and directed by Edward King. Your announcer is Fred Collins. Sundays, here's Theater Guild on NBC. Mm.